This is Audible. Skullduggery Pleasant Deathbringer by Derek Landy Read by Stephen Hogan Prologue. The closing door made the candlelight dance, waltzing and flickering over the girl strapped to the table. She turned her head to him. Her face, like every other part of her, was decorated with small, pale scars, symbols painstakingly carved into her flesh over the course of the last few months. Her name was Melancholia St. Clair. She was his secret. His experiment, his last desperate grasp for power. It hurts, she said. Vandermeer Craven, cleric first class of the Necromancer Order, esteemed scholar of arcane languages and feared opponent on the debating battlefield, nodded and patted her hand. She had entered into this arrangement with a kind of zeal that only the truly greedy can muster. But recently, her bouts of annoying self-pity were becoming more and more frequent. I know, my dear. I know it does. But pain is nothing. Once our work is done, there will be no pain. You have suffered for all of us. You have suffered for our life in this world, in this universe. Please, she whimpered. Make it stop. I've changed my mind about this. Please. I don't want it any more. I understand, he said sadly. I do. You're scared because you don't think you're strong enough. But I know you're strong enough. That's why I picked you out of everyone. I believe in you, Melancholia. I have faith in your strength. I want to go home. You are home. Please. Now, now, my dear girl, there's no need for begging. The Sarge is a beautiful, wondrous thing, and it should be cherished. You've taken your next step. You've become who you were always meant to be. We all go through it. Every sorcerer goes through it. She gritted her teeth as a spasm of pain arched her spine, and then she gasped. But it's not supposed to last so long. You said I would be the most powerful sorcerer in the world. You didn't say anything about this. Craven made the effort to look her in the eyes. He despised people who sweated, and the perspiration was rolling off her in heavy rivulets. It turned his stomach to look at her wet, dripping, scarred face. With the power I promised you, you've just had to suffer a little more than the rest of us, he explained. But all the work we've been doing, preparing you, it's going to be worth it. Trust me. The symbols I've etched into you are seizing the power of the Sards, and they're keeping it. They're looping it around, letting it build, letting it grow stronger. Let me out. Just another day or so. Let me out, she screeched, and shadows curled round her, rising and thrashing like tentacles. He stepped forward quickly, gave her a smile, 
But of course, my dear, you're absolutely right. The time has come. Her eyes widened, and the shadows retreated. He doubted she was even aware of them. Strapped and bound as she was, she shouldn't have been able to wield any kind of power. For once, Craven's smile was genuine. This was a good sign. It's done? she asked, her voice meek. You're going to let me go? Let you go, he echoed, and gave a little laugh as he undid her straps. You make it sound like I've been keeping you prisoner. Helen Collier, I am your friend. I am your guide. I am the one person in the whole world that you can trust to always be honest with you. I... I know that, Cleric Craven, she said. He took a handkerchief from his robes and used it to take hold of her wet, slippery arm in order to help her sit up. We have to choose the right moment to tell the High Priest about you. But once we tell him what we've been doing down here for all this time, it's all going to change. Word will get out that you are the Deathbringer, and there will be many people vying for your favour. Trust none of them. She nodded obediently. There will be some who won't understand, even within the necromancer order itself. Whenever you feel unsure or scared, or whenever you just want to talk, I'm here for you. I'm scared now, Melancholia said, her fingers closing around the skin of his wrist. It took all his self-control not to shiver with revulsion at her clammy touch. He smiled reassuringly. There's nothing to fear, not while you're with me. Rejoice, my dear. Very soon, you're going to save the world. Good and evil are so close as to be chained together in the soul. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, 1941 Chapter 1 Kenny Kenny Don wasn't an expert on cars. He knew enough, to be fair to him. He knew what wheels were. He knew how to open and close the doors. He even knew where to put the nozzle thing when the car needed petrol. He knew the basics, enough to get by, and nothing more. But even to a man like Kenny, smoke billowing from beneath the bonnet while you're driving is generally seen as a bad thing. The car spluttered and coughed and retched, and Kenny's grip tightened on the steering wheel. No, he said. Please. The car belched and juddered in response, smoke filling his windscreen. Images flashed into his mind of the car suddenly exploding into a giant fireball, and he tore off his seatbelt and lunged out onto the sun-drenched street. Horns honked. Kenny jumped sideways to avoid a cursing cyclist who shot past him like a foul-tempered bullet. Dublin traffic on a Sunday morning wasn't that bad at all. Dublin traffic on a Sunday morning with a big game on was terrible. Irate drivers with county flags stuck to their cars glared at them as they were forced to change lanes. Kenny smiled apologetically, then looked back at his car. It was not exploding. He reached in, grabbed his bag, and turned off the ignition. The car wheezed and slipped gratefully into an early death. Kenny left it there in the street and hailed a taxi. He was late. He couldn't believe he was late. He couldn't believe that he hadn't learned his lesson, even after all these years of being late to things. How many interviews had he messed up because of his inability to arrive on time? Actors, rock stars, politicians, business people, citizens both rich and famous and poor and unknown, he had been late to meet all of them. It was not a good quality in a journalist, he had to admit, especially when every newspaper was cutting back on staff. Print was dead, they were saying. Not as dead as Kenny was going to be if he didn't get the piece finished by the end of the month. This story was juicy. It was glorious and bizarre and unique. The kind of thing that stood a chance of being picked up by other papers around the world. 
maybe even a few magazines. Whenever Kenny entertained that possibility, his mouth watered. A solid payday. Food in the fridge. No worrying about rent for a while. Maybe even a half-decent car, if he got really lucky. He glanced at his watch. Fifteen minutes late. He bit his lip and tapped his fingers on his bag, willing the road ahead to miraculously clear. He didn't know how long his source would stick around. And if Kenny missed this chance, he doubted he'd get another. Tracking down Paul Lynch in the first place had not been easy. But then finding one homeless person in a city like Dublin was never going to be straightforward. And it wasn't like Lynch had a phone or anything. The taxi crawled along to another set of traffic lights, and Kenny almost whimpered. It was probably unhealthy to pin so much hope on one article that hadn't even been commissioned. But there was really very little choice. Kenny needed a break. He'd started off well, worked up to some high-profile interviews and articles. But then it all started to slide away from him. He could see it happening, but couldn't do anything to stop it. Now he was freelance, thrown the occasional job. But his editors left it up to him to go out and find the stories himself. And that's what he'd done. When he'd first heard the rumours, years ago, he'd dismissed them. Of course he had. They were crazy. He wrote a few articles, noting the trend in the modern urban legend, but he'd never read more into it than that. But they persisted. These stories of strange people with strange powers doing strange things. Wonderful stuff. And not just the ravings of lunatics and paranoids and the disturbed. These stories were everywhere. They popped up occasionally on the internet, then vanished just as fast. A few of the reports he'd followed up on had turned out to be hoaxes, with the person who reported the sighting now claiming to have no idea what he was talking about. He'd been close to forgetting the whole thing when he met Lynch. Lynch was Kenny's link. In all his years of casual investigation, Lynch was his one solid lead. As solid a lead as a muttering homeless man could be, anyway. And Kenny had a feeling he was ready to reveal everything he knew. Kenny had spoken to him three times already, and felt he was beginning to earn his trust. Today was the day he knew. If only he could get there in time. The taxi stopped again, and Kenny lost patience. He paid the driver, lurched out of the car, swung his bag over his shoulder and ran. Twenty seconds of running, and he was seriously regretting this move. He hadn't run in years. Good God, running was hard. And hot. Sweat formed on his brow. His lungs ached. He had shin splints. He staggered to the next corner and hailed a taxi. It was the same taxi he'd just got out of. Didn't go too well for you, did it? asked the driver smugly. Kenny just gasped and panted in the back seat. They finally reached the park and Kenny paid the driver again and hurried across the grass. There were people everywhere, stretched out in the May sunshine, laughing and chatting, walking and eating ice cream. Small dogs scampered after their owners. Music played. The pond glinted. Kenny saw Paul Lynch sitting in the shade away from everyone, and a smile broke across his face like a wave of cool water. He wiped the sweat from his brow and walked over, taking it slower, holding up a hand in greeting. Lynch didn't return the gesture. He just sat there, his back against the railing, shoulders slumped. He was probably in a bad mood. If only he'd really been a psychic, then he'd have foreseen Kenny's late arrival and there wouldn't be a problem. Kenny's smile turned to a grin. Sorry, he said once he stepped into the shade. The traffic, you know, and the car broke down and I had to get a taxi. Lynch didn't answer. He didn't even raise his head. Kenny stood there awkwardly, then shrugged and sat down. Glorious morning, isn't it? I swear, you can never tell how an Irish summer is going to turn out. Do you want an ice cream or something? I'd love an ice cream. Again, no response. Lynch's eyes were closed. Paul? Kenny reached out and nudged his one solid lead. 
nudged him again. Then he saw the blood that drenched Lynch's shirt, and he grabbed him and shook him. Lynch's head rolled back, revealing a throat with a long, smooth slit like a red eye opening. Chapter Two Me and the Girl Kenny sat in the interview room and tried not to fidget. He was mildly disappointed that there was no two-way mirror built into the wall like he'd seen on cop shows. Maybe they only had two-way mirrors in America. In Ireland, the guards probably didn't even have one-way mirrors. The door to his right opened, and two people entered. The man was tall and thin, dressed in a dark blue suit of impeccable tailoring. He wore a hat like a 1940s private eye. He sat on the other side of the table and took the hat off. He had dark hair and high cheekbones. His eyes seemed to have trouble focusing. His skin looked waxy. He wore gloves. His companion stood against the wall behind him. She was tall and pretty and dark-haired, but she couldn't have been more than sixteen years old. She was dressed in black trousers and a tight black jacket zipped halfway up, made of some material Kenny didn't recognize. She didn't look at him. Hi. The man's smile was bright. He had good teeth. Hi, Kenny said. The girl said nothing. The man had a smooth voice, like velvet. I'm Detective Inspector Me. Unusual name, I know. My family were incredibly narcissistic. I'm lucky I escaped with any degree of humility at all, to be honest. But then I've always managed to exceed expectations. You are Kenny Dunn, are you not? I am. Just a few questions for you, Mr. Dunn. Or Kenny. Can I call you Kenny? I feel we've become friends these past few seconds. Can I call you Kenny? Sure, Kenny said, slightly baffled. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's important you feel comfortable around me, Kenny. It's important we build up a level of trust. That way I'll catch you completely unprepared when I suddenly accuse you of murder. Kenny's eyebrows shot up. What? Oh, dear, said Inspector Me. That wasn't supposed to happen for another few minutes. I didn't kill Paul Lynch. Could we go back to the nice feeling of trust we were building up? Listen, I had arranged to meet him. I was going to interview him, but when I got there, he was already dead. You'd be surprised how often we hear the he-was-already-dead defense in our line of work. Or maybe you wouldn't. I don't know. The point is, Kenny, it's not looking good for you. Maybe if you tell us everything, you know... We can persuade our colleagues to go easy on you. Kenny stared at the man, then looked over at the girl. Who are you? She returned his look, raised an eyebrow, but didn't answer. She's here on work experience, said Inspector Me. Don't you worry about her, Kenny. You should just worry about yourself. What was your relationship with the corpse? Ah, uh, Kenny said. I'm a journalist. He's someone I'd interviewed a few times. About what? It's nothing. He is, or he was, a conspiracy nut, kind of. Conspiracies? You mean like government cover-ups, that sort of thing? No, not really. He was more... Kenny sighed. Listen, it's a long story. I don't have anywhere else to be said Inspector Me, and glanced back at the girl. Do you? Yes, actually, she said. I have a christening to get to. Oh, said Me. Of course. He turned back to Kenny. So maybe if you talk really fast, you can explain it to us? Kenny took a moment, 
deciding on the best way to avoid sounding like a lunatic. Right, he said. For the past few years, I've been investigating some oddball stories. Nothing big, nothing major, but stories that get ignored because when you hear them, they sound insane. No newspaper is going to take this stuff seriously, so I can really only devote a small amount of time to them. It started when I did a piece on urban legends. You have all your usual stuff, modern myths and burgeoning folklore, some funny, some horrible, some creepy, everything you'd expect to hear. But I started hearing new ones. Like what? Just rumours, snippets of stories. Someone saw a gunfight where people threw fire. Someone saw a man leap over a building or a woman just disappear. Inspector Mee tilted his head. So the modern urban legend is about superheroes? Well, that's what I was thinking. But now I'm not so sure. I've been hearing whispers about an entire subculture where this stuff goes on. Lynch said it's everywhere, if you know what to look for. I see. And did Lynch claim to be such a superhero? Lynch? No. God, no. I mean, he wasn't well, obviously. He had visions, he said. That's what he called them, visions. He'd had them since he was a teenager. They scared the hell out of him. He was sent to psychiatrist after psychiatrist, given pill after pill, but nothing worked. He described these visions to me, and they seemed so vivid, so real. He couldn't hold down a job, couldn't maintain a relationship. He ended up homeless, drinking too much, muttering away to himself in doorways. And this, Inspector Mee said, was your source? I know he sounds unreliable. Just a touch. But I stuck at it, listened to what he was saying. Eventually I learned how to separate the ramblings from the... well, the facts, I suppose. What kind of things did he see? asked the girl. Kenny frowned. He didn't really understand what gave a student on work experience the right to question him. But Inspector Mee didn't object. So Kenny reluctantly answered. He saw the apocalypse, he said. He saw a few of them, to be honest. The first one concerned these dark gods, the faceless ones, whatever he called them. Someone banished them eons ago, nobody knows who, and they've been trying to get back ever since. When he was seventeen, Lynch had a vision in which they returned. He saw millions dead, cities levelled. He saw the world break apart. He kept having these visions, and every time it would be some new aspect, some new viewpoint from which to watch the end of the world. He was convinced we were all going to die one night, a little under three years ago. He said these things, these god creatures, would emerge through a glowing yellow door between realities. Of course, no one would listen to him. And then the night came when the world was going to end, and it didn't. And the vision stopped. I love stories with a happy ending, Inspector Mee said. It wasn't over. Not for Lynch. More visions came to him. He predicted the insanity virus, you know. The last I heard it wasn't a virus, said the girl. It was a hallucinogen? They got the guys who did it. Kenny laughed. You actually believe that? Inspector Mee looked at him weirdly. You don't? It's all a little convenient, isn't it? As a Christmas prank, a radical group of anarchists drop a drug into the water supplies around the country, and then months later they come forward and admit to it? Anarchists taking responsibility for their actions? That defeats the whole point of being an anarchist, doesn't it? Do you know when the trial is? Do you know which prison they're locked up in until it happens? Because I don't. Inspector Mee sat back. This sounds awfully like a conspiracy theory, Kenny. What do you think happened? I don't know. But Lynch said it wasn't anarchists that did this. He said it was little slices of darkness flying around and infecting people. To Kenny's surprise, neither the inspector nor the girl smirked. Do you know how many people reported seeing strange things over those few days? Kenny continued. I've read dozens of reports. 
There was a nightclub in North County Dublin that was apparently swarmed by the things, but it wasn't even reported in the local paper. Sounds like a bunch of people hallucinating to me, said the girl. Lynch didn't think so. He had a vision of those things spreading out, infecting the world, making everyone do crazy things, kill each other, drop bombs. All right, then, said me. We have established that Lynch was psychologically disturbed, that he believed in a subculture of superheroes and evil gods. So why was he killed? Kenny blinked. Uh, he was robbed, wasn't he? Was he? Wasn't he? That's what the... That's what the guy said, the guard, the one who spoke to me. He said it looked like a mugging. I see. Kenny frowned. You think it's got something to do with his visions, don't you? It's a possibility, said me. Why were you meeting him this morning? The girl asked. I'm sorry, said Kenny. I don't mean to be rude, but why is she asking me questions? Why is she even here? Work experience, said me. You accuse me of murder. Do you make a habit of bringing schoolgirls into interview rooms with murder suspects? Me waved a hand. Oh, I was only joking about that. I don't really think you murdered anyone. Unless you did. In which case I reserved the right to say that I knew it all along. But she asks a good question, Kenny. Why were you meeting him? For the past few months, he'd been having new visions. Of shadows coming alive. Of people dropping dead. His latest apocalypse. What did he say about it? Why is this important? Everything is important. But it's not like he identified anyone. It's not like he heard any names in his visions. He saw someone in the black robe. That's it. Male or female? He couldn't say. Did he happen to mention the passage at all? Kenny looked at him. There was something about the inspector's face that wasn't quite right. As soon as Kenny noticed it, he looked away. His mother had taught him it was not polite to stare. He didn't use that word, Kenny said. But I've heard it from others. How did you hear about it? Who did you hear it from? asked the girl. Others, Kenny said irritably. Three or four people who had overheard it in pubs or alleyways or whatever. It sounds like the rapture, to be honest. The girl frowned. What's that? The rapture, Inspector Me said, is a Christian belief in which God will collect the faithful and deliver them into heaven. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be raptured together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Those found unworthy will be left here on earth with the rest of the sinners. The passage sounds like that sort of deal, Kenny said. Mass salvation before the end of the world. Whether or not there's any kind of a god at work behind it, I don't know. But there usually is. Did Lynch give any kind of time frame? Me asked. His visions were getting stronger and more frequent, Kenny answered. The way it worked in the past is that he'd have another six or seven days at this level of intensity... Then the apocalypse wouldn't happen, and he'd be able to relax again. Seven days, said me. Or thereabouts, yeah. How did you hear about the passage? We're detectives, said me. We detect things. She's a detective as well, is she? She's a detective in training. Look, this is all very, very weird. Why are you focusing on rumours and urban legends? You haven't even asked me any normal questions. Normal questions? Like what? Like, I don't know, like if Lynch had any enemies. Did Lynch have any enemies? Well, not that I know of, no. Then there really was no point in me asking that, was there? Unless you wanted to distract me. You didn't want to distract me, did you, Kenny? No, that's not... Are you playing a game with me, Kenny? I don't know what your... Inspector Me leaned forward. Did you kill him? No. 
It'd be okay if you did. Kenny recoiled, horrified. How would that be okay? Well, me said, maybe not okay, but understandable. Perhaps he said something that annoyed you. We've all been there, haven't we? He looked back at the girl. Haven't we? I've been there, said the girl. We've all been there, said me, looking at Kenny again. We know how it goes. He says something that annoys you. You get angry. All of a sudden, he's lying dead, and you're wondering where did the time go. I didn't kill him. I didn't kill anyone. Anyone? You mean there's more? What? Me sat back, tapped his chin with a gloved hand. You know what, Kenny? I believe you. You have an honest face. You have honest ears. So who do you think killed him? I had thought it was just a mugging. And now? Now, I don't know. Do you think someone killed him because of the passage? Are there people out there who really believe in this stuff? People are strange, said the girl, then started humming a few bars from the song. Did Lynch talk to anyone else about this? Me asked. Did he have any friends, any family he still spoke to? No, no one. So he only talked about his visions to you. Kenny hesitated. He's hesitating, said the girl. I see that, said me. There's an old woman, Kenny said. Bernadette something. Maguire, I think. She helps out at one of the shelters. She used to be a teacher or something. She's retired now, lives in the country somewhere. He talked to her. She hasn't been around that much lately. I think she's just too old. The first time I'd seen her in months was a few weeks ago. She was talking to Lynch. You think he told her about his visions? Yeah, I do. You think Bernadette Maguire killed him? Uh, no. She's like I said, she's old. Old people can kill people too. I know, but... She could be a ninja. She's not a ninja, for God's sake. She's somebody's great-grandmother. I want you to think carefully about this, Kenny. Have you ever seen her with a sword? What? How about throwing stars? This is ridiculous. Have you ever seen her dressed up as a ninja? That would have been my first clue. The girl sucked in her cheeks so she wouldn't laugh out loud. What kind of cop are you? Kenny asked, resolutely unamused. I am the kind that is determined to get to the bottom of this mystery, said me. The door opened, and a boy with blonde hair poked his head in. Kenny was so startled by the way the boy's hair stood on end that he completely missed Inspector Me getting to his feet. Thank you for your cooperation, Me said, quickly following the girl out the door. My colleague will be in to see you shortly. Out in the corridor, the girl held the boy's arm, and reached for Inspector Me as he closed the door. It clicked shut, and all was suddenly quiet for a very brief moment. The door opened again. A middle-aged man walked in, carrying a notebook. Inspector Me and his two teenage students were gone. Mr. Dunn, said the man. My name is Detective Inspector Harris. Sorry to keep you waiting. Don't worry about it, Kenny said, a little doubtfully. The other inspector kept me busy. Detective Inspector Harris smiled good-naturedly as he sat down. Other inspector? The one who just left. Um, who was that then? Detective Inspector me. Detective Inspector you? No, me. That's his... He said that's his name. You just passed him? He was with a girl on work experience and a boy with spiky hair? Harris blinked at him. I didn't pass anyone, Mr. Dunn. And I'm the only detective inspector on duty right now. Kenny stared at him. Then... Then who the hell was I just speaking to? Chapter 3 The Christening Valkyrie Kane cradled her little sister in her arms and hoped to God she'd get through the day without being splattered with regurgitated baby milk. She'd barely made it home from the police station in time to get changed 
and one top had already been rendered unwearable before they'd even left the house. It had been a nice top, too. It had really gone with her jeans. Please, she whispered to little Alice, do not throw up on me. Alice watched her with big blue eyes, but wasn't promising anything. Squinting slightly against the sun, Valkyrie glanced back into the church. Alice wasn't the only one who had just been christened today, so the place was full of chatting, laughing families with camcorders, saving every gurgle and wail. She may have been biased, but it was Valkyrie's sincere opinion that none of the other three babies were half as cute as her three-month-old sister. They just didn't measure up where it counted. It was sad, really. Those babies had already lost the cuteness war, and they wouldn't even know it for years to come. A real tragedy. She looked down at her sister. You don't do much, do you? You're fairly limited, as far as most things go. Mum says I have to keep talking to you, to get you used to my voice. So, well, I suppose I'll keep talking. There are two of me, you know. There's me, the real me, and then there's my reflection. The reflection looks like me and talks like me and acts like me, but it isn't me. It steps out of my mirror and goes to school and does my homework and, yes, sometimes it babysits you. And I don't like that. I don't like leaving you in the care of something that has no emotions. But I'm a busy girl. Yes, I am. When you're a bit older, we're going to read you stories about princesses and wizards and magic. And we're going to let you believe for a few years that some magic is real. And then, this is the sucky bit, we're going to tell you that most magic isn't real. We're going to tell you that people can't fly and they can't turn each other into toads and there are no magical, mystical monsters. Between you and me, though, that's the big lie. There is magic. People can fly. There are monsters. I'm not sure about the turning each other into toads bit, though. But who'd want that anyway? That'd be gross. Valkyrie started swaying the top half of her body slightly as she walked in a circle. Who's a cutie? Who's a cutie? You are. That's who. You're a cutie. And who's sounding pretty dim-witted right now? That'd be me, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. She looked down, saw the baby gazing up, and she laughed. Oh, God, you're adorable. I'd ask you to stay like this forever, but, you know... That'd be a little awkward, especially when you're old enough to go out on dates. We have a weird family. Do you know that? You've probably already noticed. Mum's normal enough, in her own way. But when she gets talking to Dad, a different side to her comes out. An immensely silly side. He's a bad influence on her. That's what he is. Because our dad is an oddball. Mm-hmm. As odd as they come, Uncle Fergus is odd too, but not in a nice way. He's just mean all the time. It's a shame you never got to meet Gordon. You'd have liked Gordon. He was a cool uncle. She kissed the baby's cheek and kept her head down. Want to know a secret? She whispered. Magic runs in our family. You might be magic. Some day you might be able to do all the things I can do. Some day you might have to take a new name like I did, or you might not. But I don't know if I want that for you. Being normal isn't so bad, once you've seen the other side. I know it wouldn't be fair if I kept this from you, but I don't want you getting hurt. Do you understand me? Something like that. It'd kill me. The baby reached out took a small handful of Valkyrie's hair. I'm glad we understand each other. For someone with such a small brain, you're very smart. You know that? Alice gurgled. Valkyrie took her baby sister back inside the church, made her way over towards her folks. Her aunt emerged from the crowd, hair pulled back off her face, pinching it tight. It was not a good look. Hello, Stephanie, Beryl said. You're holding her wrong. She seems pretty comfortable. 
Valkyrie responded, making sure she said it politely. Beryl reached out thin hands. No, 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 let me show you. But, as usual, Alice's spider sense picked up the incoming threat and she turned her head, saw Beryl's suddenly smiling face and wailed. Beryl recoiled sharply, fingers twitching. When their aunt had retreated to an acceptable distance, Alice stopped wailing and glomped her gums onto a button on Valkyrie's top. She's been grumpy all day, Valkyrie lied, pleased with how things had turned out. Beryl made a noise in her throat, obviously unimpressed with her brand new niece. Valkyrie jerked her head back slightly. Mum and Dad are over there, she said. They've been wanting to talk to you. Mum said earlier what a lovely dress you're wearing. Beryl's eyebrows wriggled like two tiny tapeworms. This, she said, but I've had this for years. It was a beige dress that would have looked better on an eighty-year-old. Any eighty-year-old, man or woman. I think you've really grown into it, Valkyrie said. I always thought it was a little shapeless. Valkyrie resisted the urge to say that was what she meant. Beryl broke off the conversation as she usually did without any warning whatsoever and with her husband trailing after her. Hilariously, Fergus nodded to the baby as he passed, as if Alice was going to nod back, but he reserved a look akin to a glare for Valkyrie. She hadn't a clue what that was about. She watched Carol and Crystal walk towards her and prepared herself for the onslaught to come. In the past, she would have been expecting poorly thought-out taunts and flatly executed jibes from her cousins at a time like this. These days, unfortunately, it was a whole lot worse. Hi, Valkyrie, Carol whispered. Crystal jabbed Carol with an elbow. Don't call her that, Carol glared. I whispered it. No one else could hear. You still shouldn't call her that. Call her Stephanie. A few more precious moments of life were sucked away from Valkyrie's grasp, never to be seen again. Fine, Carol said, not looking pleased. Hello, Stephanie. How are you? I'm doing good, Valkyrie replied, talking quickly in an effort to hijack the conversation and steer it towards calm and unexceptional waters. How are you guys? How's college? Looking forward to the summer holidays. Crystal, I love your shoes. Your feet fit really well into them. Doesn't Alice look adorable? She turned slightly so that they could see the baby. They both murmured something about cuteness. And then it was as if Alice didn't even exist. We were thinking, Carol said, and both twins stepped closer so they wouldn't be overheard. You know the way you said we were too short to learn magic? Well, we're not sure that we are. You started to learn magic when you were shorter than we are now, didn't you? And also, elves? Valkyrie blinked. I'm sorry? Elves, said Crystal. You know, with the pointy ears? They're pretty small, aren't they? I know in some movies they're regular sized, but mostly elves are small, and they can do magic. Um, elves aren't real, Valkyrie said. Carol sighed at her sister. Told you! Crystal glared back, then looked again at Valkyrie. Weren't they real? I'm not sure I can um, answer that. Crystal looked confused. What about goblins? Oh, Valkyrie said. Yeah, okay, goblins exist. Right, listen, it's not a height thing. It's a danger thing. The fact is it isn't safe. I've been beaten up more times than I can count. I've had bones broken and teeth broken, and five months ago I was technically dead for half a day. I even had an autopsy done on me. What was that like? Unsurprisingly unsettling. Carol's eyes gleamed. But you get to do magic and save the world and hang around with cool people? And have friends? Crystal added. And what do we get to do? We get to go to college and do exams and get spots, and we don't get to have boyfriends. Valkyrie attempted to smile. I get spots too, you know. Everyone does. And you've both had plenty of boyfriends. Crystal shook her head. 
Not like Fletcher. He's nice. And I wouldn't call them boyfriends either, mumbled Carol. Stephanie, we just want what you have. We want to have fun and we want to have powers and do exciting things. We've been talking and we've decided that we want you to teach us magic. I really don't think that's a good idea. And we really do. Even if I wanted to, I couldn't. I just don't have the time. Tanith is still out there and she's got a remnant inside her. And she's with Billy Ray Sanguine and she knows much too much about my life and my family. I need to find her and get her some help. And I've also got to stop the end of the world and it's just not safe to start showing you things. Just a few tricks, Crystal pressed. They're not called tricks, said Valkyrie. Illusions, then? They're not illusions. Spells? Valkyrie hesitated. Okay, you can call them tricks. Just show us a few small ones, said Carol. Like flying? Flying is not one of the small ones. Can you fly yet? No, I can't. Skullduggery is the only one who can. Maybe he'll teach us. Valkyrie couldn't help it. She had to smile. I doubt that very much. The twins suddenly started fixing their hair, and Valkyrie knew that Fletcher had arrived. Hello, ladies, he said to them while his left arm wrapped around Valkyrie's waist. Hi, Fletcher, the twins said in unison. Having a good christening? he asked. I've never been to one, and I have to admit it seems kind of, well, boring, but in a nice way. I found it really boring too, Carol said before Crystal had a chance. And I didn't understand most of what the priest was saying. I wasn't even listening, Crystal said. It was something about babies, I think. I really like your hair today. You have it sticking up really nicely. Don't encourage him, Valkyrie groaned. Fletcher laughed and gave her a quick kiss. Unfortunately, he said, we have to go for just a moment. We do? Valkyrie asked. He nodded to her, all serious. Uh, she said. Okay, yeah. Guys, we have to go. Carol's eyes widened. Is there trouble? Are we in danger? Is the world ending? Crystal asked. The twins looked up at the church ceiling, like they were expecting to see it crack and fall in on top of them. Don't worry about it, Valkyrie said with a chuckle. She headed over to her parents, Fletcher beside her. They don't have to worry about it, do they? He shrugged. I'm sure they'll be okay for a few days. Did you find Bernadette McGuire's house? Skullduggery's there right now, waiting for me to return with you. She grinned at him. Was it a nice drive? It took two hours, he grumbled. And he wouldn't let me speak. Do you know what it's like to be driving for two hours and not be able to speak? No. What's it like? It's boring, she nodded. I could probably have guessed that. They reached her parents, and Valkyrie's mum lit up when Valkyrie passed her Alice. Here she is, her mum said, cooing at the baby. My special girl. Oh, cheers, Valkyrie said, rolling her eyes. Her mum laughed. Hello, Fletcher. When did you get here? I just arrived, he said. Sorry, the bus service on a Sunday is awful. You should have called us. Desmond could have picked you up. No, I couldn't have, Valkyrie's dad said, stepping into earshot. Sorry, Fletcher, but I had important fatherly duties to take care of, which included eating breakfast, showering, and finding my trousers. Of those three, I only managed two. Without looking down, can you guess which one I missed? Valkyrie's mother sighed. Des... It's too early in the day for your nonsense. Fletcher, will you be joining us for the post-christening lunch? Yes, I will, Fletcher smiled back. I just have to borrow Stephanie for a moment. Take our daughter, Valkyrie's dad said, waving his hand to Arlene. We have another one now. Valkyrie laughed, leading Fletcher through the crowd. They left the church and walked round the corner. When they were sure they weren't being watched, Fletcher turned to her, kissed her, and the moment their lips touched, they teleported. The church 
and the grass and the sunshine vanished, replaced by a cottage being lashed by rain. Valkyrie broke off the kiss instantly and leaped sideways to the Bentley, which was under the cover of a tree. Fletcher joined her. The sun is splitting the stones in Haggard, she said, glaring. Don't you think staying dry will be kind of important for when we teleport back? You make a good point, Fletcher conceded. See, there's a reason why you're the girl and I'm the boy. You think about things while I... Don't? Exactly, he said happily. Skullduggery walked towards them from the cottage, his gloved hand raised to divert the rain around him. His suit was impeccable, his hat cocked just right. His face was sallow-skinned, but as he neared, he tapped the two symbols etched into his collarbones, and his features flowed away, revealing the skull beneath. Sorry to pull you away, he said to Valkyrie. She shrugged. I was there for the christening itself. Once that's done with, it's just a family get-together, and Christmas is enough for me. Is the old lady home? I knocked on windows and doors, but there's no answer, he said. We'll have to let ourselves in. Fletcher held out his hands, but Skullduggery shook his head. Relying on teleportation is making us lazy. So we're going to do this the old-fashioned way. Valkyrie, would you mind keeping the rain off? He turned, started walking back to the cottage. Valkyrie hurried after him, raising her arms, moving the air into a shield. You should really get used to manipulating water instead of relying on air all the time, he told her. One of these days you're going to wish you'd practice more. There's very little point in being an elemental sorcerer if you use only two elements. But air and fire are the handiest, she said, pretending to whine. Manipulating moisture just doesn't grab me that way. And as for earth, she trailed off. They reached the front door and Skullduggery knelt, working the lockpick. Fletcher stood behind Valkyrie, trying to avoid the raindrops that got through her defence. And yet, Skullduggery said, your necromancy lessons are continuing without interruption, are they not? Well, yeah, but I need more lessons in necromancy because Solomon isn't as good a teacher as you are. He looked at her, and she grinned, then shrugged. Besides, most of the training I do with you these days is combat. I'll get the elemental stuff back on track, I promise. Skullduggery grunted. Ever since Tanith Lowe had been lost to a remnant, he had changed what he'd been teaching Valkyrie. There was no way she'd be able to match Tanith's speed and agility, so going up against her using pure martial arts would end in disaster. The new stuff she'd been learning was ugly, brutal, and effective. Combatives, not martial arts. It had taken Valkyrie a while to adjust, but the threat of Tanith's return had spurred her on. A rematch was inevitable, she knew. So when she did go up against Tanith again, she was making damn sure that it wasn't going to be on Tanith's terms. The lock clicked, and Skullduggery stood up and opened the door, then poked his head in. Hello? Mrs. McGuire? Anyone home? He waited. No answer. He stepped inside, Valkyrie following. His hair suddenly in danger of getting wet, Fletcher hopped in after her. Aside from the steady rhythm of the rain, the cottage was quiet. It was orderly and smelled of old person. Valkyrie took another step, and the ring on her right hand grew colder. Someone's dead in here she whispered. Stepping slowly and carefully, they entered the living room, where small porcelain figurines lined every surface, and an old woman sat in an armchair, very dead. Skullduggery took out his gun. Wait a second, Fletcher said, his eyes widening. Look at her. This was natural causes. She was old. Old people die. That's what old people do. Skullduggery shook his head. There was someone else here. He motioned them to stay put and left the room. Fletcher looked at Valkyrie searchingly, but all she could do was shrug. After a few moments, Skullduggery came back in and put his gun away. How do you know there was someone else here? 
she asked. He nodded behind him as he took a small bag of rainbow dust from his pocket. Notice the figurines? Horrible little things, aren't they? Little cherubs, cheap and tasteless. See how they're so lovingly arranged, evenly spaced, all looking outwards? Now look at the ones beside you. Valkyrie looked down. Fat little figurines, holding harps and little bows and arrows, were positioned haphazardly along the edge of the cabinet. They fell, she said. And someone put them back in a hurry. Someone who didn't care enough to face them all in the same direction. Skullduggery broke up the lumps in the powder. He took a pinch and threw it into the air. It fell gently in a small cloud, changing color as it did so. Adept magic was used, he murmured. Hard to tell what sort, but it was recent. How recent? Valkyrie asked. Skullduggery put the bag away. The last ten minutes. Fletcher glanced over his shoulder. So the attacker could still be in the area. Skullduggery took out his gun again. Always a possibility. Valkyrie patted Fletcher's arm. Don't worry, she said. If the bad man comes, I'll protect you. If the bad man comes, Fletcher responded, I'll bravely give out a high-pitched scream to distract him. I may even bravely faint to give him a false sense of security. That will be your signal to strike. We make a great team. Just don't forget to stand in front of me the whole time, he said, and then yelled. Valkyrie jumped, and Skullduggery whirled, and Fletcher pointed at the window. Outside, he blurted. Bad man, outside! Skullduggery charged, thrust his hand against the air, and the window exploded outwards. He jumped through, Valkyrie and Fletcher right behind him. The rain pelted them, made the ground muddy. A bald man in black slipped on the trail that led into the woods, fell to his hands and knees. He cast a quick glance behind him. He had a long nose and a ridiculous goatee beard that ended in wispy trails far below his chin. He fumbled with something they couldn't see and then sprang up. He slipped and slid, but kept on running, leaving a wooden box open on the ground behind him. Back, Skullduggery said. Back inside the house. Move! Valkyrie went first, vaulted through the broken window, landing just as Fletcher teleported in. Skullduggery came last, flattening himself against the wall. Hide, he whispered. They ducked down. The rain battered the cottage. Valkyrie risked a look up at Skullduggery. What is it? she whispered. It's a box, he whispered back. What kind of box? A wooden one. She gave him a look. Okay, I'll try this. Why are we hiding from a box? We're not. We're hiding from what's inside the box. What's inside the box? Is it a head? Fletcher asked. It's the Jitter Girls. He peeked out. Valkyrie raised herself up slightly so she could see over the windowsill. The wooden box sat there on the trail in the mud and the rain. Who are the Jitter Girls? she asked. Triplets, Skullduggery said. Born in 1931. When they were six years old, something tried to get into this world through them. Through them? It planted seeds in their minds, changed them mentally and physically. It dragged them just out of step with our reality, tried to make them a conduit through which it could emerge. What are we talking about here? Fletcher asked. A faceless one? No. Skullduggery said. I don't think so. This was something else. Their parents panicked. Doctors couldn't help. Remember, this was Ireland in the 1930s, cut off and isolated from a world that was advancing around it. Everyone thought the girls were possessed by the devil. They tried exorcism after exorcism, but the girls just got worse. Then I was called. Could you help? Valkyrie asked. She took another peek. The box was still just a box. They were too far gone, Skullduggery said. They spent a year in agony, twisting and squealing while strapped to their beds in an asylum. Good God. Their parents came in every single day. They'd sing to them, nursery rhymes and old Irish songs. There was nothing I could do. The thing 
whatever it was that was using them. I think it realized its plan wasn't going to work, so it retreated. It went away, left them alone. They died soon after. That's terrible. It is. And so, how are they in that box out there? Skullduggery shrugged. They came back, didn't they? Any poor soul tortured like that isn't going to rest easy. They have too much pain to deal with by themselves, so they need to spread it around. That's what I think anyway. The truth is nobody knows why they came back or why they started killing people, but that's what happened. And they're in the box because? Everyone needs a home. I see. I'm not altogether sure, though, why we're hiding from them. If they can fit into that small box, how dangerous can they be? It looks like you're going to see for yourself, Skullduggery said, his voice dropping back to a whisper. Valkyrie peeked. Impossibly, a pale hand emerged from the box. It trembled slightly as it lengthened, and it was an arm now that curled. The hand gripped the edge of the box. She ducked down. What's happening? Fletcher asked. They're climbing out, Valkyrie said dumbly. If they're as dangerous as you say they are, Fletcher said to Skullduggery, then let's go. Well, let's get out of here. They need to be contained, Skullduggery said. That's why the killer brought them, to cover his escape. We can't leave. There's no telling what they'd do if they were allowed to roam free. Valkyrie took another look. At first, she thought there was something wrong with her eyes. A girl climbed out of the box. A little blonde six-year-old, wearing a white dress with a bow, moving like bad animation. She was stiff, jerky, missing out the smooth motion between the lifting of the foot and the placing it down as she walked. There was no other word for it. She jittered. Behind her, another pale hand emerged. How do we fight them? asked Valkyrie softly. I don't know, Skullduggery said. Fletcher, go see China. She must have something in her books about fighting these things. Fletcher shook his head. I'm not leaving. It wasn't a request. Then come with me, Fletcher said. Valkyrie, at least. I'm not leaving her here. Valkyrie turned to him. Yes, you are. Go. Be quick. He grabbed her. I'm not. She took his hand off her. We don't have time to argue. Do it. Go. He stared at her, torn, then narrowed his eyes. I'll be right back. I'll be waiting. He didn't even kiss her. He just vanished. Valkyrie turned back to the window. Hell, she breathed. All three Jitter girls were out, and all three were walking towards the cottage. Chapter 4 Craven Craven walked into the high priest's office with his head bowed. Late again, cleric, said Auron Tenebrae, high priest of the order, patriarch of this temple, and a man with a gaze so withering the sun itself dared not show its face when he was in one of his moods. Or so the legend went. This is the third time this week... If our little meetings are too much of an imposition for you, please let it be known, and we will surely reschedule around your most arbitrary of whims. Craven bowed again. My deepest apologies, your eminence. I have no excuse for my tardiness other than I work without cease for the good of the order. And I'm sure we appreciate it, Tenebrae said already sounding bored. Craven bowed so low, his back hurt. He hated the high priest, hated the distaste that flowed from him daily, a constant stream of snide remarks over the years, collecting in a vast reservoir inside Craven's mind that he was never going to forget, and was certainly never going to forgive. No matter the flattery he offered, the compliments, the fawning, all he got in return was this river of barely concealed contempt. 
The worst of it was that Tenebrae made no effort to confine this contempt to moments when they were alone. Standing at the high priest's shoulder was Nathaniel Quiver, cleric, first class of the necromancer order, stringent keeper of the law, and a man who seemingly possessed no facial muscles that would enable him to smile. Any such muscles, Quiver probably thought, would be put to better use on a good frown. Cleric Wreath, Tenebrae said, you may continue. And the last of Craven's supposed peers, the last to witness this constant belittling, Solomon Wreath. Cleric first class of the necromancer order, infamous field operative and notorious troublemaker, standing there in his tailor-made black suit while the rest of them wore proper necromancer robes. Craven had a special place of hatred reserved for Solomon Wreath, deep down in his heart. I believe Valkyrie is about to make a breakthrough, Wreath said, and Craven's eyes widened in alarm. She's becoming more proficient in necromancy with every lesson. She's taking giant steps now, progressing faster and faster. If she continues like this, I'm confident that she will choose necromancy over elemental magic when it's time for the surge. I see, said Tenebrae. And how has Pleasant reacted to this? Wreath allowed himself a smile. They've argued about it enough, so he's not saying anything for the moment. He trusts her to find her own way, and so do I. It's just that I think her way will be our way. And you think she's safe out there with Lord Vile and the Loose? Wreath hesitated. I think she's as safe with Skullduggery Pleasant as she'd be anywhere. Besides, Vile hasn't been seen since he attacked Pleasant in the sanctuary. He may well have vowed to kill the Deathbringer, but for all we know, he won't be returning. Craven coughed lightly and waited till they were looking at him. Forgive me, he said, but I fail to see how any of this is a noteworthy development. We do not all believe that Valkyrie Kane will be the Deathbringer, Cleric Wreath. Some of us in this room believe she's just another unexceptional girl. Unexceptional? Wreath echoed. This girl is but a few months away from her seventeenth birthday, and already she has saved the world and killed a god. What have you done? Tenebrae chuckled, and Craven bristled. What I mean to say is that while she may have the makings of a fine sorcerer, I have yet to be convinced that she will ever have the power to become the Deathbringer and initiate the passage. And even if she does have that potential, she is, as you say, not even seventeen. She won't experience the surge for another three or four years. You want us to wait four years to see if she might be strong enough? You have an alternative to waiting? Wreath asked. Did someone invent a time machine while I wasn't looking? Your sarcasm notwithstanding, I think it would be a mistake to put too much faith in a girl so heavily under the influence of Skullduggery Pleasant. Besides which, we have plenty of our own candidates. Take my protégé, for example. I believe that Melancholia St. Clair has been showing signs of definite... Melancholia, Tenebrae interrupted. You're still insisting on her. Cleric, I haven't seen anything special about that girl at all. The only extraordinary quality she seems to possess is the ability to look extraordinarily annoyed whenever I see her, which hasn't been for quite some months now. Begging your pardon, High Priest, but I have been spending a lot of time as her personal tutor, and I think she could be the one. Tenebrae sat back in his chair. You're tutoring her? Yes, High Priest. But I thought you wanted her to excel, Tenebrae said, laughing while Wreath smirked. Craven's face burned, but he managed a grateful smile nonetheless. Waste your time however you want. Tenebrae said, waving his hand. But right now, the Cain girl seems to be the one viable possibility we have. No other temple around the world has any candidates of worth. 
All eyes are resting on us. Cleric Wreath, I hope she doesn't let us down. As do I, your eminence, Wreath said, nodding instead of bowing. Tenebrae didn't seem to mind. Craven stormed into the depths of the temple, replaying the conversation in his head, substituting the things he had said with the things he wished he had said. They were so much better. All the caustic witticisms that occurred to him afterwards. They made him sound strong and smart and in control. In his imagination, he never blushed. He reached the heavy wooden door and spent a few moments calming himself. Tenebrae's days were numbered, as were Reed's. Quiver he wasn't so sure of. Quiver never mocked him. Quiver never mocked anyone. He entered the room, and Melancholia raised her head. I'm tired, she said. She spent half her time tired. The other half was spent pacing the floor, practically crackling with energy. It was either one or the other, extremely powerful or extremely weak. Craven had wanted another few days to run more tests, to find the source of the instability and purge it, but his patience had run out. It's time, he said. I'm presenting you to the High Priest. Clean that sweat from your face and follow me. I don't feel well, she said, almost whimpered. I don't care, he roared, and grabbed Melancholia's arm, yanking her to her feet. They will not laugh at me again. No one will ever laugh at me again. We will wipe the smiles from their smug faces and they will worship you and obey me. She looked at him fearfully, with tears in her eyes, and he caught his anger and quelled it. He couldn't afford to lose her. He couldn't afford to lose the trust he had spent so long building up while he was carving those symbols into her flesh and listening to her scream. Don't be afraid, he said softly. I'll be with you. No one will hurt you while I'm with you. You're a very special girl, and I love you as I would my own daughter. Melancholia nodded bravely, and he gave her a gentle smile as he led her to the door. What he'd said was quite true. He did love her like a daughter. He had a daughter somewhere in the world, and he absolutely, and without reservation, despised her. Chapter 5 The Jitter Girls Valkyrie and Skullduggery backed away from the window. The first Jitter Girl approached in that awful, messed-up, stop-motion way, moving slowly, her face blank. She reached the wall and vanished and was suddenly inside the cottage with them. Skullduggery's hand closed around Valkyrie's wrist. Don't move, he whispered. Don't look at her. Fighting the urge to run, Valkyrie stayed where she was and kept her eyes down. The jitter girl flickered into her peripheral vision. Her heart thundered in her chest like hoofbeats. The jitter girl paused, maybe to examine the porcelain figures on the sideboard. Valkyrie's hair was wet. Her jeans were damp, and her top was sticking to her. She was aware of all this as she stood perfectly still. One of the Jitter Girl's sisters moved slowly by the window. The Jitter Girl passed behind Valkyrie, out of her line of sight. Valkyrie had never wanted to turn round so much in her life. Goosebumps rippled her flesh. There was a mirror on the wall. Valkyrie could see Skullduggery and herself reflected on the edge of the glass. Her mouth was dry. In the mirror, she saw a pale hand slowly reaching for her own. Skullduggery grabbed her, twisted her away, the air rushing as they hurtled through the broken window without finesse. They landed in the mud and scrambled up, a jitter girl on either side. The girls grew as they came forward. Every flash made them bigger, made them older, made their hair paler and wilder. Their faces changed, from pretty and blank to contorted and tortured. Lines appeared on smooth skin, mouths opened, lips cracked, and white teeth became yellow 
became brown, became blackened, and still they came forward. Skullduggery's gun went off, again and again, the bullets passing through the flickering creatures. Valkyrie hurled fire through shadows, but the Jitter Girls, all three of them now, advanced impervious. Skullduggery was yanked from Valkyrie's side. One of them had him, her fingers pressing into his clothes, sliding between his ribs. He screamed. Valkyrie lunged for him, but slipped, splashing down in mud and muck, her hair in her eyes, calling his name. And then one of them was right in front of her, standing over her, her hand pressed against Valkyrie's forehead, pressed into her skin. Valkyrie screamed as the fingers melted into her skull, poked through her brain. White daggers of blinding light seared across her mind. Her body seized up and her jaw locked. She couldn't move, couldn't speak, couldn't think. Images played in darkness as the little girl monster wriggled her fingers. Images and memories, sensations and emotions, mixing up, matching up, latching onto each other, splitting off from each other, and still the little girl monster played, curious, sifting through the insides of Valkyrie's mind like she was looking for something, searching for someone. And she found it, found it waiting, found it watching, found it ready. Valkyrie went away, and Darkus wrapped her hand around the little girl monster's wrist, and she crushed it as she pulled the fingers from her mind. Darkus stood, still holding onto the wrist. The jitter girl screeched and contorted and jittered, but her arm remained in Darkus's grip. Darkus watched her, fascinated. She poured magic out through her fingers, and the little girl monster returned to her normal size and screamed. It was like no human scream. It was like no animal scream. It was the scream of a creature who had never felt the need to scream before. It was new and raw, a freshly born thing of exquisite agony and sudden overwhelming fear. Darkus dropped her. Another was coming, jittering across the mud, eager to play. And there was so much magic in Darkus's veins, broiling and coiling and boiling inside her, that she just had to share it. The power leaped from her hand into a twisting, turning stream, crossed the distance between them, and washed over the jitter girl, taking her off her feet. Unable to escape the flow, the little girl monster squirmed and kicked and writhed in the mud, and Darkus increased the intensity until she became bored of the screeches. She turned to the last little girl monster, who held her gaze for a moment before releasing Skullduggery. He fell, gasping. The Jitter Girl returned to her normal size and shape, regarding Darkus with those wonderfully blank eyes, then moved to the box. Her sisters dragged themselves in that flickering manner to join her, and one by one they climbed back inside. Once all three were in, the top of the box closed over. Darkus turned back. Skullduggery Pleasant got to his feet, his exquisite suit covered in muck. His hat was in the mud somewhere, and the rain ran off his gleaming head. Hello, he said. I've been waiting for you. Darkus smiled, walking towards him. You're very impressive, he continued. That's a kind of magic I don't think I've ever seen, and I've seen every kind of magic. You're quite the curiosity, aren't you? Darkus could have turned his bones to splinters where he stood. Is she in there? Skullduggery asked. Valkyrie, can she hear me? Darkus said nothing. Skullduggery's head tilted. Are you going to let her come back? That's her body you're wearing. That's her face you're using. You can't keep her sleeping forever. It isn't your time yet. This is still Valkyrie's time. She gets to walk around. She gets to live, not you. She could see his consciousness. It formed a shell around his skeleton, a shell of multicolored lights. It sparkled prettily. This shell was how he thought. This shell was how he felt. When he had pulled himself back together all those hundreds of years ago, he recreated himself in a form that only she could see. She reached out and gently dug her fingers into the shell of light. 
Skullduggery gasped and went rigid. She turned her hand, twisting his consciousness, feeling and understanding how she could tear through it or pull it away, shred it to pieces or turn it to vapor. What she held, buzzing between her fingertips, was life itself. It was a wonderful thing, a glorious thing. She released him and he staggered back, but she was already forgetting he was there. She rose off the ground into the rain-filled air, floating high above the cottage. She could see across the countryside from here, to the city in the distance. She wondered how easy it would be to turn the whole city to dust. Probably not that hard. Not if she focused. Someone rose up to meet her. I want Valkyrie back, Skullduggery said. Give her back right now. I'm not going to ask again. Darkus smiled at him. She liked him. She really did. He was unique. She didn't want to kill him. Not yet. Not when there were still ways for him to amuse her. Darkus went away, and when Valkyrie blinked, her wet hair was in her face and she was falling to the earth. Bloody hell! she hollered. Skullduggery swooped down, caught her, held her close as he descended. No need to shout, he told her. She clutched him tightly. What's happening? How did we get here? You don't remember? How I got into the bloody sky? No, I don't bloody... She trailed off. Oh, wait. I do. It was her. Indeed it was. She sagged in his arms. Great, she mumbled. They touched down. Valkyrie swayed on her feet a moment, then nodded, and they walked over to the wooden box. So that's it, then? she asked, a headache starting up behind her eyes. She can just come and go whenever she likes? Every time things get too dangerous, am I just going to hulk out, change into the person who's going to kill the world? I don't think it's quite so simple, Skullduggery responded. From what I could see, the Jitter Girl literally had her hand inside your head. That would shake anything loose. And I know you don't want to hear it, but Darkus did save us. Valkyrie folded her arms, shivering. You're right. I don't want to hear it. You saved us, then. Does that sound better? Valkyrie glared at him through the rain. I had nothing to do with it. Yes, you did. You are... Darkus, Valkyrie. Darkus isn't a different person, no matter how many times we talk about her like she is. At its simplest level, Darkus is a state of mind. I'm sorry? She's you, without your conscience or your feelings. She's you, without your humanity. You think she's a mood swing? He shrugged. Or maybe you are her mood swing. Don't even joke about that. Skullduggery picked up the wooden box and they started back towards the cottage. I'm not joking. The fact is we have no way of knowing if the person who we think we are is at the core of our being. Are you a decent girl with the potential to someday become an evil monster? Or are you an evil monster that thinks it's a decent girl? Wouldn't I know which one I was? Good God, no. The lies we tell other people are nothing to the lies we tell ourselves. You have an amazing ability to depress me sometimes, you know that? I try my best. Skullduggery gestured, and his mud-soaked hat rose into his hand. He gazed at it forlornly. How are you feeling? Hedicky, but fine. Bad man got away. Yes, he did. He killed Paul Lynch, and now the little old lady Lynch confided in. Somebody doesn't want us to know anything about the passage. You think he was a necromancer? Even though dressing in black is no way an indication, yes, I quite do. She nodded. Me too. Plus he had a ridiculous beard. I should probably ask Solomon about him. I should probably help. No hitting. A small amount of hitting. Fletcher lunged out of thin air before them, his eyes wide, fists clenched, ready to fight. He looked at them, 
spun round, spun back again. Where are they? he asked. Back in the box, Valkyrie told him. Did you find out anything? China wasn't at the library, he said, the rain flattening down his hair. Nobody there could help me. How did you beat them? With unimaginable skill, Skullduggery said. Valkyrie, I've got a two-hour drive back to Dublin where dry clothes await me. She nodded. I'll be ready. He walked to the Bentley. Fletcher turned to Valkyrie, hands loosely holding her arms. I didn't want to leave, he said quietly. She smiled. I know. You should have come with me. Let's not ruin a nice moment by arguing, okay? She kissed him. He sighed, and instead of rain on her face, there was sunshine. And instead of being outside a small cottage with a broken window, they were behind a tree in her back garden. Much better, she murmured. Dripping wet and covered in mud, she took Fletcher's hand and they stepped out from behind the tree. Her parents, cousins, aunts and uncles, friends and neighbours, people she'd known all her life and people she'd never met, stood around the barbecue pit and stared, their chatter dying away. Um, said Valkyrie. Chapter 6 China's Secret On Monday morning, China Sorrows walked the weed-strewn gap that led to the Church of the Faceless. She entered without knocking, found the head of this little chapel on his knees with his eyes closed, praying. A small man who greatly resembled a weasel. Prave, his name was. She didn't know his first name, and she didn't care. She'd been here only once before, and by the time she left, she had blood on her hands and a gun to dispose of. Curiosity, she said, and Prave's bulbous eyes snapped open, and he jumped up to his feet. That's what brought me here. Who, I wondered, would be audacious enough to summon me to a squalid little house of worthless worship such as this? Surely, I told myself, it can't be this man Prave, this snivelling little toad person with a penchant for bad suits and terrible shirts. What? What's wrong with that shirt? He burbled in a Yorkshire accent his voice a nasal whine that triggered a primal urge within China's psyche to hit something. It's orange, she told him. It can't be him, I thought. The man has no backbone to brag about, no spine to speak of. Who then? Who is pulling the strings of the weasel-faced toad person? So it is a curiosity that brings me here, Mr. Prave. Unveil your hidden master, or risk me growing bored. I do terrible things when I grow bored. Prave stared at her with those round, wet eyes of his, and China heard slow, measured footsteps in the other room. High heels on wood. China knew who it was instantly. Eliza Scorn walked through, dressed in black trousers and a jacket, she had left her long red hair to fall round her face, framing those cheekbones, those lips. Many men had fallen in love with Eliza Scorn, and then instantly forgotten her when China walked into the room. That was only the start of the animosity between them. China, Scorn said, smiling. Eliza, what a surprise. Please, I bet you've known I was back for months, haven't you? I may have heard talk. And you didn't try to get in touch? We could have met up, talked about the old days, traded gossip. Who's alive, who's dead, who's about to die, that kind of thing. My apologies, Eliza. I've been very busy. Of course, of course, with the library. I must call around to see how it looks. How have you been? You're still as beautiful as ever. As are you, my dear. I love your shoes. Aren't they delightful? I saw them and just had to have them. Their previous owner wasn't too keen to let them go, but I can be very persuasive when I want to be. Is that her blood and the left one? 
and no amount of scrubbing will get it out either. I hear you're still a treacherous heathen then? Your back is still turned to the dark gods? Both firmly and resolutely. I met some of them a few years ago. Not very nice, to heathen and disciple alike. Scorn shrugged. If the faceless ones deem those disciples to be unworthy, so be it. We'll just have to make sure that the rest of us are worthy of their love the next time they return. The next time? Oh, my dear Eliza, you're not going to carry on with this, are you? The faceless ones had their chance. They returned and they were sent away again. It's time to move on. Time to take up another hobby, like crocheting or serial killing. Nonsense. Their return, however brief, was a signal that it can be done. We just need better organization. And you are going to provide that? Naturally. The Church of the Faceless is going to have to expand, of course. We can't be seen to be congregating in run-down old chapels like this. We need to appeal to a higher level of patron, which is where you come in. Now this should be fascinating. We need your resources to get us started. Not just money, although we'll be taking that too, but your contacts. The people you know, China, they are what we want. They can get us what we need. It's going to be glorious, let me tell you. Eliza, I don't wish to be rude, but actually, no, I don't really care. Eliza, I came here today to find out who would have the audacity to summon me anywhere. If it had just been that weasel-faced gentleman cowering in the corner, he would be begging for forgiveness right about now. But as it's you, seeing as how we are such good friends, I will simply depart. It was lovely seeing you again. Prave, Scorn said. Why don't you step forward like a good little weasel and tell China what you told me? Prave stepped up, coughed, brushed the dust from his knees. A year and a half ago, he said nervously. You had just left here. I watched you go. There was a part of China that immediately tensed. But all she did was brush a strand of hair back over her ear and wait patiently. You met Remus Crooks outside, Brave continued. You were talking. He looked, he looked agitated, and I went out and hid behind the wall. I heard what he said before you shot him. Do you remember what Crooks said? Scorn asked China. I bet you do. He said that you handed Skaldagri Pleasant's wife and child over to Nefarian Serpine. He said that you led them to their deaths. China looked at them both and nodded slowly. I see, she said. Scorn smiled again. Look at her face, Prave. Isn't it a beautiful face? Isn't it the most beautiful face you ever did see? The beauty is so deceptive. Looking at her now, you'd never guess that she was calculating the most efficient way of killing us, would you? There's not a hint of that in those startlingly pale blue eyes. If we didn't know better, we'd still be gazing at her, falling in love all over again, and she could walk right up and stab us through the heart, and we'd never see it coming. All because of that beautiful face. But we do know better, don't we, Prave? We know better because I know China. I've known her a long, long time. We were inseparable once. We did everything together. We were so close we could practically read each other's minds. Can you read my mind now? China asked. Scorn laughed. I don't even need to, dear China, and I know you don't need to read mine. Blackmail is such an ugly, ungainly word, but these are ugly and ungainly times in which we live. You will do as I say. Exactly as I say, or I will tell the skeleton detective your terrible, terrible secret. Do you agree to my terms? I really can't see that I have any other choice now, do I? No, you really don't. 
Then I agree to your terms, said China. I'm usually the one doing the blackmailing, so at the very least it will be interesting to experience it from the other side. I'm glad you're taking this so well. Oh, dear Eliza, we are professionals, are we not? To allow something like this to get personal would be an unforgivable lapse of character. By the way, I was lying earlier. Those shoes are horrible on you. Scorn laughed and shook her head. Oh, China, I have missed you. And I have missed you, Eliza. But don't worry. Next time, my aim will be better. Scorn clapped her hands. Delightful, delightful. With her hands clasped over her chest, she walked from the room. We'll be in touch, my love, and you'll remember the way it used to be. Scorn and sorrows together again. The world will tremble. China watched her go, then turned and left the church without even glancing at Prave. The moment she stepped into the open air, her eyes narrowed and her jaw clenched. China spent the next few hours sitting in her apartment, running through scenarios in her head. Her only option seemed to be to kill Eliza Scorn, but even this had its problems. For one thing, someone as resourceful as Scorn would certainly have found a way to release the incriminating information in the event of her untimely demise. For another, the actual physical act of killing her would not be easy. Scorn was a formidable adversary, and not one China would be confident of taking down on her own. The main problem in all this was that China had a lot to lose, while Scorn had virtually nothing. This automatically put China in the weaker position, and if there was one thing China hated, it was a weak position. Someone knocked on the door, and China looked up, waved at the symbol carved into the doorframe. A section of the door turned translucent from her side, and she saw Valkyrie exchanging a few words with Skullduggery before he went into the library, and she turned back, continuing to wait. Neither seemed particularly furious, so China deemed it safe to open the door. Hello, my dear, she said, greeting Valkyrie with the warmest smile she was capable of. Come in, come in. Let us talk of important things before Skullduggery disturbs us. You look as beautiful as ever. Valkyrie smiled in response and walked in, wearing her usual black. You should have seen me yesterday, she said. Myself and Fletcher turned up at my sister's christening dripping with mud. Irish weather is not kind to teleportation. How did you manage to explain it? Sprinkler system... Flower beds, a lost dog. It wasn't easy, but eventually we bombarded everyone with enough conflicting details that they figured it was easier to just let us get away with it. Ah, the curse of maintaining a secret identity, China said. Valkyrie sat at the elaborately carved 18th century table, what was commonly referred to as an antique, even though China was much older. We went up against the Jitter Girls, Valkyrie said. China's eyebrows rose fractionally. How did you escape? Skullduggery and I managed to get them back in the box. My word, that is impressive. We're trying to identify the man who released them. I'm sorry, Valkyrie. I can't help you. The last I heard of the Jitter Girls, they'd been seen in New Zealand. But this was maybe ten years ago. I have no idea who would have had access to them since then. Of course... When I said we should talk of important things, that is not quite what I had in mind. Valkyrie laughed softly and crossed her legs. You want to know about Fletcher? But of course. Some people watch television for their vicarious thrills. All I need do is talk to you. How is Fletcher these days? Apart from Muddy. He's grand. Still annoying you. Sometimes. And how is this mysterious other person? Valkyrie's head dropped. I wish I hadn't told you about that. Oh, come on. You've barely told me anything. Today is the day when you reveal all, though. I can feel it. Do I know this person? Boy or girl? Boy, she said, 
then frowned. Well, I don't know if you'd call him a boy. Male? Definitely male. I don't know what I'm... When I say there's someone else, I don't mean it's someone I'm going to dump Fletcher for, but doesn't the fact that there is someone else mean something? Doesn't it mean that my feelings for Fletcher aren't as strong as... as his feelings for you? Well, yeah. But that was always going to be the case, was it not? That he would feel more deeply for you than you did for him? China sat down. I'm enjoying this immensely, by the way. Valkyrie looked quizzical. Enjoying what? I've never had any children, China said. And I haven't had a friend in centuries. To me, talking like this is wonderful. So tell me the truth now. Have you committed the cardinal sin? Uh, that depends, Valkyrie said warily. What's the cardinal sin? Have you told Fletcher you loved him? Oh, Valkyrie said, sagging again. Yes. Oh, my. It was ages ago, but I didn't mean it like that. Not really. But I said it, and he took it to mean that I'm in love with him. I haven't mentioned it since. I just, I don't know. Are you playing with Fletcher's heart, my dear? I'm trying not to. And this other man? I've no interest in a relationship with him either, said Valkyrie. Either? Sorry? You said you have no interest in a relationship with him either, implying you've no interest in a relationship with him or Fletcher? Valkyrie looked startled. I... that's not what I meant. Is your relationship with Fletcher coming to an end? There was silence, and then... I didn't mean it like that. I just meant... Oh, God, I don't know. I like having Fletcher. He's warm and nice and safe. All good qualities, China assured her. And a puppy? You need someone smart and strong and capable. Someone assured. You need someone to challenge you. You need someone better than you. That's what love is, you know. Love is finding someone better than you are and holding on for dear life. It sounds hard. The good things in life always are. But you're not looking for love, are you? Of course you're not. What girl your age is? You want fun. You want someone amazing, yes? Yes. How long have you been going out with Fletcher? A year and a half, maybe? If you care for him, and I know you care for him, you won't want to hurt him. But time passes and feelings deepen, and that's when the real hurt will set in. Are you taking him to the ball? Valkyrie blinked. The what? The Requiem Ball, dear. Oh, um, I don't know. Am I even going? Skullduggery didn't say anything. Of course you're going. You saved the world, haven't you? Well, yeah, but the Requiem Ball is to commemorate the end of the war with Nevalent, and I had nothing to do with that. Do you really think you'd be allowed to miss it because of a trifling matter of details? If you don't go this year, we'll have to wait another ten years for it to come round again. And that would never do. Oh, you love it. The women dress in the most beautiful gowns. The men wear tuxedos and we dance the night away. It is quite the social highlight of the decade. When you say dance, Valkyrie said, you don't mean the way you dance at a nightclub, do you? Because that's the only kind of dancing I know how to do. It's nothing extravagant, China assured her. A waltz or two, a tango, a minuet, even a quadrille if we're feeling debauched. We're going to have to get you into a gloriously decadent dress, I think, with gloriously decadent shoes that will make you even taller than you are now. Skullduggery knocked on the door, and China let him in. He was, as ever, impeccably dressed. We were just talking about the Requiem Ball, she said. I assume the two of you are going? Naturally, Skullduggery replied, removing his hat. We are? Valkyrie asked, clearly surprised. You didn't tell me. Did I not? How unlike me. Still, I simply couldn't deprive you of your chance to see me in a tuxedo. I wear it well, as you can imagine. Besides, it would be rude not to invite you. Technically, you own the venue where it's being held. And what? 
China said. It used to be held in a mansion owned by the late Coroval Juice. But your dear Uncle Gordon has offered us the use of his house instead. Or your house, whichever it is. Ah, said Valkyrie. Well, it's certainly big enough. I mean, it's got rooms I never go into. Will I have to do anything like stand at the door and welcome people or... Nothing like that, Skullduggery said, sounding amused. You'll be treated as just another very important guest. There'll be nothing for you to worry about. And if all the smiling and small talk proves too much for you, you can always disappear into Gordon's study and read one of his books until everyone leaves. Finally, Valkyrie smiled. Okay. Okay, yeah, I can do that. Skullduggery turned to China. Back to business, though. Has Valkyrie spoken to you about what we're after? You mean the person who set the Jitter girls on you? I'm afraid I was of no assistance in the matter. I do, however, have other news you may not have heard. I was waiting for you to join us before I divulged. Please, Skullduggery said, divulge. China gave the information a respectable pause. The necromancers have their death-bringer. Valkyrie looked up sharply. They what? Who? asked Skullduggery. Nothing has been announced yet, China said, holding up her hands. So nothing has been confirmed. But apparently one of the fledgling necromancers has recently experienced the surge. It must have unlocked some hitherto unknown reserves of power, because every temple around the world is celebrating in typical necromancer fashion. Very quietly, of course, with barely any smiles. Skullduggery looked at Valkyrie. Do you have any idea who the Deathbringer could be? Well, the only one I know of who was waiting for the surge was Melancholia, but that's her, China said. That's her name, Melancholia St. Clair. Valkyrie shook her head. She's the Deathbringer. Wow! I mean, wow! Didn't see that coming. It's nice to be let off the hook and all, but you sure? That's the rumour going round. When did you hear? Skullduggery asked. This morning. I was going to call to let you know, but I was a little preoccupied. We should go, Skullduggery said, and report this to the elders. China smiled. It must be such a relief, after all this time, to have two of your best friends on the council. It's a nice change, Skullduggery admitted. But really, I mostly go to mock the robes they wear. China, thank you very much. Valkyrie? Valkyrie nodded. Skullduggery put his hat back on and they left, shutting the door behind them. Silence settled in the apartment once again, and China frowned. She usually liked silence, liked the solitude that accompanied it, but not recently. Recently the solitude was starting to feel rather like loneliness, and that was not a feeling she was accustomed to. She stood by the window until she saw Skullduggery and Valkyrie walk to the Bentley. She felt an irrational urge to rush after them, to continue their conversation, to help them formulate plans and strategies, but she didn't. That wasn't who she was. China didn't join people. People joined her. That was the simple, inalienable fact of her existence. And she'd been around for too long to change it now. How much of this sudden fear of being alone was due to the threat posed by Eliza Scorn, China didn't know. But the fact was, if she allowed the situation to worsen, she could very well lose the friendship of the two most important people in her life. And then those same two people could very well come after her with murder on their minds. Chapter 7 The Deathbringer Wreath watched her while the others fawned. She sat like she was delicate, as if a sudden move might snap her in two. She was pale, sickly. Her blonde hair was limp, her face a network of small, raised scars. 
She was still the tall, skinny girl she'd always been, but there was something different about her. Even Wreath had to admit that. There was something in the way she looked at the people around her. No longer the student, no longer the girl who opened doors and fetched the high priest's meals. She was special. She was important. She was the most important person who would ever live. Craven was loving it, of course. Over the past few months he had taken a personal interest in Melancholia's studies, which was distinctly unusual for a man who despised helping anyone other than himself. But here he was, shaking his head in an attempt to appear modest. The man who had recognised the potential and nursed the Deathbringer through her surge. Wreath had hoped that he would have been the one to do that, to guide Valkyrie when she needed guidance the most. It was not to be, however. The honour had never been meant for him. But why, oh why, had it gone to someone like Craven? Here sits our saviour, Cleric Quiver said from Wreath's elbow. Wreath hadn't even heard him approach. I suppose she does, Wreath said. I have to hand it to Craven, though. He saw something in Melancholia that I completely missed. I had always viewed her as somewhat unexceptional. As had I, Quiver responded. I fully expected young Valkyrie to be the one. Wreath raised an eyebrow. You never told me that. It's not my job to tell you things, Cleric Wreath. Has anyone ever told you that you're a hard man to like? My mother may have said something along those lines. That doesn't surprise me in the slightest. Not to put a dampener on the occasion, but does the Deathbringer appear weak to you? She looks tired, said Wreath, nodding. She looks drained. From what I've heard, it was an unusually long surge. What do you think those scars are for? Cleric Craven says they are protection sigils, to guard her from her own power. Do you believe him? The ghost of a shrug was all Quiver offered. Our tests have shown extreme spikes and drops in her power level, he said. It is quite conceivable that she could hurt herself if careless. You don't believe him, I take it? We don't know, to be honest. I don't even know if it matters. If she gets the job done, who am I to complain? Have your tests told you when she'll be strong enough to initiate the passage? Every spike is stronger than the one preceding it. If she continues in this fashion a few days, maybe a week, with our dear friend Cleric Craven holding her hand every step of the way, Wreath said, allowing the distaste to creep into his voice. Are you ready for the world to be a better place? I never really liked this world all that much to begin with, so any change would be an improvement. And you? You've always seemed to like things the way they are. I got used to it, Wreath admitted. But I've lived my entire life waiting for the passage. I'm not going to bemoan the fact that we're finally about to get it. You know, I think this is the most we've ever talked, you and I. Why is that, do you think? Quiver shrugged. Until this point, I confess that I was never sure if I liked you. Now I just don't care any more. Wreath smiled. Chapter 8 Friends in High Places Roarhaven stood like a dirty ink blot on a nice clean sheet. A small town, barely even that, beside a dark and stagnant lake. It was hemmed in on two sides by steep banks of brown grasses. It had its main street and its offshoots, its houses and bars and grim windowed shops. Sorcerers lived in this town, but only the truly bitter, the genuinely resentful. The outside world was a world gone wrong, 
a world of ignorant mortals with their squabbling ways. In the bars of Roarhaven, of which there were two, the citizens were known to whisper of some future time when the mortals would fall and the sorcerers rise. And when the drink gave them the courage, these whispers would grow louder, turn to muttered odes punctuated by fists pounding on tabletops. Change, they said, was coming. Roarhaven, Valkyrie knew, was many things. One thing it was not, by any stretch of the imagination was a tourist town. So when the Bentley passed, a rental car stopped outside what passed for the town's corner shop, Valkyrie frowned. Pull over, she said. Skullduggery looked at her as they slowed. Here? I've seen how this place treats strangers. I just want to make sure we're not going to need Geoffrey Scrutinous to come in and smooth things over. The Bentley stopped and Valkyrie got out. Skullduggery continued onto the sanctuary as she walked back to the rental car. A woman sat in the passenger seat. Three kids were squashed in behind. American accents. She smiled at the woman, got a curt nod back, and then she entered the shop. A few newspapers on the racks. No magazines. Some food. Confectionaries. Stationery. A fridge with cartons of milk and ham slices. And a broad American man arguing over the counter with the tight-lipped shopkeeper. Valkyrie smiled as she walked up. Is there a problem? she asked. This man won't leave me alone, said the shopkeeper. The American frowned at him. I'm trying to buy something. The shopkeeper ignored him. He just won't leave. The American turned to Valkyrie. We came into this store... It's not a store, interrupted the shopkeeper. It's a shop. Fine, the American growled. We came into this shop ten minutes ago. My kids picked out what they wanted, brought them up to the counter to pay. This jerk stood there, right where he is now, looking up at the ceiling while we tried to get his attention. I was ignoring them, said the shopkeeper. I had heard that if you ignore them, they go away. This one did not go away. You're damn right I'm not going away. I am a customer, and you will serve me. The shopkeeper sneered. We don't serve your kind here. You don't serve Americans? I don't serve mortals. The American raised his eyebrows at Valkyrie. And then he starts with this nonsense. Valkyrie looked at the shopkeeper. Wouldn't it be easier at this stage to just let him buy the stuff and leave? The shopkeeper shook his head. You do that for one of them, you'll have to do it for all of them. For all of who? There isn't anyone else waiting out there. They'll hear about it, though. Hear about it? The American said. Hear about this little shop in the middle of nowhere where I actually bought something? First of all, I don't even know where we are. Far as I can tell, it's not on any of our maps. I can find that dirty lake out there, but there's not supposed to be any freaky little town beside it. If you didn't know there was anything here, the shopkeeper said, then how did you find us? We're sightseeing. Sightseeing, the shopkeeper said. Are spying. Spying? On you? Why the hell would we spy on you? You're a lunatic with a crummy little store. He seems to have a pathological need to not sell anything to his customers. I'm sorry, said the shopkeeper. I can't understand your ridiculous accent. My accent? It is quite silly. So you can't understand me? Not a word. Then how did you understand that? I didn't. You didn't understand what I just said? That's right. You understood that, though? Not at all. The American glowered. I swear to God, I will reach across this counter and I will punch you right in the mouth. Uh, Valkyrie said. I think we should all calm down a little. Sir, as you may have guessed, this isn't the friendliest town in the world. You go to any other town in the area, I can guarantee that you'll be greeted with the biggest smiles you've ever seen. But they do things differently here. We just stopped off for some soda for my kids. And I'm not leaving until this guy takes my money and gives me my change. Please, Valkyrie said to the shopkeeper. Take his money? 
The shopkeeper lowered his eyes to the money on the counter, his lip curling distastefully. He placed a finger on the note and dragged it to the till. You're a piece of work. You know that? The American asked. The shopkeeper ignored him and spilled a few coins onto the counter. With a sigh, he looked up. Happy? The American stuffed the change in his pocket, then picked up the drinks. I heard the Irish were especially friendly. That was before anyone ever came here, the shopkeeper told him. Now we're exactly as friendly as everyone else. The American narrowed his eyes, but managed to restrain himself from slipping further into the argument. I'm going to walk out of here. Someone as rude as you, you're not worth my time. The shopkeeper didn't respond. He had gone back to looking up at the ceiling. Valkyrie escorted the American to his car. I'm really sorry about that, she said. I've been visiting this town for almost a year now, and they still don't like talking to me either. Skullduggery walked over, a bright smile on his fake face. Hello there, he cried. Everything okay? The American frowned suspiciously, but Valkyrie nodded to him. Just the shopkeeper being rude again, that's all. Ah, Skullduggery said. Yes, very rude man, that shopkeeper. All's well, though? No harm done? Excellent. He crouched at the car window and looked in. What a lovely family you have. What a charming family. They're all lovely. Except for that one. His finger jabbed the glass. That one's a bit ugly. The American stepped towards him. What? What did you say? Oh, don't worry. I'm sure his personality makes up for his face. Valkyrie jumped between them, keeping the American back. He didn't mean it, she said quickly. My friend is not right in the head. He just says things, bad things. I'm really very sorry. You should probably go. Not before this creep gives my kid an apology. Oh, God, Valkyrie muttered. Have I offended you? Skullduggery asked. Oh, dear, I really am sorry. Don't apologize to me, the American snarled. Apologize to my son. Which one, the ugly one? Whichever one you were talking about. It was the ugly one, Skullduggery confirmed. Stop calling my kid ugly! Valkyrie elbowed Skullduggery in the ribs. Apologize this instant, she said through gritted teeth. Of course, Skullduggery said, and leaned down to the window. I'm very sorry, he said loudly so they could hear. Sometimes I say things and I'm not aware that I'm saying them until it's too late. It's entirely my fault. My sincerest apologies for any offence caused. He straightened up. The American finally dragged his eyes off Skullduggery. This, he said, is the nastiest town I've ever been to. I couldn't agree with you more, Valkyrie said. He glared at Skullduggery one final time, then got into the rental car and drove off. What? Valkyrie said. Was that? Skullduggery tilted his head. What was what? You called his kid ugly. Did I? It just happened twenty seconds ago. Oh, I didn't notice, to be honest. My mind was elsewhere. I'm sure I was joking, though, and I'm sure he knew I was joking. It's all fine. It was an ugly kid, though. Did you see it? It's like it had two half-finished faces pushed together. Still, all that's in the past. I do hope they come back. They seem nice. Come along. He walked towards the sanctuary. Valkyrie hurried to catch up. Are you feeling okay? she asked. Me? You? I suppose I'm feeling a little discombobulated, a little out of sorts. But I'm fine. I'll be fine. Why are we here? She frowned. We're meeting with the elders about melancholia. He snapped his fingers. 
Yes. Excellent. Good. So we are. Marvellous. The Bentley was parked outside an ugly building of concrete and granite. The sanctuary was round and flat and low, and squatted beside the stagnant lake like someone had dropped it from a great height. It had one main entrance and three hidden exits. No windows, no paint, no frills. Inside it was just as frugal, stone walls and curving corridors flowing in a concentric pattern to the middle. Cleavers stood guard and sorcerers and officials went about their business. No matter the weather outside, it was always cold in the sanctuary. The administrator met them when they entered. Detectives Pleasant and Kane, the council is waiting for you. Skullduggery nodded. Lead the way, Tipstaff. Tipstaff nodded politely. They followed him on a bisecting route through the ever-decreasing circles of corridors, straight to the round room at the building's core. Pictures of dead elders lined the walls, salvaged from the gloom by small spotlights. Three large chairs like thrones, were placed in the middle of the room. And on those thrones sat the elders. Ghastly Bespoke sat to the left, the light playing on the ridges of the scars that covered his entire head. In the middle sat Grand Mage Erskine Ravel, a handsome man with beautiful eyes and the slyest smile Valkyrie had ever seen. And on the right sat Madame Mist, a child of the spider who looked at them through her veil. Out of all three elders, she was the only one who didn't seem to mind the robes they had to wear. Skullduggery Pleasant and Valkyrie Kane seek an audience with the council, Tipstaff announced, bowing before them. Does the council acquiesce? Ghastly sighed. Is this really necessary? Tipstaff looked up. Protocol must be followed, Elder Bespoke. But there are friends. That may be so, yet rules exist to guard us from chaos. This is a new sanctuary, and protocol must be established and followed. So we sit up here on these bloody thrones, Ravel said, and they stand down there. We can't walk around or, I don't know, grab a coffee while we talk? If you want coffee, I'll be more than happy to bring you some, Grand Mage. I don't want coffee, Ravel grumbled. Fine. Okay. We'll follow the rules. Skullduggery, Valkyrie, sorry about this. No need to apologize, Skullduggery said. The whole situation is highly amusing, believe me. I like your robes, by the way. I tried to redesign them, Ghastly muttered, but apparently that's not allowed either. Tipstaff said nothing. Madame Mist didn't move an inch as she spoke. Now that the quaint small talk has been dispensed with, perhaps the detectives could tell us what they came to see us about. Something to do with Melancholia Sinclair, no doubt. Skullduggery hesitated. You've heard, then? We have, said Ravel. What do we know about her? She's a few years older than me, Valkyrie said. Not much more than a low-level student. She spent her life in the temple reading the books and practicing how to sound really pretentious when she talks. I don't think anyone expected her to suddenly become so powerful. Wreath didn't. Tenebrae didn't. Ghastly moved in his seat, trying to get comfortable. Is she trouble? She's nothing but a necromancer, Mist said in her soft voice. All this talk of the Deathbringer is a waste of our time. Darkus is the true danger. We should be focusing our energies on finding and killing her before she has a chance to strike. The necromancers should not be dismissed so casually, Skullduggery said as Valkyrie looked away. I agree, Ghastly nodded. If Valkyrie had turned out to be the Deathbringer, we could have kept a close eye on things. That would have been ideal. But now there's an actual necromancer in that position, we lose that advantage. Mist sighed. The necromancers are selfish cowards. They haven't posed a threat to anyone in hundreds of years, and I doubt they're going to start now. I hate to say it, 
said Ravel. But Elder Mist is right. It's hard to take them seriously when they've barely poked a head out of their temples in so long. Maybe if we knew a little more about this passage thing? The necromancers are working to keep us in the dark, Skullduggery said. Two people with vital information have so far been killed. That, in itself, tells me they're planning something big. Ghastly frowned. You told me once that the passage is something that will break through the barrier between life and death. Yes. So what does that actually mean? To be honest, Ghastly, I haven't a bull's notion. Elder Bespoke should be addressed by his title, Tipstaff said. Of course, Skullduggery said. To be honest, your highness, I haven't a bull's notion. The necromancers believe life is a continuous stream of energy, flowing from life into death and round again into life. It's all very vague and unsatisfying. They want to save the world, which is nice of them, but as of yet, they haven't told us what they want to save the world from. Well, Ravel said, maybe we'll get lucky and Lord Vile would make an appearance, kill the Deathbringer like he said he would, take care of this whole thing before it becomes a problem, and then walk off into the sunset. I think it would be a mistake to count on Lord Vile to do anything other than murder a whole lot of people, Skullduggery said. Agreed, said Ghastly. Detective Pleasant, Madame Mist said, it is a well-known fact that you don't like the Necromancer Order, that you take particular exception to their activities, especially since Solomon Wreath began training your protégé. That would be an accurate summation, yes. You don't feel that your attitude could be tainting your objectivity? When it comes to the necromancers, Skullduggery said, I'm not objective in the slightest. That doesn't mean I'm wrong. Our next move should be a visit to the temple, where we can ask Solomon Wreath about this unknown agent who keeps killing the people we want to talk to. So you're requesting that more sanctuary resources be made available to you, should you need them? Ravel asked. Skullduggery shrugged. Yes, I am, your almighty holiness. What's the point of having friends in high places if you can't use them to settle old grudges? Ghastly looked at Ravel. We need to find out what they're up to. This is a waste of our time, said Mist. Ravel shook his head. I'm willing to go along with Skullduggery on this one. It might turn out to be nothing, but we need to find out what this passage is. And we need to stop people dying. He sat back in his throne, raising an eyebrow. Hear that, Skullduggery? The elders have spoken. That is the sound of the system working for you. Skullduggery tipped his hat to them. I'm not going to lie to you. I could get used to this. Chapter 9 Friends in Low Places Valkyrie's boots crunched on old graveyard gravel on their way to the crypt. Skullduggery didn't even have his façade up. There was no one around on this bright evening to see them anyway. By this stage, Valkyrie knew the cemetery well, which was an odd boast for a sixteen-year-old to make, she was aware. Skullduggery knocked heavily on the crypt door. Thirty seconds later, it opened and a pale face regarded them with casual indifference. Valkyrie recognized him. His name was Oblivion, or Obliviate, or something, or maybe Oblivious. No, she doubted it was Oblivious, although... Yes, said Oblivious. What? This is why I like necromancers, Skullduggery said. You're all so cheerful all the time. We'd like to speak with Cleric Wreath, please. Cleric Wreath is busy, Oblivious said lazily, and started to close the door. Skullduggery jammed it with his foot. I'm sure he'd love to see us, though. Look, she's his favourite student. Oblivious observed Valkyrie, then sighed. We already have a Deathbringer, thank you. We don't need another one. He's expecting us, Valkyrie said. He said to come right over. 
He's got exciting news. He said we could walk right in, actually. Your name isn't on the list, Oblivious responded. Well, maybe not on your list, Valkyrie laughed. Are you implying that there is more than one list? I don't know, Valkyrie said mysteriously. Am I? Oblivious frowned. I'm not sure what you... Super, Skullduggery exclaimed, and Oblivious yelped as Skullduggery shoved the door open and barged through. Valkyrie hurried down the narrow steps after him. I didn't give you permission, Oblivious raged. Guards! Guards! We have intruders! Two necromancers appeared at the bottom of the stairs. Skullduggery waved to them. We're not really intruding, he called down. This is all a big misunderstanding. Stop right there, shouted one of them. Skullduggery held his hand to an ear he didn't have. What's that? Stop! Keep going! Stop! Okay, we'll keep going. The necromancer guards backed off as Skullduggery and Valkyrie reached the bottom of the stairs. Is Solomon in? Skullduggery asked. We'd like to give him a present that Valkyrie got for the Deathbringer. It's a small gift, just to say congratulations, the best woman won, etc., etc. Valkyrie, show them the gift. Valkyrie smiled at them, searched through the pockets of her jacket, and came out with a half-empty packet of Skittles. Oblivious came charging down the stairs. You do not have permission to be here. You are trespassing. Only a little bit, Skullduggery said. We'll wait here for Wreath, if you wouldn't mind calling him. Oblivious jabbed a finger into Skullduggery's chest. I demand that you leave. But that would defeat the whole purpose of coming here. We can do this the easy way, Oblivious snarled. Ah, uh, the hard way. What's the easy way? You leave immediately. And what's the hard way? We make you leave. Skullduggery's head tilted. What's the easy way again? Let them through, said a voice from behind the guards. Solomon Reith walked towards them, dressed in a black suit with a black shirt, cane in hand. But they're trespassing, Oblivious protested weakly. Wreath waved a hand. Only a little bit. But our orders are from the high priest himself. Now that we have the Deathbringer, we can't allow any outsiders into the temple for her safety. Then they'll stay here in the antechamber. They're practically already outside. Wreath's good humour faded for a moment. Now go away. The guards dispersed, and Oblivious swallowed thickly and backed off. Sorry about that, Reed said, turning to them. Quite all right, Skullduggery responded. Reed smiled. I wasn't talking to you. Valkyrie, I wanted to speak to you before this. I really did. But things have been hectic here, and... Don't worry about it, she said, shrugging. Melancholia gets to save the world. That's cool. Saves me from having to do it, right? Still... I should have been the one to tell you. No one was more surprised than I when Craven brought her forward as the Deathbringer. But we've run some preliminary tests on our powers, and they exceed anything we've ever seen, so she certainly qualifies. I'm not sure how it happened. It defies explanation, but, well, it happened. Really, Solomon, it's okay. You're not going to ask for the ring back, though, are you? Wreath smiled. No, just because you're not the Deathbringer doesn't mean you won't make a powerful necromancer. But if this passage thing happens, and I'm not trying to mock your beliefs or anything, won't we be living in a paradise? Am I to take it that you don't yet believe the world is about to change? Sorry, it's just kind of hard to imagine. Again, it's your belief, and I don't want to offend you, Wreath smiled. You could never offend me. I bet I could, said Skullduggery. Solomon, we want to talk to you about a friend of yours we ran into yesterday. Absolutely charming fellow, bald he was with a terrible goatee. He set the jitter girls on us while he made his escape. That's dreadful, Wreath said. But I'm afraid it doesn't ring any bells. Anything else? 
Any other distinguishing marks or specific traits? He was killing an old woman because she knew something about the passage, and a few days earlier he'd killed a homeless man for the same reason, the skullduggery said. Is that specific enough for you? That all sounds terrible, Reed said. And yet, again, no bells are ringing. Solomon, Valkyrie said. Come on, he was a necromancer, he was one of you. That doesn't mean I know anything about what he was doing. But you do know him, yes? He looked at her. Bald with a goatee, I might. The people he killed were of no threat to anyone. Paul Lynch was a sensitive, with a history of mental health problems. The only person who was ever going to listen to him was the old lady who was killed next. Wreath nodded. It does seem quite excessive. What's the bald man's name? Valkyrie asked. Wreath sighed. Dragonclaw. She frowned. Seriously? Seriously. That's a ridiculous name. We are quite aware of how ridiculous it is, thank you. He's used for black ops, but not very often. He tends to go too far. Using the Jitter Girls as a delaying tactic is a perfect example of this. And you know nothing about it? Skullduggery asked. Not a thing, Reed said. I've been busy lately, in case you haven't noticed. I was ready to take Valkyrie to the next stage of her training, but now it seems as if melancholia will be taking up everyone's time. Joy of joys. Valkyrie heard the main door open again as someone else entered the temple. She heard footsteps coming down the stairs. So when might we get to experience this wonderful and world-changing passage? Skullduggery asked. Soon enough, Reed said. Don't you worry about it. We heard we had until Sunday. Would that be all right, right? Wreath did an impressive job of keeping the frown off his face. Where did you hear that? So it is Sunday, then. Wreath scowled. Maybe. By our calculations, Sunday would seem to be the best time to attempt it. Whether or not things work out the way we'd like remains to be seen. On Sunday the world changes. On Sunday the world is saved. Yes, Skullduggery said. Well, we'll see about that. They turned. Saw Dragonclaw coming down the steps. He caught sight of them and froze. Some people here to see you, Wreath called lazily. And Dragonclaw spun on the step and ran back the way he had come. Skullduggery bolted after him. Valkyrie at his heels. They ran up the steps and burst out into the open air to see Dragonclaw sprinting for the gate. He had a dagger in his hand, and with it he drew in the lengthening shadows and flicked them behind him. Skullduggery went right, Valkyrie went left, and the shadows passed harmlessly between them. Dragonclaw waved the dagger in a circle, surrounding himself with darkness, and vanished. Skullduggery didn't stop running. He can't shadow walk far, he said. He's still in the area. A car sped by on the road outside the cemetery, dragon clawed the wheel. They ran for the Bentley. Valkyrie had barely buckled her seatbelt when Skullduggery jammed his foot in the accelerator and they shot forward. They got to the end of the road and turned, taking the corner so tight it was like the Bentley was on rails. Dragonclaw's car, a black Hyundai, appeared through the windscreen. It overtook a van and swerved dangerously. The Bentley was gaining fast. The Hyundai left the road, spinning its wheels as it slid sideways, and then took off down a narrow lane, careening from wall to wall. Skullduggery braked, changed gears, swung smoothly into the lane in pursuit. The walls whipped by on either side and Valkyrie cringed, expecting the wing mirrors to be snapped off. Skullduggery, of course, would never allow that to happen. Dragonclaw wasn't as skillful. The Hyundai hit a broken pallet that had been discarded in a pile of rubbish and it jumped slightly, its left side screeching against the wall. He pulled away too sharply and hit the right wall, jamming the Hyundai the width of the lane. As the Bentley braked, Valkyrie could see Dragonclaw clambering over the seat and tumbling out of the car on the far side. She got out, Skullduggery already moving for the Hyundai. 
They both used the air to jump the ruined car. But when they landed on the other side, Dragonclaw was gone. Valkyrie started to run. But Skullduggery reached out, grabbed her arm. He must have known we go to the temple, Skullduggery said. She realized he had his gun in his hand. He must have taken into account the chance that we'd find him. Valkyrie frowned. You think this is a trap? I don't know, he said. But I try not to underestimate my opponents, no matter how ridiculous their beards. A man walked into the lane from the other end. Valkyrie tensed. He walked towards them slowly, taking his time. Wary of distractions, Valkyrie splayed her left hand, doing her best to read the air. If someone dropped from the buildings above, hopefully she'd notice the disruption to the air currents before they landed on her head. The man walked closer. He wore a frayed coat and old, ill-fitting clothes. He was unshaven and needed a haircut. He was holding something, a photograph. When he was twenty paces away, he stopped, examined the photo, then looked up. Skaldagari Pleasant and Valkyrie Kane, he said. His accent was thick, Eastern European, and he sounded bored. I've been paid to kill you. He put the photograph away. Interesting, Skaldagari said. Does it make any difference, the fact that I am pointing a gun at you? The man shrugged. He doesn't seem worried, Valkyrie murmured. That's never a good sign, Skullduggery murmured back. He spoke louder. We have no quarrel with you. We just want the man who hired you. We want Dragonclaw. It doesn't matter if you have a quarrel with me or not, the man replied, raising his hand. I'm going to kill you both. Happy to disappoint. Skullduggery said, and pulled the trigger. The bullet hit the man in the neck, opening up a wound from which burst dazzling yellow light. He clamped a hand over the wound, shutting off the glare, and when he removed it, the bullet hole had sealed. You're a warlock, Skullduggery said. I thought your kind were extinct. For the first time, the man smiled. Almost. Not quite. We're growing stronger every day. What are you doing here? You're a mercenary now, is that it? Being paid to kill people. This is a special favor, the warlock replied. When it is over, when I am told my services are no longer required, I will return home. What are you getting out of this? What is Dragonclaw doing for you in return? Or maybe it's not Dragonclaw. Maybe it's the necromancers as a whole. What do they want? I can't see the point of telling you, seeing as how you will be dead soon. What do you know of the passage? Skullduggery asked. The warlock shook his head. I don't know what that is, and we have talked enough. His hand bubbled and boiled, and when he thrust it forward, his palm burst open and a stream of yellow light erupted from beneath. It hit Valkyrie's left shoulder and she spun, cursing, her shoulder tingling, then going numb, and by the time she found her balance again, her whole arm was dead. Skullduggery had used those few seconds to launch himself at the warlock. His hat flew off as he slammed his forehead into the man's face followed it with three sharp elbows and then clubbed the man with the butt of his gun. The warlock reached out, taking hold of him and launching him through the air. Valkyrie whipped her good hand at the warlock and a trail of shadows sought the man out. They slashed across his face, tearing skin. More light burst from the wounds. Valkyrie whipped her hand back, pouring her magic into the next strike, aiming to take the man's head from his body. But her opponent ducked, moving fast, and another beam of light escaped from the jagged hole in his palm. Valkyrie jerked away, the light narrowly missing her, and the man was upon her, fingers closing around her throat. The warlock hauled her up, slammed her against the wall with one hand. His other hand, the hand with the hole in it, was inches from Valkyrie's face. It began to bubble again.
Chapter 10 The Warlock Skullduggery slammed into the warlock just as the yellow light exploded. The beam missed Valkyrie, and she fell awkwardly, aware of Skullduggery and the warlock tumbling away from her. Skullduggery was up first, made to grab the warlock, but the warlock kept ducking and dodging, giving himself room, not letting Skullduggery latch on to him. And then his hand opened up again, and that light burst out, catching Skullduggery full in the chest. Skullduggery crumpled to the ground. The warlock straightened up, held his hand out towards Valkyrie. She swept her arm up, and a sudden wind took her off her feet as the yellow light exploded, lancing the space where she had just been standing. She spun through the air, hit the ground and tumbled, finally rolling to her feet. The warlock wasn't looking so calm anymore. He cradled his wounded hand close to his chest, flexing the fingers. He was pale, his jaw clenched. Using that kind of magic was taking its toll. Valkyrie's arm was tingling now as feeling returned to it. She'd probably only get one chance at ending this fight, and she had to seize it. She broke into a sprint, barreling right at the warlock. She saw the man's other hand too late, saw how the skin bubbled, and though she tried to twist out of the way, she wasn't fast enough. The yellow light filled her vision, and she lost bearing. She wasn't running any more. She knew that. She wasn't doing anything any more. She blinked, saw the sky above. She was lying on her back. Her body was numb, unresponsive. She heard steps. The warlock, walking slowly, dragging his feet, getting closer. He came into view. His hair clung tight to his scalp. He was sweating. He held his hands away from his body. The fingers curled painfully. He looked weak. He looked drained. He looked hungry. With much effort, the warlock straddled Valkyrie, sitting on her belly, a bent knee on either side. The wounds on his hands were trying to close, but they were too great. The warlock didn't move for the longest time. He was gathering his strength. Valkyrie tried to move, but she couldn't. She tried to speak, but she couldn't do that either. The warlock licked his dry lips pull them back off his teeth. He did that a few more times, and every time he did it, his mouth widened. His jaw clicked and cracked. His teeth darkened. He was getting ready to eat. In her mind, Valkyrie screamed and raged. She kicked and punched and fought. In her mind, she reached up and raked the eyes of the warlock, gouging them from their sockets. She clawed the warlock's face, leaving bloody furrows in the skin. But her body did none of that. Her body lay where it was. The warlock was going to eat through her flesh to her soul, and by the looks of it, Valkyrie was going to be alive when it all happened. She felt something. A tingle in her right boot. Her big toe. She could feel her big toe. She wriggled it, tried to get the feeling to spread. A finger now. The middle finger on her left hand tingling and buzzing, pins and needles, lovely pins and lovely needles. She could feel the warlock's weight now. Her hip buzzed, the buzzing travelling slowly across her waist. The warlock knew none of this. The warlock just sat there, licking his lips and widening his mouth, the teeth looking bigger, darker, stronger. They looked like teeth that could tear through bone and gristle. Valkyrie's own lips were burning as sensation flooded back into them. Her nose was itchy. The warlock's mouth stopped widening. The process was complete. The warlock was going to eat before feeling returned to Valkyrie's arms and legs. The warlock bent down, the huge mouth wide open, and Valkyrie sat up and crunched her head into his nose. He gagged, dropped back a little, shaking his head, eyes closed, too stunned to react properly. She did it again the pain exploding through her skull, and this time the warlock toppled backwards. She shifted her hips to the side, managed to get to her knees, tried to run but collapsed. The warlock roared in pain and anger, his hand closed around her ankle, and he pulled her to him. Skullduggery grabbed him from behind, wrapping him up in a sleeper hold and hauling him to his feet. The warlock's huge mouth snapped and snarled. Valkyrie fumbled clumsily for the handcuffs she kept on her belt. 
Moving unsteadily, she fell against the warlock. He tried to bite her, but she swayed away from him, grabbed an arm, and clicked the handcuff around his wrist. The warlock gasped as his magic was bound. His mouth shrank. Skullduggery threw him against the wall and stomped on his knee. The warlock howled in pain as Skullduggery cuffed the other hand. Valkyrie's knees gave out, but Skullduggery grabbed her, stopped her from falling. I'm all tingly, Valkyrie said. I have that effect, Skullduggery responded. You won't stop us, the warlock snarled from the ground. My brothers and sisters will be coming for you. Lots of people are coming for us, Skullduggery told them. We're very unpopular in certain circles, evil circles, you know. But your brothers and sisters are very far away, and it's going to take a while for them to even hear about this. So they don't really concern us right now. The only thing we care about is finding Dragonclaw. If you can help us do that, we'd be willing to make a deal. You cannot bargain, the warlock said. It's too late for that. Too late for you. I will be avenged. Valkyrie raised an eyebrow. We hit you a few times. Is there really a need to be avenged for a few slaps? The warlock managed to smile. Look out for us, he said. We are coming. He contorted in pain, eyes screwed tightly shut. When he opened them, yellow light spilled out. Uh-oh, Skullduggery said. He scooped Valkyrie into his arms, and they flew, the wind in her hair, landing behind the Hyundai as more light burst from the warlock's screaming mouth. Skullduggery pulled Valkyrie down behind cover, and there was an explosion of yellow light. And then, nothing. Valkyrie blinked rapidly, trying to get her vision back. She felt Skullduggery stand up, and she did the same. What happened? she asked. He's dead. Skullduggery answered. Some kind of warlock self-destruct thing. It must have been triggered the moment his powers were bound. Her sight was returning to her, and she looked over at where the warlock had lain. Now there were only his empty clothes. Skullduggery called the sanctuary, then searched through the warlock's clothes while they waited for backup to arrive. Nothing, he said. No receipts. No ticket stubs, no clues. Warlocks, eh? Valkyrie said, watching him. Warlocks are dark sorcerers on a dark path. They eat the souls of their enemies to absorb their strength. I haven't gone up against them in a long time. I didn't think there were any left. Skullduggery picked up his hat and put it on. During the war, Mevelin tried to form an alliance with them. He sent a squad of his best people to open negotiations, and they were never heard from again. And yet we just took down one of them, Valkyrie said. They don't seem to be that tough, apart from the nearly killing us bit. Do you think there'll be more? Eventually. Not for a while. If we're lucky. This is the second time Dragon Claws got away from us, though. First the Jitter Girls, now a warlock. He really is breaking all the rules. Skullduggery looked up. Still, maybe this will convince the elders to take the necromancer threat seriously. Valkyrie frowned. You don't think they do already? Not really, no. Neither does anyone else. All the sanctuaries around the world are either too busy with their own problems or they're preparing to battle this oh-so-mysterious Darkess. If the Deathbringer was seen as a threat, we'd have teams from twenty different sanctuaries storming the temple as we speak. Maybe that means the passage won't be a bad thing, then. Maybe it will save the world. Skullduggery shook his head. Paul Lynch had a vision of something that got him killed. This ridiculous dragonclaw person isn't covering up that trail for the fun of it. Then maybe the other sanctuaries are just hoping that Lord Vile carries out his threat and kills the Deathbringer. Very likely, Skullduggery said. Valkyrie hesitated. Do you think he'll come after me, like he told you he would? That was before, Skullduggery said. That was when everyone thought that you were going to be the Deathbringer. Now that we actually have one confirmed, 
All his attention will be focused on her. Lucky, lucky melancholia. You sure about this, though? I'm sure. Killing you won't help Lord Vile achieve his aim. Do you have any idea why he's so keen to stop the passage from happening? I don't, Skullduggery murmured. It must be important, though, to bring him back like this. I thought he was gone for good. Guess he just doesn't want to live in a perfect world. A van pulled up at the mouth of the lane. Sanctuary sorcerers got out, nodded to them as they began cordoning off the area. You don't think the problem here is us, do you? Valkyrie said. I mean, we're so used to being the ones who save the world that we can't see it when someone else is about to do the same. Solomon keeps saying that the passage is going to help people. True, Skullduggery said. But if you asked Serpine why he wanted to bring the faceless ones back, he'd have told you the same thing. It all depends on what people you're talking about helping. That's the wonderful thing about just about every religion on the planet. They're all so incredibly selfish. You're a cynical man, Mr. Pleasant. We live in cynical times, Miss Kane. He dropped her off at the pier and she watched him drive away before turning to the shadows. I know you're there, she said. He emerged, his footsteps silent. He was tall and slender, his hair black and his skin pale. He had died as a nineteen-year-old, and it was in this form that he was frozen. He would never grow old. He would never fade. His face would never lose its beauty. I've been waiting for you, Caelan said, his voice barely audible over the gentle lapping of the waves. Couldn't you found a safer place to wait? she asked, hooking her thumbs into her pockets. People like you really shouldn't be hanging around the waterfront, you know. If you swallow any sea spray, your throat's going to close up and you'll die. And would you be sad? Sure I would. I once lost a gerbil. I'd imagine the pain would be similar. He moved closer to her. So I'm your pet, am I? Of course. You're my vampire. He was right in front of her now, and he leaned in and they kissed. And are you my human? He whispered. So long as you're okay about sharing me, sure, she said. And they kissed again. His hand went to her face. I don't like sharing things. And I don't like being called a thing. But life isn't fair. You should be mine alone. She gave him a smile. Have you taken your serum tonight? Because you're sounding awfully territorial. He stepped back. The serum is not to be joked about. Without it, I would tear off my skin and devour you. Sounds tempting, doesn't it? But I can't tonight, dear... I'm on babysitting duty, which I'm actually quite looking forward to, and then it's bedtime. Then I will remain beside you while you sleep. Oh, my folks would love that, Valkyrie said with a chuckle. He didn't smile. You're not going to watch me sleep. I have made up my mind. She looked at him. Uh, what? I don't know what I'd do if something happened to you, Valkyrie. But you needn't worry. From this moment on, you are mine to protect. I'm a little stuck for words here, she said. I'm just trying to get my head around it. Trying to find the right way to... Okay, yeah, I have it now. Caelan, cop on to yourself. He blinked his beautiful eyes. I'm... I'm only doing this because I care so much. I'm here to protect you. You see? That's where the problem is stemming from. I don't need you to protect me. I'm not saying I don't need protection. My God, the amount of trouble I get into, I could use all the help I can get. But my protection comes from people like Skullduggery and Ghastly and China. You know, people who are powerful enough to protect me from the things I can't protect myself from. You think I'm weak? I think you're grand. And I acknowledge the fact that you're a vampire. That's very impressive. But let's face it, your real power kicks in when you turn and 
Unfortunately, when you turn, you tend to forget who's a friend and who's a foe, so that's not a whole lot of use to any of us. I would never hurt you. Oh, that's sweet, but really, you'd never get that chance. Caelan, you're not my protector. You're not my guardian angel, and you're not my boyfriend. His perfect jaw tightened. But I love you. Here we go. When will you admit that you're in love with me too? I swear, talking to you is like talking to a really good-looking and mildly stupid brick wall. Look, I like you, okay? I do. I know I shouldn't. I know it's a cliché to fall for the bad boy. Caelan frowned. I'm a bad boy? But it happened, she continued, ignoring him. And that's it. I think you're cute. You could probably ease up on the brooding and self-loathing, though. That stopped being attractive a while ago. But I mean, on the whole, I like you. And you like me. I love you. Yeah, well, you make my heart want to beat. That's nice and creepy, but I'm with Fletcher. You've been with him for a while now. It doesn't stop you coming to me. Yeah, and that makes me feel so much better about it all. I'm cheating on my boyfriend who's really nice and sweet and hot, and I'm cheating on him because, let's face it, I'm really not a good person. I'm a cheating girlfriend. Then never see him again and your conscience will be clear, he said, taking her hand in his. She frowned at him. But I want to see him again. If you wanted him, you wouldn't be with me. It is possible to want more than one person at the same time, you know. I only want you. And you really should get out more. Valkyrie disentangled herself from him. Also, all these proclamations of your undying love for me are getting kind of... It's a bit much, to be honest. Just hold back a little. But my love for you is eternal. That's exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. I need you. I need to be around you. I'm dead, Valkyrie. I'm dead, but when you're here, I feel alive. Memories are stirred of a pulse, of breath in my lungs, of life in my heart. The more I'm with you, the more I need. My passion burns. She made a face. I don't need to know about your burning passion. It burns for you, Valkyrie. I'm on fire. My mind is in flames. Couldn't we just be each other's bit on the side? You love me. I see it in your eyes. I think you're mistaking confusion for love. I love you with everything that is me. Remember when you were the strong, silent type? Could we go back to that? It's too late to go back. You've reawakened the old Caelan. Because of you, I remember who I used to be. Because of you, I can push the monster down. And that is very much appreciated. Before you, my life was in darkness. It was hollow and empty and cold. But you shone a light through the darkness. You led me home. Yeah, I'm great. Could we stop talking now? But I want to talk. I want to talk forever. I think you are. You, Valkyrie, are my sweet agony. She held up a hand. Okay, I'm really going to have to stop you there. You say one more thing that sounds like it's ripped from the pages of a really bad gothic romance and I'm out of here. Will be clear? You'll have talked yourself out of ten minutes with me. Is that what you want? Caelan shook his head. Good doggy. And never call me your sweet agony ever again. Chapter 11 Alone at Last Melancholia listened patiently while the woman explained what all the charts meant. Two other necromancers stood by the door and Cleric Craven hovered nearby, as was his new habit. He seemed reluctant to let Melancholia out of his sight for more than a few minutes at a time. The good news, the woman said, is that we've established a pattern. If our calculations are correct, you should start to feel strong again sometime in the next twenty minutes, and this strength should stay with you for anywhere between three and four hours. The woman had an annoying tendency to wait for some indication that Melancholia had heard and understood, so Melancholia gave her a nod. Four hours, she echoed. 
You may experience some dizziness and some fatigue during those four hours, and if you do, don't worry about it. It should pass within moments. The woman's name was Adriana Shade. She was powerful and intelligent, and had risen quickly through the necromancer ranks. There had been rumours that she was to be made a cleric, a virtually unheard of promotion for one so young. Melancholia used to admire her, but that was before Craven's experiment, before the surge. Now Adriana Shade meant nothing to her. Melancholia glanced around the room. None of these people meant anything to her. But in four hours' time, Shade continued, you'll grow weak again, very weak. We'll have ivy drips and oxygen standing by in case you sink to dangerous levels. Whatever happens, we'll be ready for it. Melancholia doubted that very much, but she smiled and thanked her nonetheless, and Shade put away her charts and instruments and left the chamber. Clary Craven, Melancholia said. Is it okay for me to be alone for the next few hours? He frowned. We need to conduct more tests, Melancholia. But this is a lot to take in, and I think it would really help me if I had the night to myself. I'll submit to all the tests in the morning, I promise. Craven sighed irritably. He had a tendency to get irritated very easily. Yes, very well. The night, then. Tomorrow, tests. Thank you, cleric, Melancholia said, and bowed her head. She knew Craven responded well to things like that. The cleric walked from the room, ushering the guards out before him. The door closed, and Melancholia allowed herself a smile. Twenty minutes, and she'd feel that power again. Twenty minutes, and she could have herself a little fun. Chapter 12 Bump in the Night Alice woke at a little before midnight, and Valkyrie muted the TV before scooping her out of her bed. Her parents were out, using the christening as an opportunity to continue the celebrations in a nearby pub. Valkyrie didn't mind. It had been a long day, and all she wanted to do was relax at home with her little sister. Hello, Valkyrie said. You're awake, then? Did you have a good sleep? Are you rested? The baby looked at her and said nothing. Valkyrie took one of the bottles from the side table, teased it down to Alice's mouth until she started feeding. Her phone rang. It was Fletcher. Are your folks still out? Yep. Me and the kid are downstairs. Want to come over? Be right there, he said, and hung up. She looked at Alice. Your sister is a bad person, she whispered. Two-timing is not an admirable quality in anyone. Fletcher appeared beside her. He peered at the baby. Can it do any tricks yet? He asked. I'm still working on it. Want to hold her? God, no, Fletcher said, laughing. I'd drop it. It's not an it. It's my sister. Go on, hold her. You won't make a mess of it, I swear. Only an idiot could drop a baby. You always say I am an idiot. But you're a special kind of idiot. Here. She passed Alice into his arms, and he stood there, rigid, a look of intense concentration on his face. I've got to support the head, right? He asked. And the rest of the body, obviously, but mostly the head? The head's the important bit. Am I doing it right? You're doing fine. Do you think it likes me? Honestly, I think she has more taste than that. The baby's like me. She tolerates you. She gave him the bottle, waited until Alice was feeding again, then stepped back. Want a cup of coffee? I'd better not. I'm holding a baby. Suit yourself. Valkyrie went to the kitchen dumped a spoonful of coffee into a mug while she waited for the water to boil. She looked up at the window, tried to peer through the blackness on the other side, but all she could see was her own face staring back at her. Fletcher walked in on stiff legs. Haven't dropped it yet. You're a natural, Valkyrie said. 
smiling and turning away from the window. Do you think so? Oh, yeah. All you need is to wipe that petrified look off your face, and you'll be inundated with babysitting jobs. In that case, I think I'll keep this petrified look, thank you very much. She poured the boiling water into the mug and gave it a few quick stirs. But just as she was about to take a sip, they heard a noise coming from upstairs. They froze. Fletcher looked at her. I thought we were alone, he said softly. We were, Valkyrie replied. She put down the mug. Stay here. Fletcher shook his head, holding Alice out to her. You stay here. I can teleport up and back again before whoever it is even blinks. It's my house. I'm in charge. I'm going up. If it's trouble, take the baby to the twins, then get back here immediately and help. Valkyrie, for God's sake, we're not arguing about this. She walked past him, out of the kitchen and into the hall. The lights were on upstairs. It was brightly lit and warm and welcoming. She climbed the stairs. Shadows curled around her right hand. Another sound coming from her room. The first thought that entered her mind was that Tanith had lied when she'd said she'd leave Valkyrie's family alone. Valkyrie hesitated, then shouldered the door open and barged in. The reflection turned to her. Relief flooded through Valkyrie's veins, followed by puzzlement and then anger. What are you doing out? I'm sorry, the reflection said. You're out of the mirror. How the hell are you out of the mirror? You didn't put me back in. Yes, I did. No, you didn't. You told me to get into the mirror, but you didn't touch the glass. Valkyrie frowned. I did. I did touch it. The reflection shook its head. You must have forgotten. I didn't forget, for God's sake. It was two hours ago. I climbed through the window, you got in the mirror, I touched the glass and absorbed your memories. I remember everything you did today. Now it was the reflection's turn to frown, a perfect simulation of a puzzled expression. I'm afraid you're mistaken. Oh, for God's sake, I let you out of the mirror this morning. You went downstairs and Alice was crying. That was yesterday. Valkyrie stopped. What? You're remembering yesterday. Alice was fine this morning. You came back two hours ago. I got in the mirror, but you left the room before you touched the glass, that's all. You just forgot. But I remember touching the... Do you? Do you actually remember? Or do you just assume you did it because it's what you always do? Downstairs, the baby started crying. She probably needs her bottle, the reflection said and walked past Valkyrie out of the room. Valkyrie watched it go, still frowning. She looked at the mirror, piecing together the events of the last two hours. She'd climbed through the window, and the reflection had been doing their homework for school the next day. Valkyrie had told it to step into the mirror, and she changed her clothes, fixed her hair, and... and... She was sure that she'd touched the mirror. She was sure that the reflection's memories had flooded her mind. She was almost certain of it. It was possible, of course it was, that she was getting mixed up. It was an easy mistake to make, after all. It was like locking the front door before bed, then lying in bed minutes later and wondering if you'd actually locked the door or you'd just thought about it. Valkyrie went downstairs Keeping track of two sets of memories had been tricky at first, but she was an expert at it by now. Two parallel tracks of experiences happening at the same time, sometimes even in the same space. It had taken the longest time to get used to sorting through conversations that she'd had with herself. Viewing a conversation from both sides had been brain-meltingly unsettling. And even though there were some flaws in the process, some gaps in the reflection's memories that she couldn't access, she had always felt that she had a handle on it all, until just now. Valkyrie walked into the living room. The reflection had Alice in its arms, and it was smiling gently as the baby guzzled from the bottle. Fletcher stood nearby. Sorry, he said. She kept batting the bottle away and then started crying. Don't worry about it, Valkyrie said, keeping her eyes on the reflection. 
So, you've been in the mirror for the past few hours? Yes, the reflection said. And then what? You got bored? Decided to go for a walk? I don't get bored. There was homework that needed to be finished. I finished it. Right. But, see, I'm sure I touched that mirror. You didn't. I'm sorry if I startled you. Fletcher, could you hand me a tissue? Fletcher snagged a tissue from the box on the mantelpiece and gave it to the reflection. The reflection used it to wipe milk from the baby's chin and then went back to feeding. You can continue your conversation if you like. Forget I'm even here. Fletcher started grinning, and Valkyrie turned her frown on him. What's so amusing? Nothing, he said. Nothing? Well, okay. I was just thinking, and don't get mad, because this is just a thought that entered my head. So it's not my fault, it's the thought's fault. But if you found me with your reflection one day, would that technically be cheating? Valkyrie's frown turned to a glare, and Fletcher backed away, laughing. It was a thought! It was a question I had to ask. I mean, come on! You've thought about it yourself, haven't you? No, she said coldly. I haven't. Yes, she has, the reflection said, and Fletcher burst out laughing. The reflection laughed along with him. I knew it, Fletcher cried. I knew it! Valkyrie narrowed her eyes. What are you doing? The reflection smiled at her. I'm simulating appropriate human responses. Fletcher found the truth amusing, and I joined him in laughing at your embarrassment. I'm not embarrassed. Yes, you are. It's fine, Fletcher said. Forget I ever said anything. I have the real Valkyrie anyway. Why would I ever need a substitute? Fletcher went to wrap an arm around Valkyrie, but she moved away from him, keeping her eyes on the reflection. Give me my sister. The reflection walked over, did as Valkyrie ordered. Now go upstairs, get into the mirror, stay there. Of course, the reflection said, and its gaze dropped to the baby for a split second. As it walked out, it smiled at Fletcher. Good night, it said. Fletcher waved, then frowned. Good night, he said, unsure. They listened to it climb the stairs. He's never done that before. He's never said good night. What the hell were you doing? You were encouraging it. You were playing with it. I was just having a laugh. And it was having a laugh too. It was laughing at me. You don't find anything about that slightly weird? It's not supposed to do that. Well, I don't know. It's not supposed to do a lot of things, is it? The programming is a little off. There's a malfunction somewhere. So what? It does its job. It imitates you to perfection. And it got Alice to stop crying the moment it took her. So it acts weird every now and then. So you forget to touch the glass every once in a while. So what? It's not the end of the world. And you've got other things to worry about. Like the end of the world? Valkyrie sighed. Yeah, maybe. Here. We have an evening to ourselves. An ordinary, average evening where we can be a normal boyfriend and girlfriend, babysitting and snuggling on the couch. I can pop over to Milan for a pizza from that great place under the arch. I can get that ice cream you love from that place in San Francisco. It'll be a nice, quiet night in. That sound good to you? Yeah. Yeah, it sounds nice. I'm starving, actually. Get the pizza. And the ice cream? And the ice cream. He smiled and vanished. Valkyrie laid Alice in her cot, made sure she was comfortable, and went upstairs to her bedroom. The reflection was in the mirror. Valkyrie tapped the glass firmly, and the memories transferred as the girl in the mirror changed to reflect her own image. The memories settled as she stood there. The reflection had been right. She had simply forgotten to touch the glass earlier on. She saw herself change her clothes, fix her hair, and then just walk out of the room. She replayed the memory again, 
while it was still fresh in her mind, before the details faded and it was just another mix of sensations. She watched herself change her clothes, fix her hair, and... She was sure she had approached the mirror. She was sure she had touched the glass. But the reflection's memory made it clear that she had just turned and walked out. She hadn't even glanced at the mirror. That was that. Mystery solved. She'd made a mistake, and that's all there was to it. The reflection had kept things from her before. There had been gaps, moments that were missing. There was nothing missing here, though. There was no sign of tampering. Nothing obvious, anyway. Unless the reflection had discovered a new way of editing its memories, a new way to seamlessly cover over the gaps, then it had been telling the truth. Valkyrie tapped the glass again. It looks like I owe you an apology. The reflection leaned forward till its head passed through the mirror. No need. I am incapable of being offended. Valkyrie frowned. Yeah. Yeah, I knew that. I, I know that. Then why did you apologize? I'm not sure. Do you want me to finish your homework? Yeah. Good. You do that. The reflection nodded, stepped out of the mirror and sat at the desk. Unsettled, with no clear reason why, Valkyrie went back downstairs. Halfway down, someone knocked on the front door. Valkyrie crossed the hall, opened the door, looked out into darkness. Melancholia stood where the garden path met the pavement. Her hood was down, the breeze playing with her hair, a smile playing on her lips. Hello, Valkyrie, she said, then held her arms out to either side and said, Surprise! Chapter 13 Shadow Knives Valkyrie felt something cold twist in her gut. What are you doing here? she asked, her voice brittle and sharp. This is my home. I know it is, Melancholy answered. I've heard Cleric Wreath mention the pier in Haggard so many times that it was really no trouble finding you. So this is where you lived then? How mundane. Melancholia smiled as she approached. The hem of her robes flowed over the ground like a river of shadows. What's wrong? Nothing to say? You usually have lots to say. Are you feeling all right? Are you sick? Are you ill? You don't look ill. Are you putting a brave face on it? You have nothing to prove to me, you know. I respect you for who you are. And who are you again? Oh, yes, that's right. Absolutely nobody. Whatever you want, Valkyrie said, struggling to keep her anger down. It can wait, okay? My baby sister's inside. Melancholia's smile grew wider, and now Valkyrie could see the multitude of symbols that scarred her face. You have a sister? I didn't know that. Do you think she'll grow up to be as ordinary as you, perhaps? How does it feel to suddenly go from being the saviour of the world back to being some insignificant little schoolgirl? I'm not going to tell you again. Get away from my house! You do not order me around, little schoolgirl. I am the death bringer, and you'll always be a silly little child playing grown-up games. I used to be like you, in a way. I used to be scared. I didn't understand what was going on. But then this happened, and all this power came to me, and it all became so, so clear. Valkyrie shook her head. What did Craven do to you? What did he do? He did nothing. He released the power I had inside. No, he changed you. Look at yourself, for God's sake. Cleric Craven recognized my potential. He tortured you. You don't know what you're talking about. Nor would I expect you to. It's funny. 
seeing you stand there all scared. I'm used to seeing you in your special black clothes that protect you from harm, always with a smirk on your face. You're not smirking, Valkyrie. I distinctly remember a smirk when you told me that I would have to start worshipping you. Isn't that what you said? But you're not the Deathbringer. You don't get to save the world. I do. And so you should really start worshipping me. Leave, Valkyrie snarled, then stepped back inside the house, slamming the door. She turned as the shadows in the hallway lengthened and met in the middle of the floor, swirling, thickening, growing. Melancholia emerged from the maelstrom. My power is practically limitless, Melancholia said softly. I described the sensation to you, but words would not be sufficient. To understand what it's like to be a god, you really have to be a god like me. Get out of my house. I could destroy you and no one would be able to do anything about it. I would tear you from your family. Your friends would be powerless to stop me. The skeleton detective? I'd make him watch. Valkyrie said nothing. What's this? No come back at all? Silence? I'm starting to think you are scared of me. I bet your heart is beating much, much faster, isn't it? I bet your mouth is dry. What do you want? I want you to admit that you're scared of me. And then you leave? Fine. I admit it. I'm scared of you. I'm terrified of you. Now leave. Melancholia smiled. I don't think you're being genuine. Maybe if I say hello to your little sister, maybe then you'd show some genuine fear. Take one step and I swear I'll kill you. Melancholia laughed. Valkyrie heard the back door open and saw Kaelin blurring towards them, fangs bared. But the shadows were already curling around her and suddenly Melancholia was taking her shadow walking. Valkyrie cursed. The shadows went away and she went stumbling to the grass. She looked up to the Martello Tower beside her. They were on the cliffs overlooking the beach. But that was impossible. Shadow walking was strictly short-range teleportation. No other necromancer could shadow walk this far, Melancholia murmured, obviously thinking the same thing. She looked back to the twinkling lights of the town. How far was that? A kilometre? Two? At least they weren't in the house anymore, or anywhere near Alice. Valkyrie got to her feet, and Melancholia remembered she was there. A vampire, she said. In your house? Was it coming for me or for you? I don't suppose it matters. Unless it's feasting on your little sister as we speak. Now that would be amusing. Why are you here? Valkyrie asked. Why are you out and alone? Lord Vile is still on the loose in case you've forgotten. Melancholia sighed. Lord Vile is overrated. Cleric Craven told me he's really not as powerful as all the stories say. Craven? You'd put your trust in Craven? At least he isn't running scared like your skeleton friend. He has faith. He knows that if Vile does show up, and I doubt he will, it won't be a fair fight. I'll crush that armor of his with him still inside. What's left of him will ooze out of the eye holes in his mask. And you came all this way to tell me that. I came all this way to tell you that when I save the world... I'm not going to be saving you. You're not on my list. I'll get by fine without you. Don't worry about it. Melancholia laughed. You're so tough, aren't you, with all your fighting moves and your elemental magic and your dainty little ring. I don't need an object in which to store my necromancy. My power is stored inside me. I am my own weapon. Is there a point to any of this? Yes, actually, there is. You're not on my list. A fist of shadows crunched into Valkyrie's chest 
and lifted her off her feet. And if you're not on my list, Melancholia continued breezily, then you don't get saved. Valkyrie struggled to get to her hands and knees. The shot had knocked the wind out of her. Seriously? she managed to say. We're going to fight? Who said anything about fighting? Melancholia asked. I'm going to slash you to ribbons and you're going to take it. I'd hardly call that a fight. Melancholia frowned, almost to herself. And for a moment she seemed to sway, like she was going to collapse. She suddenly looked drained. She looked exhausted. Valkyrie stood slowly, warily, looking out for the trap. A moan drifted from Melancholia's lips, and Valkyrie realized it wasn't an act. Melancholia really was hurting. And then, just as suddenly as the weakness had hit, it left her, and Melancholia straightened up. The darkness turned sharp and whipped across Valkyrie's right arm. Blood sprang into the air and she cried out. Melancholia raised an eyebrow and something sliced Valkyrie's back, opening up her skin as easily as it opened her T-shirt. Valkyrie stumbled, cursed, raised her hand, but the shadows wrapped around her wrist. They tightened and she screamed, the shadows cutting into her flesh like piano wire. The ring flew from her finger into Melancholia's hand. A gaudy trinket, Melancholia said, examining it, containing an insignificant amount of power. Cleric Wreath had faith in you on the basis of this? How disappointing! Valkyrie pretended to stagger, closing the distance between them, and then she lunged. But Melancholia twisted the darkness into a claw that ripped into her belly. Valkyrie doubled over, gasping at the white-hot pain. Another claw slashed her face. She spun, fell, blood running down her cheek. Her face was ruined, cut open like a freshly ploughed field. Shadows snagged her wrists and ankles, holding her in midair, her body locked tight. Oh, the little jibes, Melancholia said. Oh, the little taunts. Knives of darkness cut into Valkyrie's skin and she screamed. Don't worry. Melancholia said. I'm not going to kill you. I'm just going to cut you all over. When I'm done, there won't be an inch of you that doesn't have any mark in it. And even if you get a doctor and they heal you right up and make all the scars disappear, you'll know that some scars are deeper than that. You'll know they're there, and every moment of every day you will regret all those little jibes and taunts, providing you don't bleed to death while I'm having my fun. Don't, Valkyrie said. Blood dripped from her torn lips. Are you begging? Is the mighty and fearless Valkyrie Kane begging me for mercy? Don't, was all Valkyrie could manage. Melancholia sent the shadow knives upwards, and they cut through Valkyrie's T-shirt, making furrows in her flesh, changing the pitch of her screams. Chapter 14 The Call Valkyrie awoke, lying face down on the grass. She turned her head slightly, tried to blink, but her eyelids were slashed. There were objects in front of her. It took her a while to register what they were. Her phone and her ring. She moved a hand. It wasn't easy. Some of her muscles had been severed. With trembling, blood-caked fingers, she speed-dialed a number. Hey, Fletcher said when he answered. They've got the pizza almost ready. Smells delicious. Fletcher, she said softly. Help. Chapter 15 The Doctor is In Ghastly braked beside the Bentley and jumped out of his van, hurrying up to Skullduggery as he stalked through the sanctuary doors. I just heard, he said. 
Any idea what happened? None, said Skullduggery, not slowing down. She called Fletcher, said she was on the cliffs. She lost consciousness as soon as he arrived. Sanctuary officials dodged out of their way, flattening themselves against the corridor walls. She'll be okay, Ghastly told his friend. We have a new doctor. Apparently he's brilliant on a level with Ken Speckle Grouse. Mother Mist brought him in. Latcher said she's cut deep. Ken Speckle would take care not to leave scars. I'm sure he'll be fine. Fletcher paced outside the operating theatre. His head snapped up when he saw them. She's still in there, he said. He was pale. His voice shook. Skullduggery barged through the doors. Ghastly and Fletcher behind him. Ghastly froze. Valkyrie lay on the table, eyes closed, covered in a blood-drenched surgical sheet. Above her stooped a creature dressed in a smock with arms and legs longer than Ghastly's whole body. Its eyes were small and yellow, the lids punctured with black thread where they had once been sewn shut. Its mouth had received similar treatment, and its nose had been cut off. There was a scab there now that refused to fully heal. What the hell is going on? Skullduggery snarled, his gun suddenly in his hand. Kill me if you must. Dr. Nye said in its high voice. But if you do, your friend will bleed to death. Make up your mind. I have a lot on my plate tonight. What's wrong? asked Fletcher. Who is that? Step away from her, Ghastly commanded. We'll get another doctor in here. Another doctor would not be able to save her life, Nye responded, sounding bored. These are wounds inflicted with abandon. No method, no design, no finesse. But they are severe and they are many, and organs have been sliced and arteries nicked. I have completed my examination and I know exactly how to proceed. If you call in another doctor, they would need to start over. By that time, she would be dead. You can save her? Skullduggery asked. Undoubtedly. And if I am allowed to get back to work immediately, there won't even be any scarring. Skullduggery looked at Ghastly, then nodded. Get back to work, Doctor, Ghastly said. Skullduggery, I'm sure you'll want to stay, to make sure he behaves. I'm not going anywhere, Skullduggery said. He didn't put his gun away. Me neither, said Fletcher. Ghastly left, anger quickening his step. He found Madame Mist in her chambers. Nye, he said, barging in. You have Dr. Nye working in here? Are you out of your mind? Nye is a monster! Mist observed him from behind her veil. Just because the doctor is a being without specification does not make it a monster. Without specification? You mean because it isn't male or female? You mean because it isn't strictly human? No, that's not what I'm talking about. It's a monster because it conducts medical experiments on its captives. That's all in the past. Nye is a war criminal. Who has been punished for the crimes it committed. Elder Bespoke, I was tasked with equipping this sanctuary with the very best medical staff available. Ken Speckle Grouse is dead. Dr. Nye was next on the list. And you didn't think to run it by us first? You didn't think we'd object? When you say we, are you referring also to the Grand Mage? Because I did confer with him, and he agreed that this facility would benefit from Nye's expertise. Ghastly frowned. Ravel agreed to this? Yes. If you have a problem, maybe you should take it up with him. Yeah, Ghastly said. Maybe I should. Ghastly walked the corridors, his pace slower now. Ravel was like him. He was a soldier. He'd fought in the war. 
fought against Mevolent, and he'd had friends who were captured. They'd all heard the stories about the torture and the sick experiments. They'd all heard of the doctor with the long arms and legs and the scabrous nose. Everyone had heard of Dr. Nye. Ghastly, Ravel said, looking up from his desk. Is Valkyrie okay? She's hurt, Ghastly replied. But she should pull through. She's in the medical bay now. That's what I wanted to talk to you about. Ah, Ravel said, sitting back. It was three in the morning and he was looking tired. Nay. Oh, could you agree to this? That thing killed some of our best friends. Sorcerers live a long time, Ghastly. How long are we going to hold grudges for things we did in wartime? Fighting on the battlefield is one thing. Torturing prisoners to death is quite another. Do you know what Nye has been doing for the past hundred years? It's been working alone, secluded, cut off, doing research on the human soul. It wants to torture that too? No, it wants to find it. Ghastly, can you imagine what that could mean? The soul is our essence. It's the strongest, most pure part of ourselves. The link between the soul and our true names has been discussed but never proven. But think what we could achieve if we harnessed that power. Think what we could become if we allowed ourselves to be the best we could possibly be. Erskine, all due respect, but what on earth are you talking about? If Nye did find the soul, what would it do then? Poke it? With what? It's a soul, not a plate of jelly. The soul should be left where it is. It causes enough problems without us adding to them. Angry souls can become ghosts. Powerful souls can become gists. And evil souls can become remnants. It's a dark and dangerous business. And we should leave it alone. We didn't recruit Nye so he could find the soul, Ghastly. I'm just telling you what he's been doing for the past century. He hasn't been hurting anyone. He hasn't been torturing anyone. He has repented. I find that very hard to believe. He's the best there is, dammit. And you know it. Do you think I like having him here? He's creepy as hell, and if you think I don't remember the things he did to our friends, you're nuts. But with Ken Speckle gone, with Vile on the loose, and with Darkest coming our way, we need to put our issues aside and surround ourselves with the best people for the job. Even if that includes a known sadist and murderer? Ravel closed his eyes and sat back in his chair. I didn't think it would be like this. I really didn't. I thought every decision I'd have to make would be how many operatives to send on a rescue mission. I don't know how meritorious did it. He opened his eyes. Is Valkyrie conscious? No! It's probably a good thing. Do we know what happened to her? Who did this? I don't need Skullduggery skills to recognise necromancy when I see it. Speaking of Skullduggery, Ravel said slowly, does he need to be contained? Contained? Don't play innocent. You know what he's like. Once she wakes up, he'll be going after every necromancer in the country. Maybe we should let him. We're in charge now, Ghastly. We don't have that luxury. This has to be done right. Leave it with me. I'll make sure he understands. And listen, Ravel said. I know this goes against every fibre in your body. But Dr. Nye is the best man, woman, whatever for the job. It will save Valkyrie's life. Yeah, I know. It's just... Things got complicated around here awfully fast, didn't they? Yes, they did. But we're in charge now, my friend. We've got to be the ones to make the hard decisions. It's inevitable that people are going to start hating us sooner or later. You can form a queue behind me, then. Ravel smiled sadly. Yeah. Let me know when she regains consciousness, OK? Oh, any news on Tanith? Ghastly hesitated. She was in Berlin last week, with Sanguine. They almost got her, but no, no real news. You'll find her. 
Yeah, Ghastly said, and left. He went back to talk to Madame Mist, who had a surprisingly good grasp of sanctuary law and procedures. Once he had been sufficiently briefed, he walked back to the medical ward. Skullduggery was sitting outside the operating theatre, his head down, his hat on the chair beside him. His skull gleamed under the light. He looked up as Ghastly approached. Nye predicts a full recovery, Skullduggery said, his velvet voice sounding disturbingly hollow. She'll wake in an hour or two. There's a nurse in there with her now. Where's Fletcher? I sent him home. He seemed traumatized. Seeing your girlfriend slashed to ribbons will probably do that too, Ghastly said. And how are you? Meaning? She was almost killed. I am aware. You're waiting to see if I'll get angry. I already know you're angry. You're sitting very still and you're talking very quietly. You're getting ready to kill someone. I just need a name. You know the name. The necromancer did that to Valkyrie, and there's only one out there who'd be motivated enough to do it. Skullduggery's head tilted. You're going to tell me that I can't go after her? Not at all. I'm telling you that if you do go after her, she'll kill you. She's the Deathbringer. Skullduggery picked up his hat and stood. I'll take my chances. No, you won't said Ghastly, standing in front of him. You think your brief encounter with Vile five months ago has prepared you? That was nothing. I went up against him during the war. I saw him slaughter dozens of sorcerers, including my mother, a woman you remember who had proved herself to be very hard to kill. He killed her with barely a wave of his hand. Skullduggery was silent for a moment. Melancholia is not Lord Vile. If she's the Deathbringer, their power levels would be similar. Skullduggery, you know as well as I do, if Melancholia had wanted to kill Valkyrie, Valkyrie would be dead. But she didn't. She just wanted to inflict some pain. And she won't get away with it. I've spoken with Erskine and Mist, and they agree. An attack on one Sanctuary agent is an attack on the Sanctuary as a whole. Melancholia has just handed us the excuse we needed to take that temple apart. Then give me an army, and I'll take it apart and drag her out. We have to do this right. Before we go in, we issue a warrant for her arrest. She's not going to give herself up, Skullduggery said. No, but we have to give her the chance. Maybe High Priest Tenebrae will see it as an opportunity to bring his order in from the cold. Maybe he'll cooperate. I doubt it. I doubt it too. So if she doesn't turn herself in within twenty-four hours, then yes, we go after her. And you'll get all the backup you need. If Melancholia resists? Ghastly looked at him. Then you do what needs to be done. Chapter 16 Full Recovery Dr. Nye had a smile like splitting skin. Welcome back, it said, to the land of the living. Valkyrie jerked against the restraints tying her to the bed. Nye waved its hand. Do not exert yourself. You're still quite weak. The restraints, I assure you, are for your own good. Where am I? she snapped. In the sanctuary. You are quite safe. The woman who did this to you is long gone. It's not her I'm worried about. Nye chuckled. Oh, of course. You remember our little encounter. But that's all in the past, is it not? Any indiscretions I may have perpetrated against you I have made up for, yes? I replaced your organs, sewed you back together, and you walk from my facility as a living, breathing person once again. Forgive and forget. You tried to dissect me. I did 
dissect you. I just didn't dissect you enough. Let me out of here. I am worried that you may injure yourself. Let me out of here, or I swear to God. What do you swear? Do you swear to tell the elders about me? About what I did? But then, of course, you would have to explain to them why you had come to me. You would have to explain that you had discovered your true name, and you wanted it sealed so that no one could control you against your will. There's nothing wrong with what I did. You were talking, you know. As I dissected you, you were talking to yourself, muttering. I believe at times, hallucinating. You said a name. When you said it, it meant nothing to me. Why should it? I was leading a secluded existence. But after you'd gone, I heard that name again. Darkus, the one who kills us all. Valkyrie stopped struggling. I don't know what you have to do with Darkus. But if you tell the elders about the extent of the experiments I was conducting, I shall be forced to tell them that you are involved in this somehow, and I am sure they'd start asking all sorts of awkward questions. Nye smiled again, and suddenly hurtled backwards, knocking over a tray of instruments. Valkyrie turned her head and saw Skullduggery and Ghastly marching in. Skullduggery had his hand splayed, using the air to pin Nye against the wall. He glanced at her as he passed, his eye sockets moving fractionally in her direction, and then he continued towards Nye as Ghastly undid the restraints around Valkyrie's wrists. Nye grunted, its frail body struggling uselessly like a daddy longlegs trapped in a web. With his other hand, Skullduggery took out his gun, pressed it against Nye's forehead. Nye stopped struggling. Skullduggery! Ghastly said, alarmed. What are you doing? I told myself if I ever got the chance to end this miserable excuse for a life, I wouldn't hesitate. Now that I have no more use for it... Don't, Skullduggery! Do not pull that trigger! What Nye did during the war was unforgivable, but we have other concerns now. Skullduggery's voice was cold. I don't care what he did during the war. I'm thinking about something much more recent. Ghastly approached, walking slowly. What are you talking about? Dr. Nye has been locked away in its laboratory for the last hundred years. Skullduggery looked back at him, but didn't say anything. There was nothing to say. Nye was right. Any accusations on their part would raise questions about Valkyrie, and that was a truth they weren't prepared to share with anyone. Skullduggery, Valkyrie said, holding the surgical sheet around her as she slid off the bed. It's okay. Nye fixed me. I'm okay. For a moment, she doubted her words would be enough. But then Skullduggery lowered the gun and stopped pressing against the air. Nye stood, towering above them all, outrage showing on its face. This, this is deplorable. Madam Mist personally granted me amnesty for past misdeeds, and she assured me that I would not be held accountable for merely following orders. Elder Bespoke, I hope you will discipline Detective Pleasant for his unacceptable actions. Shut up, Nye, Ghastly said. I'm this close to putting a bullet in you myself. Where's your assistant? He was supposed to stay with Valkyrie at all times. The man was an imbecile. I replied stiffly. I told him to go away and never let me see him again. If I had known it was so important to you, I would have had him stay. It's not important to me, Doctor, Ghastly said. It's essential. It's essential both for my peace of mind and for your well-being that you have an assistant with you at all times. You are not to be left alone with any patient. Do you understand me? Do you understand those orders? Yes, Nye said. Of course. On the drive to Skullduggery's house, Valkyrie took off the black ring and examined it thoughtfully. Want me to open the window so you can throw it out? 
Skullduggery asked. She smiled. No, but thanks for offering. Melancholia took this off me, you know. Just whipped it off my finger and bam! I had no necromancer magic to call on. Skullduggery nodded. That's the problem with necromancy. It's powerful magic, absolutely it is. But it's so unstable it needs to be housed in something to make sure it can be controlled. Power that unstable? It's a terrifying prospect. If one were in the habit of being terrified. Is necromancy the only discipline that has to do that? Not the only one, but the main one. There are very few others. It's called inhabiting. Dalgary nodded. Solomon told me about it. He said a perfect example was Lord Vile's armour. When Baron Vengeus wore it, it still had all of Vile's power. Maybe that's what's happening now. Maybe Vile isn't back. Maybe someone is just wearing his armour and using his magic and pretending to be him. I don't think so, Skullduggery said. He spoke to me. It was him. It's impossible, but it was him. She put the ring back on. Have you found any trace of him since? He turned his head slightly. How do you know I've been looking? Little things, she said. You've been taking more of an interest in odd little crimes that don't make any sense. You've been asking certain kinds of questions that aren't really relevant to whatever case we've been working on. You're trying to find someone. My, my, said Skullduggery. What dashing mentor has been teaching you to be a detective? Oh, that's right. It's me. Valkyrie laughed. So? Any trace? None, he said. He killed Tesseract. I hit him. He exploded in shadow and no one's seen him since. He might be dead, she said hopefully. I don't hit that hard, she shrugged. It might be his ghost. Actually, Skullduggery said, I've been thinking the same thing. What? Seriously? Yes, indeed. Look at what we've got. Armor that is brimming with power. All it needs, let's face it, is the will to get up and move around. All it needs is intent. So you think Vile's ghost found his old armor... And now it's living inside it. That's one possible explanation. His ghost, or... I don't know. So inside the armour would be like... nothing? Skullduggery hesitated. It's a theory. One of many. But right now it's the only one that fits. Then what was Vile doing at the sanctuary? Our beloved former Grand Mage Guild had the armor stored in boxes that were then shipped to Roarhaven. My fight with Tesseract must have disturbed it, or... He went quiet, and she frowned at him. Is there something about Vile, or about what he said to you, or... Is there something you're not telling me? Skullduggery laughed. Oh, Valkyrie, my loyal and trustworthy combat accessory. Of course there's something I'm not telling you. That's what makes me fun. Valkyrie stood in Skullduggery's hat room and looked at her hand. It wasn't shaking. She turned it, frowning, trying to spot a hidden tremble. Nothing. She knew this wasn't right. She'd been attacked and almost killed, endured pain and agony on a scale most people would never experience. And yet she didn't seem to be suffering from any psychological side effects whatsoever. She remembered the attack vividly. It was seared into her memory. She wasn't repressing anything, as far as she could tell. She wasn't numb. She wasn't traumatized. Then what was wrong with her? Why wasn't she in shock? Or maybe this was shock. No, she'd been in shock before. She knew the signs. This thing she was experiencing now was normality. Her body had been half ripped to shreds the previous night, and now she was fine with it. 
It was like there was something cool in her center, keeping the panic down, gently guiding her past the horror. She could almost hear the voice in her mind. Calm, it said. Keep calm. You're still alive, aren't you? She turned to the full-length mirror that Skullduggery kept in here, just so he could check the overall effect of whatever hat he was wearing. Hugely vain and narcissistic, but endearingly so. Her clothes, freshly washed, were so ripped and torn they barely stayed on. Valkyrie parted a long slash in her T-shirt and traced her finger along her side. Still alive. She leaned in and examined her face. The scars are almost gone, she said loudly. That's good, Skullduggery responded from the other room. So many hats in here. She took one, a black one, and tried it on. It looked pretty good on her, she had to admit. She liked the way it came down low over one eye. It gave her a rakish quality. Calm. She put the hat back on the stand and walked into the main living room. Skullduggery stood among the ruins of what had once been a sofa. Valkyrie raised an eyebrow. I was trying to make up the sofa bed so you could get some rest, he explained, and pointed to the second sofa across the room. Unfortunately, it would appear that that is the sofa bed, and this, apparently, is just a sofa. Not any more, it's not. Well, yes, now it's a dead sofa. It put up a valiant struggle, however. I'm sure its family would be proud. She wrapped herself in a blanket and collapsed into an armchair. I kill a sofa for you and you go and sit in a chair? Skullduggery asked. I don't think you appreciate the sacrifice that has been made for you. I don't need a bed right now. I just need to nap for a few hours. Then the scars will be completely gone and I can go home and collapse into my own bed. So you'll be okay here on your own? I'll be fine. Go off and issue that arrest warrant. But don't kill anyone. I want the chance to beat the hell out of Melancholia for what she did. But I don't want her dead. Not yet, anyway. You're going to be calm about this, aren't you? Exceedingly. You promise? I cross the place where my heart used to be and hope to be even more deader than I am now. Well, okay then. Valkyrie looked away for a moment. Why didn't Darkus come out? Sorry? She shrugged at him. Melancholia nearly killed me. I was kind of expecting Darkus to take over and, you know, relying on Darkus to save you would probably be a bad habit to get into, Skullduggery said. I know, she responded quickly. And I wasn't. But still, it would help if I knew the rules. Do I hulk out when I'm in danger? Or does it have to be like when the Jitter Girl actually had her fingers in my brain? Or... I don't know, Valkyrie. Maybe you subconsciously knew that Melancholia didn't actually intend to kill you. Maybe Darkus only emerges as a last resort in order to keep you alive. Or maybe it's a whim. I don't know. Valkyrie nodded. She weakened, you know. Skullduggery tilted his head. Melancholia? Right before she inflicted the serious damage, she weakened. She almost fainted, I think. There's something wrong with her. I didn't stand a chance when she got her strength back. But if I'd gone after her in that moment when she was weak, I could have batted her around the place. I know I could have. Interesting, Skullduggery said. What does it mean? Is it anything useful? I'm sure it is, he said. Get some rest, okay? And maybe you should call Fletcher. You've been through a traumatic experience. I'm used to them. I'm sure Fletcher's worried about you. Since when do you care if he's worried? I called him from the sanctuary, told him I'm fine. I'm fine, he's fine. You're the only one who's worried. I care too much, and that's always been my problem. Well, if you're absolutely positive you don't need company... And you don't need me to tell you a story before you go to sleep. Actually, she said, maybe a small one. 
Oh? Having little Alice around got me thinking. You never did tell me why you abandoned your family crest. His head tilted. Did I not? Are you sure? I'm sure I mentioned it. Possibly when we were fighting something huge and horrible. I think I shouted it to you. But you may have been too busy being thrown against a wall. Still, the important thing is that I told you. So let's cherish that moment and move on. Or you could just tell me again. Oh, Valkyrie, you know how much I hate repeating myself. Yet you've told me the story of how you saved that orphanage like a hundred times. That's because it's an exciting story with twists and turns and it paints me in an impressive light. So the story of why you abandoned your family crest paints you in a negative light? Essentially. Hey, if you really don't want to tell me, that's okay. I understand. Excellent. He walked towards the door. She frowned. So? He stopped. So what? So tell me. You said you understood. Don't you know anything? That was me lying. Whenever someone says you don't have to tell them, you have to tell them. That's a rule. It's how communication works. It seems to be a flawed system. Tell me why you abandoned your crest, and I'll tell you one of my secrets. You have no secrets. I've loads. You have none. Let's see. Your given name is Stephanie Edgley. Your true name is Darkus. And apparently you're destined to extinguish all life on the planet. Oh, and you're seeing a vampire behind your boyfriend's back. Valkyrie's eyes widened. You... you know about that, then? Of course I do. You're not mad? I think it's a huge mistake that will end extraordinarily badly. But if that's the only way you learn, so be it. I can't believe you're not mad. I comfort myself with the thought that I may have to kill Kalen at some stage. Oh. Then just tell me why you abandoned the crest, for God's sake. If ever I have a big secret from this moment on that I wouldn't normally tell you, I'll tell you. Deal? Skullduggery sighed, walked over to the remains of the sofa and sat on the arm. I abandoned my family crest because I hadn't lived up to the high standards as set by my parents and my brothers and sisters. You had brothers and sisters? Of course. What were their names? What does it matter? They're all dead now. I'm the only one left. The only one to carry that crest down through the years. They were good, honorable, decent people. When they were alive, the crest meant something. But you're good and honorable and decent, too. He took off his hat, brushed imaginary lint from the brim. Unfortunately, in war, you let some of those qualities slip. When I feel I have regained the right to reclaim that crest, I'll reclaim it. I don't know. I think you overreact. Do you now? I know people do terrible things in war, but I can't imagine you doing something so bad that it changes your opinion on who you are. You're being too hard on yourself. That's always been a flaw of mine. Were you the oldest? Second oldest. I had an older brother. Wow! The great Skullduggery Pleasant had a big brother. What was he like? Skullduggery's chin tilted to the right. He was bigger than me. Stronger than me. He liked to think he was smarter than me. He protected us, looked out for us. He was everything an older sibling should be. He was everything that you're going to be to your sister. I hope so. It's weird, isn't it? You meet someone and you become friends and you grow to love them. And that's the way it works. That's how things go. But then a baby is born and you don't have that long period of getting to know them, of figuring out if you like them as a person. You just love them. Like it's instant. You hold the baby in your arms, and you feel so much real, 
overwhelming love. Like you would do anything to protect it. Bam! Just like that. Your whole life is different. This baby, this little person that you don't even know, is now more important to you than anything else. It does come as quite a surprise, Skullduggery murmured and stood up. Oh, she said. Sorry, I was talking about a little sister, not not a child of your own. <sighs> I don't know what I'm talking about. Skullduggery shook his head. Nonsense. You described it perfectly. Pure, unconditional love. It's a wonderful thing. You'll experience it again when you have a child of your own. Whoa, said Valkyrie, jumping to her feet, the blanket falling around her. Whoa, stop right there. We're not even going to talk about that. We're not even going to mention the possibility. It unnerves you then? It freaks me out is what it does. I think I still have a few years left of, you know, playing the field before I find someone I want to settle down with. We're talking a few centuries, you know. So you're not planning on rushing into anything? Not if I can help it. Does Fletcher know this? She laughed. <laughs> He'd better. And Caelan? I make sure to tell him every time I see him. Skullduggery put his hat on. That's my girl. Chapter 17 The Zombie King and Co. Vurian Scapegrace, the Killer Supreme, the Zombie King, lay in a freezer, his legs curled up to his chest. He felt the freezer move slightly, and he muttered dark things under his breath. The refrigerated truck he'd been using as a mobile base had broken down, so he'd sent that idiot Thrasher to get another one. But Thrasher couldn't find a refrigerated truck. The only thing he could find that even remotely met Scapegrace's requirements was the Percy Penguin ice cream van. Thrasher had tried to convince Scapegrace, when faced with his wrath, that an ice cream van was ideal. It was innocent. It was unexpected. No one would ever imagine it housed a terrifying zombie. Scapegrace fumed. Innocent was not the same as discreet. His mobile base had a smiling plastic penguin on its roof, and it couldn't go faster than forty kilometres an hour. They couldn't even find a way to switch off that damn Popeye music that jingled and jangled on a constant loop. It was driving Scapegrace mad. What was worse, every time they stopped in traffic, he could hear people run up and tap on the window. They were moving through yet another small town. Scapegrace hated small towns. He felt the van slow, and heard the kids immediately swarm out onto the road, waving money and shouting their orders. Scapegrace stayed where he was, safe in the frosty confines of the freezer, trying to think of things that would soothe his impatience. He thought of tranquil lakes, of birds singing, of plucking out Thrasher's eyes, and eventually he reached a place within himself that had some degree of balance. He heard Thrasher's voice the one thing guaranteed to ruin the zen of even the most placid monk, and opened the freezer lid. He could hear people battering on the window above him. What did you say? he called out. I'm just wondering, Thrasher answered from the driver's seat, if maybe we should serve some ice cream. Why on earth would we want to do that? To be inconspicuous. They're all around us. If we gave them ice cream, they'd go away, and we won't arouse suspicion. Scapegrace struggled to control his temper. Tranquil lakes, birds singing, eye-plucking, calm. Thrasher, he called out. We have no ice cream. I'm in the freezer, Thrasher. Did you forget that? Well, what about the machine? The ice cream-making machine? Yes. Do you know how to work it? You just... You just put the cone under the nozzle and you pull the thing and the ice cream swirls out and you stick a chocolate flake in it. It's that easy? Yes. Should I get out of the freezer and do it? If you want. You're an idiot, Thrasher. I have bits falling off me and I have a burnt head. I'd say that would arouse a little suspicion, wouldn't you? Oh, 
Yes. Well, I could do it if you want to drive. I always wanted to work in an ice cream van ever since I was a little boy. Is that right? Oh, yes. My mother would take me to the beach and I loved hearing the tingle tingle of the ice cream van as it made its way across the... Shut up! Thrasher shut up. We're not serving ice cream. Do you hear me? We're not. Tell these people to go away. We're closed. I tried that, sir. They don't really listen. Scapegrace glowered. Are there children out there? Uh, yes, sir. They're all children. Run a few down. Sir? Drive over a few of the little brats. That'll scare them off. I... I don't think I can do that, sir. You're not developing a conscience on me now, are you, Thrasher? No, sir. You're still an evil zombie, aren't you? Oh, yes, sir, evil to the core. Then why can't you drive over a few children? I just don't think we're capable of going that fast, sir. With this traffic, plus the fact that they do seem to be an unusually spry bunch. Fine, Scapegrace said angrily. I'll take care of it. He pushed the lid all the way open and repositioned himself, then reached up and opened the window. Voices flooded the van, and hands poked through, waving money. Scapegrace pulled a face before plunging his head out of the window, and all the little kids screamed in terror and ran off, hands waving in the air. Scapegrace broke down, laughing hysterically, and fell back into the freezer, clutching his sides. Thrasher glanced back, and Scapegrace heard him force a laugh. That's very good, sir. Very funny. An hour later, Scapegrace felt the van slow again and eventually stop. A few moments passed, then Thrasher appeared over the freezer. We're here, he said, sliding open the lid. At least I think we're here. We're definitely somewhere. Scapegrace clambered out, slapping Thrasher's hands away when he went to help him. Once out, he went to the front of the van. They were in Dublin's Docklands, outside an old warehouse. There was a girl out there with blue hair. She was looking at the warehouse door, same as Scapegrace, but hadn't once turned round to look at the van with the giant penguin on top. Thrasher joined him. Who is she? Thrasher asked. How am I supposed to know? Scapegrace scowled. All I can see is the back of her blue head. Do you think she's crazy? Why would she be crazy? Thrasher shrugged. Scapegrace got out of the van, Thrasher close behind him. They approached the crazy girl with the blue hair. The doctor isn't here, she said without looking at them. The whole place is empty. It smells of disinfectant and oranges. Nye? Is that who you're talking about, Dr. Nye? The crazy girl nodded and looked at him. His face had been burnt off by Valkyrie Kane, and being a zombie meant that it had never even tried to heal itself. The crazy girl didn't even bat an eyelid. My name's Clarabelle, she said. What's yours? You don't need to know his name, Thrasher snarled. You don't need to know anything! Cool. The crazy girl didn't appear too bothered. Where has he gone? Scapegrace asked. Where's who gone? Dr. Nye. Dr. Nye isn't a he. Dr. Nye isn't it. I found a note that said it's got a job in the sanctuary. Can you imagine that? Dr. Nye working in the sanctuary? Where do things have happened, I suppose? Like Belgium? Scapegrace frowned. What about Belgium? That's pretty weird, isn't it? If Belgium happened, why should I be surprised that Dr. Nye is working for the sanctuary? It's all relative, isn't it? It all depends on where you're standing and where you've stood. Wherever Scapegrace was standing in relation to the crazy girl, he was pretty sure he was lost. I came here looking for a job, she answered, even though no one had asked. I had to leave my old job. I killed my boss. I didn't mean to do it, and it wasn't actually me who did it, but I still killed him. So now I need a new job. I dyed my hair. Do you like it? 
I know you, Scapegrace said. Do you? You worked for the old man, Professor Grouse. I did. I don't anymore. I don't like to talk about it. He took care of me. He thought I needed taking care of. I let him think that. I think he needed to think that. He needed to take care of someone, so I let him take care of me. I don't like to talk about it. You're a zombie. He's the zombie king, Thrasher announced with too much enthusiasm. That's cool, said Clarabelle with the crazy blue hair. And who are you? Thrasher faltered. Me? If he's the zombie king, who are you? The zombie queen? He's not the zombie queen, Scapegrace said quickly. The zombie prince, then? He's Thrasher. That's all he is. He's Thrasher. I'm Vorian Scapegrace, Clarabelle nodded. The Killer Supreme. Scapegrace stared. You've heard of me? Of course. Do you like my hair? It's very blue, said Thrasher. I dyed it and cut it. I think it was an attempt to leave that part of my life behind me to start anew. I'm sure that's what it was. It's not just a fashion thing. Is blue hair in this year? Scapegrace frowned. Is it in any year? Is it not? Clarabel asked, looking genuinely worried. I don't know, Scapegrace confessed. I don't know much about fashion. You've heard of me then, the Killer Supreme. Yes, you're a feared assassin. But he hasn't actually killed anyone, Thrasher said. I killed you, Scapegrace snapped. That's not enough for you? I killed the others too, made them into zombies. But we all came back to life, Thrasher pointed out. So it can't really be counted, can it? Scapegrace towered over him. It can be counted and it will be counted. Sorry, master, Thrasher whimpered. Why do you want to see Dr. Nye? Clarabelle asked. I think it can return me to full life, Scapegrace said, and end this accursed affliction. What accursed affliction? Uh, this? Being a zombie? Oh, that's a shame. I think zombies are kind of cute. Seriously? I may be thinking about bunnies. Which one has the fluffy little tail? Zombies or bunnies? Bunnies! Then it's bunnies I'm thinking of. Do you want to go with me to see Dr. Nye? I'm going to ask it to give me a job. And you can ask it to give you life. And your friend can ask it to give him a brain. I already have a brain, Thresher said defensively. I mean, a better one? I like the brain I have. Shut up, Scapegrace said. He turned back to Clarabelle. Do you know where the sanctuary is? I heard they have a new one. They do, said Clarabelle. It's in a far-off place, away from the prying eyes of the mortal world. Wicklow, I think? Then let's go to Wicklow, Scapegrace said. Do you have a car? I don't know how to drive. Don't worry, Clarabelle, you can ride in our van. She looked over her shoulder. It's got a giant penguin on it. Yes, it does. We should call it the Penguin Mobile. OK. Or Fred. Penguin Mobile is fine. She nodded. All right, then. Chapter 18. The Arrest Warrant. In the otherwise silent temple, raised voices darted through the narrow corridors like unwelcome guests. Craven followed them back to their source and barged through into the antechamber. What the hell is going on? He thundered, and watched with extreme satisfaction as the crowd of necromancers parted for him, suddenly quiet and subservient. In that crowd he saw the faces of men and women he had argued with over the years, people he had despised, who had despised him, who had called him petty and sycophantic and weak. 
Now they bowed. They practically prostrated themselves in his presence. Never had Craven felt so powerful. As the crowd parted, he saw the others. Sanctuary agents. Skullduggery Pleasant standing in front, a piece of paper in his gloved hand. The necromancers had been blocking their entry into the main temple. This is private property, Craven said. He didn't sneer. He didn't snarl. He didn't hide behind the biggest necromancer and issue threats. He was beyond all that now. This is a warrant for the arrest of Melancholia Sinclair, Pleasant responded. Either bring her out to us, or we'll go in after her. On what charge are you arresting her, detective? Assault on a sanctuary agent. Craven chuckled. What are you talking about? The Deathbringer, our great and glorious saviour, has not left the temple since her surge. Maybe you would be better off putting your energies into finding Lord Vile, instead of making up false allegations. She assaulted Valkyrie Kane. What are you talking about? She went to her house while her little baby sister slept inside. You didn't know about that, did you? That your little saviour had sneaked out for a bit. Craven didn't allow his surprise to register on his face. Miss Kane was attacked? How dreadful. I do hope there's no permanent damage. Is there? If there was, Craven, you and your friends here would already be dead. There was something in Pleasant's voice that assured Craven that what he was saying was true. In the meantime, we're going to have to take Melancholia in for questioning. I'm afraid that won't be possible. Hand her over. We all know what's going on here. This is religious persecution. Glorifying death is not a religion. It's a sickness. You are offending me. Look at the face I don't have, Craven. And tell me if it looks like I care. She broke the law. If you harbor her, you're breaking it too. So does that mean you're going to arrest me, detective? You're going to arrest all of us? I hate to point out the obvious, but there are more of us than there are of you. At his words, the necromancers started moving, encircling the sanctuary agents. I think it might be best for everyone if you just turned round and went away. Don't you think so, detective? If you try to stop us from carrying out our official duty, the full force of the sanctuary will come raining down on this temple. Well, now, that certainly seems intimidating. Until, of course, you take into account that within this self-same temple, we happen to have the Deathbringer who would be the most powerful sorcerer the world has ever seen. So factoring that in, your little threat doesn't really mean a whole lot now, does it? To be honest, there isn't anything you can do to stop us from doing anything we want to do. I don't wish to worry you, or any of the brave agents and operatives behind you, that we could kill you all right here and right now and we'd get away with it. Pleasant tilted his head slightly. That's where your mind is going, is it? That's the thought that has just entered my head. Yes. Kill us. Kill the next group of agents who come. Kill the next. There is a pleasing simplicity to it, isn't there? We'll be back, Craven. And there'll be more of us. Craven shook his head. Too late for that, I'm afraid. My mind is made up. These are your final moments. Is that so? You're going to give the order, then. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Necromancers! Pleasant's hand blurred, and suddenly he was holding a gun, pointing it straight at Craven. If you issue that order to attack, and if these necromancers do manage to defeat us, which I doubt, then you won't get to see any of that. I'll put a bullet in your brain from right here where I'm standing. You'll be dead before you hit the ground. Certainly you'll be dead before any of your friends even move towards me. So you'll never know if they beat us or not. 
and you'll never know if we come back here with an army and drag your death-bringer away in shackles. You'll never know any of that. So go ahead, Craven. Give the order. Sacrifice yourself for the well-being of your death-bringer. Be a martyr. Craven hadn't realized it before, but he was thirsty. There was nothing in the world he wanted more right at that moment than a glass of water. We're going to walk out of here, Pleasant continued. We're going to do it slowly. Your friends can back up against the walls. It'll probably be safer for them if they do so, because if even one necromancer stands between us and the door, we're going to kill every last one of you. But you'll be first, Craven. You keep that in mind. You'll be first. Let them go, said Craven, his voice a croak. Pleasant's gun didn't waver as he backed away, and Craven didn't move. Even if he wanted to, his body seemed locked in position. The sanctuary agents walked backwards to the stairs, and he watched them climb. Pleasant stayed where he was until the doors above him opened. Daylight flooded the staircase, illuminating him as he stood there. His gun glinted. Beneath his hat, his skull was in the deepest, darkest shadow. Good boy, he said. He spoke quietly, but his voice easily carried across to Craven. We're going to be keeping an eye on things here to make sure you don't take Melancholia off on a nice holiday before we have a chance to speak with her. I'm sure you understand. Craven said nothing, and Pleasant climbed the steps. A moment after he was gone, the doors slammed shut, cutting off the sunlight. Chapter 19 Gods and Monsters the cops hadn't been any use. Lynch's death was reported on the news as a mere robbery. No one cared if another homeless person died. Just another piece of rubbish swept into the gutter of the city. Who was there to mourn for someone like that? Kenny would have liked to mourn, but in truth he was too excited. His run-in with the tall man who'd called himself Detective Inspector Me and the teenage girl had convinced him that something bigger was going on. Suddenly this article on modern urban legends had started to spiral into territories he would never have anticipated. What did the tall man and the teenage girl have to do with Lynch's murder? Had they killed him? His stomach churned with happy nerves. This was a story now, a proper story. If his car hadn't died on him, he would have tried to find Bernadette McGuire's cottage and asked her what exactly Lynch had told her. There was the faint possibility that her life was in danger now that Lynch was dead, but he doubted it. Such things only happened in movies, unfortunately. Which meant that Kenny now had only one lead left to him, and that was the tattooist he'd heard about. It was a glorious Tuesday morning in Temple Bar. Kenny walked up cobbled streets until he found the brightly coloured building. Music played above. He climbed the wooden stairs, passing the photographs of tattoos and piercings and other works of body art. He had never been tempted to get a tattoo himself. It all seemed like a little too much pain. There was a skinny man in a thin Lizzie t-shirt, his arms inked, a ring in his lips and his head shaved. He turned down the music when he saw Kenny. Damien Dempsey was playing. Negative vibes. Are you Finbar? Kenny asked. I am indeed, said the skinny man. Are you looking for a tattoo? Kenny hesitated, then smiled. Actually, no. A piercing, then? No need to be embarrassed. Just tell me what you want pierced and we'll pierce it. I'll pierce anything, me. Actually, I was hoping we could just talk. Oh, Finbar said. Oh, right. Well, I'm flattered, I am, but before you go getting your hopes up, I have to tell you, I'm married. Uh, that's not what I meant. My wife's in the other room if you want to meet her. 
I'd call her in, but she's not really speaking to me right now. Don't know why. She was in a cult, you see, and she had to shave all her hair off. She left eventually, like, and came back to me and were a family again. But her head's having a little bit of trouble regrowing all that hair. She says I'm unsympathetic. I say she looks like a tufty bowling ball. Maybe if you see her, you can decide who's right. I wouldn't really be comfortable doing that. Ah, fair enough, I suppose. I heard you're a psychic. Finbar's laugh was delayed by a split second. Not me, mate. But there's a mystic Meg up the street there. She does a bit of tarot, that sort of thing. She's good, you know, if you believe in it. I don't want my palm read. You see the future. Who's been filling your head with this nonsense? It's the word in the street. And what street would that be? No, not me, sorry. What do you know of the passage? Finbar didn't move away. He stood there, his tongue pressed against his lip ring. Who did you say you were? My name is Kenny Dunn. I'm a journalist. And why would a journalist be asking stupid questions like the passage? So you do know about it? Don't know anything that could help you, sorry. You'd probably better go. I can pay. Then you have more money than sense, mate. Keep it. Spend it on something worthwhile, like a taxi. They say you're a psychic who saw something so horrible that you haven't been able to see any vision since. In that case, I wouldn't be any help to you, would I? But you don't know what you're talking about, and I haven't a clue where you're coming up with this stuff. I'm a busy man. I need you to leave. Kenny indicated the empty room. This is busy? Tuesday takes a while to get going. Finbar, you know what's going on, don't you? I've been hearing about the end of the world, ancient gods, superpowers, strange people who can do amazing things. I'm pretty sure I've even met some of them. A tall man in a suit? A dark-haired girl? You know these people? They don't ring any bells? I'm going to find out sooner or later. You can help make sure I get the facts right. I don't know any facts. Come on, I know you're not a stupid man. I'm quite stupid. Ask anyone. Finbar, are there superheroes living among us? Finbar snorted with laughter and Kenny started to feel a little thick. Superheroes? In tights and capes flying around? <laughs> if there were superheroes, Mr. Journalist, don't you think they'd be in New York or somewhere like that? There's really not that many tall buildings for Spider-Man to swing from in Dublin, you know? He'd have maybe two swings, and then he'd just hang there looking disappointed. These people don't wear tights and capes, Finbar. So they're naked superheroes. <laughs> That's grand for now. But when the good weather is over, they're going to regret it. They look like us. They dress like us. But they're not like us. They're different. You, Finbar said, are sounding very racist right now. I'm going to find the truth, with or without you. Either way, you'll be seeing a lot of me in the next few weeks and months. I'm going to follow you wherever you go. I don't go anywhere. I'm going to trail your friends. I don't have any. I'm going to photograph every single person to enter and leave this tattoo parlour. Finbar rolled his eyes. And they'll hate that because people who get dragons drawn on their backs are normally so shy about other people noticing them. It doesn't have to be this way, Finbar. That tongue pressing against the lip ring. I can't help you, he said at last. But I know someone who might be able to. His name's Geoffrey. What does Geoffrey do? You can ask him yourself, if he meets with you. Three o'clock today outside Bruxelles on Harry Street. How do I know he'll be there? I'll give him a call. If he wants to meet you, he'll be there. If he doesn't show up, I'm coming back. Well, if you come back, I might not open the door. The door's always open. Then I'll get the lock fixed, Finbar retorted. Kenny waited to see if Finbar had anything to add, but he obviously didn't, so he left him alone. Kenny had lunch in Milano's, then walked up to Grafton Street. He wasn't going to be late, not this time. He got there at half two and sat outside in the sunshine. At a little before three, 
A small man in khakis wandered up. He had a gentle face, beads in his beard, and hair the colour and approximate texture of wheat. He had many bracelets on his wrists and rings on his fingers. He joined Kenny at his table. You're Geoffrey? Kenny asked. Indeed I am, said the man. And you must be Mr. Journalist. Kenny Dunn, hi, pleased to meet you. The pleasure is all mine. I really want to thank you for meeting with me. I've been having a hard time getting anyone to talk about this stuff. I can't really blame them, Geoffrey said with a chuckle. This kind of talk gets people killed. Kenny frowned. You're talking about Paul Lynch? I'm sorry. I don't know who that is. He was a homeless man. He said he had visions of the apocalypse. Which one? Sorry? Which apocalypse? There are a few. Uh, there was one where these old gods came back? The faceless ones? Yes. What about the remnants? Did he foresee that? Last Christmas? The insanity virus thing, with all those slices of darkness. They're called remnants. Don't worry about them. They're all locked away, safe and sound. Did he foresee the Deathbringer? Who's the Deathbringer? The Deathbringer's the one who's going to initiate the passage. Kenny took out his notebook, started scribbling. Deathbringer. One word or two. Either. I've always preferred two. What about Darkus? I'm sorry, I don't know what that is. He didn't foresee Darkus. Oh, that's interesting. Geoffrey sat back, finger tapping the beads in his beard. After every apocalypse passed without actually happening, Kenny said, he'd get a new set of visions. Ah, well, that explains it. He foresaw them one at a time. As each one was averted, he'd see the next one. It's a pity he didn't see Darkus. We've been trying to find out more about her. So it's all real? Kenny asked. All of it? The visions, the gods, the superheroes? Geoffrey chuckled. <laughs> superheroes? <laughs> They're not superheroes, Mr. Journalist. They're sorcerers. Sorcerers? Like with magic? Like with magic, yes. So the tall man and the teenage girl, they're sorcerers too? Oh, Geoffrey said, smiling. You mean Skullduggery Pleasant and Valkyrie Kane? <laughs> Those two? They're the good guys. We're all alive today because of them. They saved the world. They saved the world a few times. Indeed they have. This is amazing. Yes, it is. You don't believe any of it, though. Kenny smiled and shrugged. Well, I'm... I suppose I'm sceptical. But if you believe it, there must be something to it, right? But I'm a crackpot, Geoffrey said, smiling broadly. Finbar is a crackpot. Everyone you've spoken to about this is a crackpot. You can see that, can't you? Kenny frowned. You're all nuts. Sadly, yes. You're going to go home today and you're going to look at all your notes and research and you're going to realise that it's all just nonsense. Nonsense? To be honest, you'll be happy. You were never really interested in this stuff in the first place. The fact is, you find it kind of boring. Kenny nodded. It's pretty dull, all right. The idea of people with strange powers, it's just ridiculous, isn't it? It is, actually. It belongs in a comic book. That's exactly where it belongs. I've been wasting my time, Kenny said. God, I've just been wasting my time. Geoffrey nodded and didn't disagree. Kenny gave him a smile. Listen, hey, sorry for being such a bother, he said. I really have to go, actually. I've got a story due tomorrow, and I need to work on it. Of course, Geoffrey said. Don't let me delay you. Kenny shook his hand and got up, started walking. He put his notebook away, glanced back to make sure Geoffrey wasn't wandering after him. The last thing he needed was a crackpot like that following him home. When he got back to his apartment, Kenny started packing all that nonsense away. 
He couldn't believe he had wasted so much of his time on this. Couldn't believe he had actually got excited about the possibilities. What possibilities? A group of nutcases who all subscribed to the same delusion? He would have burnt everything, shoved it in the bin, but that wasn't his way. He never discarded his notes. Not until the article was done. Everything was useful. He might not write a world-shattering expose on a secret subculture of superheroes, but he could use what he'd learned if he was ever asked to write about the homeless in Dublin or the plight of the psychologically disturbed. Nothing he knew was ever wasted. Not really. He flicked through his notes. The remnants. Darkus. The Deathbringer. One word or two. The Passage. The Tall Man and the Teenage Girl. Skullduggery Pleasant and Valkyrie Kane. They were real, even if the identities they'd given him were not. But that was to be expected, after all. Fragments of reality can be glimpsed through even the most fractured of windows. He read back over it, battling the tide of boredom that swept over him. It didn't stop him reading, of course. He was a journalist. Research was what he did, and oftentimes research was mind-numbingly boring, just like this was. He didn't know why it was boring, though. He couldn't put his finger on it. It didn't sound boring. Superpowers and the apocalypse and saving the world. But Geoffrey had known. For all his lunacy, he'd hit the nail right on the head with that one. And the moment he'd uttered those words, Kenny had felt it. The boredom. The dullness. It just seeped in, robbing him of his enthusiasm. Kenny frowned. Before Geoffrey had told him that this was all boring, Kenny had found it fascinating. He remembered that distinctly. But then it was like a switch had been flicked inside him and all his interest had faded away. He sat on the arm of the chair, brow furrowed. What had happened? How could it have happened? He remembered Geoffrey's face, smiling, avuncular, a bit of an oddball, granted, a crackpot even, as he himself had said. His voice was nice. It wasn't as smooth as the tall man's, but it had a quality that got inside your head. It was a warm voice, comforting. It made you want to trust him. It made you want to believe him. Kenny's notes dropped from his hand, scattered across the floor. His eyes were wide. His mouth was half open. He'd been hypnotized. He didn't know how Geoffrey had done it. But he'd convinced him with a few short words that he didn't think what he thought, that he didn't believe what he believed. Good God, he said to his empty apartment. All of a sudden, his enthusiasm came back to him, his interest roaring inside him like a furnace in his chest. Finbar had sent him to meet with Geoffrey so that Geoffrey could work his hoodoo on him, make him walk away from what might have been the biggest story of his career. Kenny grinned. You're going to have to do better than that. Chapter 20 Riding Out China gripped the reins and pulled, straining against the horse's resistance. He was a willful one, all right. Every turn they made, he tried to shake her loose. Every ditch they jumped, he threatened to throw her into. She'd been fighting him since she swung into the saddle. Her arms ached and her legs burned. Her jodhpurs were splattered with mud and her shirt stuck to her. Her hands were raw from the reins. God, she loved him. A creature of fierce strength and beauty and one that made her work to get him to do what she wanted. A challenge. She used to ride out all the time when she was younger. But as her friends fell away or died, or she betrayed them or they betrayed her, it had become a solitary pursuit. And for a while, she preferred it that way. Just her and the horse and the open countryside. The hoofbeats that thudded through her body. Clods of grass and mud kicked up behind them. No talk, no flattery, no professions of love. But people change, and she was as vulnerable to this phenomenon as anyone. Decades of solitude had hardened her, 
but isolation without end was a dangerous thing. Suddenly she didn't want to be alone on these afternoons. Valkyrie would enjoy this, she knew. China had heard her talk of when she rode out as a young girl before she met Skullduggery. Just a beginner, but with a natural's love for it. Maybe one of these days, as soon as Valkyrie got a break from saving the world, China would invite her to the stables. She even had the perfect horse picked out, strong and fast with a hint of mischief, the perfect way to get reacquainted with the saddle. Providing, of course, that China found a way to settle this Eliza Scorn business. It required not just a single strike against Scorn, or even a strike against Scorn and Prave together, but multiple strikes against multiple targets at the same time. The biggest problem with that, and this was truly the hold that Scorn had on her, was that China didn't know who these targets might be. There may have been none, of course. Scorn may have been bluffing, but China doubted it. In order to build up the Church of the Faceless, Scorn would need a lot more than China's resources. She had to have benefactors secret backers and interested parties. She wouldn't have told them what China had done in her misspent youth, but she would have worked out a way to get that information to them if something bad happened to her, which meant that China needed to find out who these mysterious benefactors were and take them all down at the same time. China slowed, pulling the reins firmly until the tired horse complied. She took the trail down to the river, and the creature splashed in gratefully, the fast-moving water cooling his muscles and rising past China's boots, but she didn't mind. She patted his neck, told him how good he was, how he was the best horse to be kept in these stables in twenty years. When they were done, she guided him up onto the bank and walked back to the yard. She had a small army there tending to the horses, all unmarried men and women, these were talented people who did their jobs well. She didn't want them leaving their wives and husbands and families just because they'd fallen in love with her. It was easier to deal with love-struck sorcerers who at least knew her reputation, but mortals didn't stand a chance. At her instruction, all workers were to vacate the yard whenever she was in it unless explicitly asked to stay. That afternoon, the yard was empty. She dismounted, led the horse into the stable. She undid the saddle, swung it up onto the edge of the door. The horse nuzzled her neck, and China smiled. She forked in some fresh hay and stepped out, and there was a man behind her. China swung back her elbow, caught him on the jaw. He staggered, and she turned, swept his feet from under him. He hit the floor, went to roll away, then stopped, and held up his hands. China! Jaron Gallo said. I'm not here to fight you. China raised an eyebrow. Good. That will make this so much easier. I'm here to help. Help what? Help you. He rubbed his jaw and looked up at her. I know Eliza is back in town. I know she's been hanging around with that prave idiot. I've been watching them. I saw you visiting. Everyone spying and everyone else, China said. It warms my heart. It truly does. Can I stand up? Of course you can. There's no guarantee I won't put you back down again, but you can at least try. He narrowed his eyes, then stood, moving slowly. He was dark-haired and graceful, though thinner than she remembered. His face was gaunt. She watched him, noticing his right hand for the first time. It was gloved. The last I saw of you, she said, you were chopping that arm off to avoid being used as a vessel for the faceless ones. Did it grow back? Less? No, this isn't mine. It belonged to a donor. Willing or otherwise? Otherwise. What do you want, Jaron? I can only imagine what Eliza Scorn has over you. That's why she called you, right? To force you to do something. It must be pretty substantial, whatever it is. I can't tell if you're circling a point or just boring me on purpose. I know what their plans are. I know they want to build up the Church of the Faceless all around the world. 
I'm pretty sure that Eliza views herself as some kind of Pope figure. Thinks she can lead the faithful to a world where the strong are awarded and the weak are discarded. The same kind of world you're looking for, China reminded him. He shook his head. Not any more. People change, China. You know that better than anyone. You led the diablerie before me. You taught me everything I know. You were a zealot through and through. And now look at you. Is it so hard to believe that I could have gone through the same transformation? That day at the farm, when we opened the portal and the faceless ones came back, I saw them for what they really were. They're not gods. They're things. Creatures. Monsters. As powerful as gods, perhaps, but they certainly don't deserve to be worshipped. Blasphemy, China said with a smile. Indeed it is. I've lost my faith, China. There is no hope of a beautiful world if they return, and that's been the big lie right from the start. The idea that we disciples will be spared, that we be welcomed while everyone else perished. <laughs> Ridiculous. Those things don't care about us. All right, China said. So you've had a change of heart? You've seen the light and you've turned away from wickedness? That's all wonderful. But why should I be at all interested? I'm here to stop them. Eliza? Eliza, Prave, any and everyone else. I'm here to shut down the Church of the Faceless. But I need your help to do it. I've already wandered in from the wilderness and rejoined them. It'll be like the good old days. They're not going to trust you, but they do trust me. So you have infiltrated their ranks? Now what? Eliza wants to build the church's strength. In order to do that, she's going to need a comprehensive plan of how strong or weak the church is right now, right at this moment. She'll have names, locations, funds, resources... She'll have the identities of spies and informants loyal to the faceless ones. She's already told me of a list of people who are going to help her build the church back up. Twelve names on it, she said. All powerful sorcerers, most in positions of influence and authority. And unlike you, they won't need to be blackmailed into helping. From what she's told me, some of these people sit on certain councils around the world. China kept her smile to herself. Everything we would need, in other words, to completely dismantle the whole thing? Exactly. Once we have that information, we won't need Eliza any more. We can either share it with your friends in the sanctuary, or take care of things ourselves. Travelling the world, China said, killing everyone on that list? How romantic. It's the only way to be sure. These people... What they want. It's all too dangerous. We have to erase them from the face of the planet to make sure it never happens. So dramatic. Has it ever been any different when it comes to the faceless ones? I suppose not. That's why I was drawn in at such a young age. Now, Jaren, all that sounds very thrilling and very wonderful, and I'm sure it would be a thoroughly diverting adventure. But why on earth should I trust you? What would I have to gain by lying? I sincerely don't know. But Eliza's a cunning lady, and she always has been. You'll think I'm working for her. China smiled. It is crossing my mind, even as we speak. You're just going to have to believe me. And that, my dear, is where this whole proposal falls flat. I don't believe anyone let alone someone who once tried to kill me. I tried to kill you twice. Really? That time in Naples, the fire. China laughed. That was you? That fire scorched my favourite shawl. And it killed 83 people. But that shawl was exquisite. Still, I suppose I can't blame you. I would have done the same. You might not be able to trust me, China, but I know I can trust you. You want Eliza gone. You want the Church of the Faceless gone. 
I'm your only chance to make that happen. She didn't really have much in the way of other options, so China gave him a smile. Chapter 21 The Love of a Vampire Valkyrie woke. It was getting dark outside, and as usual, it was cold in Skullduggery's house. She stood and stretched, eased a crick out of her neck and went to the mirror, checking for scars. As much as she hated to admit it, Nye had done an excellent job. She was tired but feeling good, confident that a night in her own bed was all she needed to make a full recovery. She called for a taxi, went out to meet it and sat in the back. If she had called Fletcher, she'd be home already. But she would have also had to listen to him disapprove of the many injuries she sustained over the course of any given month. She wasn't in the mood for him. Not this evening. The taxi dropped her in Haggard, and she cut through the park. She could almost have predicted who would step out in front of her. I failed you, Caelan said. Hi, Chuckles, she responded. She didn't stop walking. I should have been faster, he said from beside her. I should have torn that necromancer's throat out. But she took you away before I... I will not fail you again. Don't worry about it. What are you doing in town? I'm here for you. Did you drive? Get the bus? Do vampires get buses? He stepped in front of her. You make jokes, he said. But I see nothing to laugh at. The Deathbringer. Lord Vile, the end of the world. None of that would be as bad as losing you. I'm sorry? No more smooches is worse than the world ending? Seriously? You really want to stand behind that statement? You don't think it's a teensy bit melodramatic? Without our love, Valkyrie, there is no world left to save. And that statement actually makes less sense than the one before it. Kaylin, you've got to cop on to yourself. I've read Wuthering Heights, okay? I know the whole gloomy, tortured, romantic figure thing. Everyone knows it. It's not as romantic as you'd think. Where's the fun? Where's the laughter? I couldn't be with anyone I couldn't have a bit of crack with. I know you hate him, but for God's sake, at least Fletcher is fun to be around. Kaylin's face shifted, becoming cold. Do you love him more than you love me? I never said the word love. I said the word fun. We have fun. We have a certain kind of fun, yes, but we don't laugh. When was the last time we laughed together? You laugh with Fletcher. All the time. Then the boy has his uses. When you need to laugh at something, you have him to laugh at. When you need to be fulfilled, you have me. You're really not getting this. He took her hand in his and knelt before her. Marry me, he said. Valkyrie looked at him. He was serious. She had never used the word dude in a serious conversation before. She didn't think this qualified. Dude, I'm sixteen. I love you. That doesn't make me any older. Stand up. Not until you say yes. You're going to shuffle around on your knees for the rest of your life? Stand up, for God's sake. She waited until he did as she asked. Did you seriously propose to me? Have you not heard anything I've been saying these past few months? This is ridiculous. This is beyond ridiculous. Be my wife. Shut the hell up. What did I tell you? What did I tell you about coming on too strong? Do you not think a marriage proposal falls into that category? We are destined for each other. No, we're not, Caelan. I made it quite bloody clear. I've been with you because you're really good looking and you're dangerous. That's attractive to me. That's a good combination. But they're the only reasons we were together. It's not love. It's fate. It's not fate either, you idiot. Why do you like me? I love you. Then why do you love me? Give me five good reasons why you love me. Because you're beautiful? You're absolutely right there. But that's got nothing to do with me. That's genetics. Four more, sunshine. You're intelligent. 
You are the light in my darkness. Intelligent? That's reason number two. Light in the darkness? That's not a reason. That's a bad song lyric. You're full of life. I look at you and I'm reminded of the glory of humanity. How they seize life and let it fill them to the brim. I remind you of the glory of humanity? Okay, that's reason number three. Two more. Kalen smiled. There are more reasons why I love you than there are stars in the night sky. In that case, he won't have any problem coming up with two more. He hesitated. You don't love me, she told him. You think you do. You like the idea of it. But the fact of the matter is that you're a hundred and something years old, and I'm sixteen. I'm a teenager. Do you not see anything wrong with that? If I repulse you... You don't repulse me, Caelan, because you look like a hot nineteen-year-old. But every time you say something, I'm reminded of the fact that you're really just an old man. And, okay, I've never actually said that out loud before. It's really kind of disgusting. For people like us, age doesn't matter. For people like you, the old men, age doesn't matter. For people like me, the teenage girls, it suddenly becomes very icky. I'm trying to make you understand, Valkyrie. That love transcends the meaningless. If I love you, I won't let anything stand in my way. If you love me, which I don't, then you won't let anything stand in your way. Marry me, and we'll be together forever. No. You can only hide from your feelings for so long. And you can only hide from reality for so long. I'm not going to marry you, Caelan. Right now, I'm going home. I will accompany you. No, you will not. The Deathbringer might return. You really need to relax. I've got my phone worked out so that all I have to do is tap a little button and Fletcher and Skullduggery come teleporting in. She won't be back, though. She's had her fun. You don't need them. I'm the only one you need. I am your guardian angel. I'm giving you the night off, okay? Go out, have fun... Meet a girl, don't obsess over her too much. I promise you, you'll be much more cheerful in the morning. You are the only one for me. I'm walking away now. Say you love me, he called after her, and she rolled her eyes. Chapter 22 The Church of the Faceless Scorn kept her waiting. But it was a beautiful morning outside, so China didn't mind. It was an obvious little game, designed to teach her who was in charge. A little clumsy, and somewhat disappointing to see that dear old Eliza would resort to it, but it was an inoffensive tactic. According to Gallo, today was the day that he would be revealed to China. She wasn't sure yet if she believed him, but she definitely didn't trust him. He had told her to act suitably surprised when he appeared. China hadn't made any promises. She became aware of Prave glaring at her from across the church and arched an eyebrow. Can I help you? I'm not in love with you, he snarled. How dreadful for me. He gripped the sweeping brush like he was strangling it. You think everyone falls in love with you? Well, you're wrong. They're weak-minded fools. That's not me. Obviously. The only love in my heart is for the faceless ones, and you will not take that from me. Perish the thought, Mr... She paused. Whatever your name is. Prave, he blurted. Mr. Prave, excellent. I have worshipped the dark gods since I was a boy. <laughs> my parents were loyal to them. <laughs> My father fought alongside Mevolent himself. That's nice. He wasn't a traitor. Not like you. And what was your father's name? Denzel Travestein. He was at Mevolent's side when they destroyed the sanctuary in Marseille. I doubt it. I've never heard of your father, and I was in Marseille when the sanctuary fell. It was my diablerie that opened the doors to allow Mevolent entry. Your father wasn't there, I'm afraid. Prave stared at her. 
You're lying. I could name each and every sorcerer who toppled that sanctuary. I won't, because you're truly not worth the effort. But I could. It seems your father was exaggerating his importance, Mr. Preve. My father was a hero! To his weak-minded son, I'm sure he was. Prave hurled the sweeping brush away and stormed over, fists clenched. China turned her head to him inside. He stopped a hand's breath away, face red and snarling, like he was forcing himself not to commit incredible acts of violence. You, China said, are a very impressive man. Do not knock me! he screeched. China smiled. Walk back over there, pick up the sweeping brush, and continue cleaning. Or go for a nice walk and think about all the lies your father told you. I really don't care what you do, so long as you stop breathing on me. It's really not as soothing as you might think. Prave's bulging eyes bulged even further, which was a feat in itself. I should kill you right here. You know, China said, there was a time when nobody dared threaten me. I just wouldn't stand for it. The amount of people I killed, of bodies I twisted and bones I snapped, all because they'd allowed their anger to momentarily overwhelm their good sense. I regret it all now, of course. I was out of control. I was indulging the darkness inside me far too often. I was not, Mr. Prave, a very nice person. But I have changed. I have allowed the years to mellow me. Now I find joy in simple pleasures. A good book, a fine wine, good company. All of these things make me smile. They make me happy. But every once in a while, I get the urge. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? The urge for destruction. The urge to hurt, maim, kill. It's quite a thing to experience that urge. To let it wash over you. To give in to it. It's addictive. It's all-consuming. You lose yourself to it. It's quite, quite wonderful. I can feel it, even as I speak, tapping around the edges of my mind, trying to prize me open, slip its fingers in. And it would be so easy to let it happen. But we're all like that, aren't we? We're all barbarians at our core. We're all savage, murderous beasts. I know I am. I'm sure you are. The only difference between us, Mr. Prave, is how loudly we roar. I know I roar very loudly indeed. How about you? Do you think you can match me? Prave had grown quite pale. His fists were no longer clenched, and he was no longer gritting his teeth. He took a step back, then another one. He hesitated, then slowly turned and went back to his sweeping brush. China shrugged, and scorn appeared at the door. China, she said, so sorry to have kept you waiting. Not at all, China smiled. Mr. Prave here was entertaining me. I do so like how you've kept him around. Scorn shrugged. Ah, well, I made the mistake of feeding him, you see, and now he just won't go away. China heard Prave muttering under his breath. But I didn't ask you here to help me and solve the help, as fun as that may be. I have a surprise for you. Let me guess, China said. You've changed your mind and you're going to put all this nonsense behind you? Not even close, said Scorn. Do you want another try? I bet you won't guess what it is. You're going to tell Skullduggery Pleasant what you're planning to do and let him shoot you in the head? Wrong again, I'm afraid. Do you want one more try? I'd love one more try. Then go ahead, China. Guess what the surprise is. China paused, tapped her chin thoughtfully and smiled. I know. Is it by any chance Jaron Gallo with a brand new arm? Oh, she wished she had a camera to capture the look on Eliza Scorn's face. 
Gallo emerged from the doorway behind, suddenly unsure, suddenly paranoid that he'd been betrayed, that he was walking into a trap. There was a sudden fear in his eyes that was almost impossible to fake, and now China did believe him. How did you know? Scorn asked, almost snarled, in fact. Please, China said dismissively. I know what he had for breakfast this morning. I know what he's been doing since he got back to Europe. I was only wondering how long it would take you to reveal him. A smile appeared on Scorn's lips. You always were impossible to surprise. Jaron here has just returned to the fold. I hope there's no bad blood between you. What's in the past is in the past, China said. I'm going to end up killing every one of you for all this, and one more name added to the list won't make much difference. Gallo looked at her, then at Scorn. I thought you said she was under control. She is, Scorn said. She just likes to say these things to pretend she's still in charge. But as long as I keep her secret, China will do what she's told. For instance, I told her to come back with information about all this necromancer fuss I've been hearing about. China? Everyone else was standing, so China sat on a pew and crossed her legs. She looked at Scorn without tilting her chin, pleased by the way she had changed the dynamic of the room. Melancholia Sinclair is the latest necromancer to be handed the title Deathbringer, she said. Unlike the others, however, it seems that this girl will actually strive to fulfill her duties. And what are her duties? asked Gallo. To usher in the passage and to save the world. If your next question is to ask me about the passage, you can save your breath. It is something of a mystery, even to those who trade in mysteries. Suffice to say, the end result is a supposedly better world where the living and the dead exist side by side. Ridiculous, Scorn said. That would completely negate death. It would reduce it to a mere concept. And possibly make the world a better place. Scorn shook her head. The world is how the faceless ones left it. And that is how it shall stay. If it looks like the necromancers have a chance of success, we may have to act against them. Well, that's what the sanctuary is doing, Crave said, hurrying over. Shouldn't we stay out of it? We just get in the way. Scorn didn't even look at him. But Gallo did, and Crave shrank back. I don't know you, Gallo said. I've just met you. Already I want to hurt you. You, uh, you actually do know me, Crave said. We met twice, actually. It was only for a few minutes, though, so you probably don't remember. I don't, Gallo said. At all, even remotely, and I'm glad. Remembering you would annoy me. It would mean you somehow managed to take up space in my head, and I reserve space in my head for people who interest me, or at the very least have something worthwhile to offer. Now shut up! And don't say anything else. Prave gaped at him. How, how dare you? I rescued the Church of the Faceless from collapse. I built it back up. You built it back up to this? Gallo didn't have to gesture to his surroundings to make his point. You're a weak, miserable little man, with no concept of what it'll take to bring back the Dark Gods. We could leave this death-bringer business to the Sanctuary, but that would mean entrusting the Sanctuary with all of our future plans. Is that what you want? Scorn turned her head, smiled at Prave. Maybe you could make us all some tea. Prave blinked his bulbous eyes. Tea? A nice big pot. There's a good man. But, but I'm in this. I'm involved in this, the whole thing! I'm one of the leaders! Scorn raised an eyebrow. You? Oh, my word, no. No, Prave. You are not one of the leaders. There is only one leader here, and that is me. Gallo is my second. China is our reluctant sponsor and untrustworthy ally. And you're the one who makes the tea. So, Prave. 
Enough of the silly talk and the giving of your inconsequential opinions. Be a dear and go make the tea. Prave closed his mouth, his wet lips pressing together like slippery eels, then turned abruptly and left the room. His ears, which were substantial, burned so red they practically left a heat trail behind him. Scorn nodded to China. Continue. Melancholia attacked Valkyrie Kane, and the Sanctuary have seized upon the chance to issue an arrest warrant. They're getting ready to strike, Scorn murmured. What about Lord Vile? Gallo asked. I haven't been so out of the loop that I didn't hear of his return. His supposed return, Scorn said. But has he been seen since he battled Skaldaggery Pleasant? Gallo looked at her. You think his return is a lie? Perhaps. What could spook the necromancers more than a rumour that Lord Vile is out to get them? But if he has returned, and he does seek to destroy the Deathbringer, then maybe we can convince him to come back to our side. Scorn looked at him. And how do you propose to do that? Are you going to use your long-standing friendship with him to delay his killing stroke while you make your case? Oh, no, that's right. You don't have a long-standing friendship with him, do you? No one does. We may have fought alongside him during the war, but that was a long time ago. We don't know where his loyalties lie. We know it's not with the necromancers, Gallo said. That's something, at least. China? Scorn said. What do you think? I think approaching Lord Vile is a wonderful idea. China answered, smiling. I think the pair of you should go and talk to him. I'm sure he'd love that. If I didn't know any better, I'd swear you were trying to get me killed before I have a chance to upstage you at the Requiem Ball. You're attending? Why, yes. And why shouldn't I? We're celebrating the end of the war, aren't we? Indeed we are, said China. But I doubt there will be many guests there who fought on the losing side. Scorn shrugged. Winning side, losing side, it's all a matter of degree. And then there's you, of course. You don't have a side, do you? You abandoned your side, turned your back on your... If you're going to describe what a traitor I am, I feel I have to tell you that I've heard it all before, and if you're finished with me, I have a library to get back to. Finished with you? <laughs> Scorn laughed. China, my darling, I haven't even started. She met Gallo later that night, under the moon and the stars. That list of twelve people, she said, the important and influential sorcerers Eliza was talking about, they're going to be at the Requiem Ball. Gallo frowned. You're sure? She'd meet with them right under everyone's noses. It's far too dangerous. Not for Eliza. It's the perfect excuse to talk to them. We're going to need that list if we want to shut this down before it starts. Gallo smiled. You want to assassinate them, don't you? She shrugged her left shoulder. It is one option. The first person we'll have to take care of is Scorn herself. Once we have the list, we won't need her any more. No, said China. We take them all out at the same time. That may not be possible. Let me worry about that. Once they're dead, the church will crumble, once and for all. She looked at Gallo. Do you think you can retrieve it without her knowing? It shouldn't be a problem. Do you think you can organize the assassination of Scorn and twelve others? China smiled. It shouldn't be a problem. Chapter 23 the homecoming. They'd been on the road for a little under twenty-four hours when the penguin mobile stopped and Clarabel tapped on the glass. We're here, she said. Scapegrace slid open the freezer and got out. He watched Clarabel stretch, envying the yawn that accompanied the movement. He was dead. He didn't get tired anymore. He missed it. 
It was another gorgeous day outside. Grumbling, he put on a coat and pulled up the hood to hide his head. Clarabel left the van first, and Scapegrace pushed Thrasher aside so he could go next. He stepped onto a pavement. It was awfully familiar. He looked around. We're in Roarhaven, he said. Clarabel nodded. This is where the new sanctuary is. He stared at her. But I know Roarhaven. I lived here for years. I know how to get to Roarhaven. We didn't have to spend twenty-four hours driving around waiting for you to remember where the sanctuary was. You could just have said Roarhaven and I'd have known. We could have been here in an hour. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. It's a little about the destination, Thrasher said quietly. And besides, Clarabel said, we got to see the sights, didn't we? I was stuck in a freezer, Scapegrace reminded her. This is my home now, Clarabel said, ignoring them. Or it will be, if I get the job. It is a lovely town, isn't it? Scapegrace hesitated. Do you really think so? No, I don't, she admitted. I liked where I was living in Dublin Moor. I had a nice flat, and I had a gerbil. His name was Theodore. That's a nice name, said Thrasher. I don't think he liked it. Roarhaven, though, it isn't a gerbil kind of place. I don't suppose it is, Scapegrace said. The people aren't very nice. They don't trust outsiders. I don't think Theodore would have fitted in. Before I left, I released him into the wild. Thrasher frowned. You released your gerbil into the wild? Yes, back into his natural habitat. It was only fair. Now he can live out the rest of his life hunting his prey and raising a family. What, uh, what would a gerbil's prey be? Nuts, mostly. Thrasher frowned. And how would he hunt nuts? Clarabel shrugged. He'd probably lie in wait or something. I don't know. But he's out there now, living his life. And I'm here, in Roarhaven, trying to start a new one. I'm going to ask for a job now. She started walking towards the sanctuary. Scapegrace hesitated then followed after her. Thrasher scurried along behind. If you get a job, Scapegrace said, maybe you could ask Dr. Knight to bring me back to life as a favour. Dr. Knight doesn't do favours, Clarabel said. Dr. Nye is not that kind of boss. You don't know what kind of boss it is. You said earlier you'd never met it. I'm only guessing. I'm guessing it'll say no. It'll have to. Or I'll get it into my head to ask it for favours every day, and then where will we be? You'll have to ask it yourself. But why would it say yes to me? Maybe it's kind. You mentioned something about it being a war criminal. Yes, I don't think it's kind. If it is such a horrible creature, Thrasher said from behind them, then why do you want to work for the Clarabel? You seem really nice. Thank you, Thrasher, Clarabel said. You're nice too. I hope Dr. Knight doesn't give you a new brain. I hope it just washes the one you already have. Thrasher smiled, and Scapegrace hit him and turned back to Clarabel. The problem is, he said, is that we don't have anything to bargain with. We don't have money. We don't have property. We have no skills to speak of. So what's the point of even going to see it? It's only going to say no. It's only going to laugh at us and say no. Why should I go and see someone who's only going to laugh at me? Everyone laughs at me. The people in this town laughed at me for years. And that was even before I was a zombie. Clarabel turned to face him. I'm not laughing at you. I'm not laughing either, Thrasher said. Shut up, Thrasher! Scapegrace looked at Clarabel. I'm... I'm sorry. Being back here... Suddenly, all my old insecurities come to the surface again. I wasn't always the confident person you see before you. I had doubts. 
I wasn't the killer supreme. I wasn't the zombie king. I was just... Scapegrace. Well, Clarabel said, I think Scapegrace is a great guy. Do you believe in me? Clarabel frowned. I'm not sure. I've hallucinated before. That's how I met my first boyfriend. No, not do you believe I exist. I'm asking, do you believe in me? As a person? As a... a being? It'd be nice to hear that... to hear that someone believes in me. I believe in you, Vorian. Thank you. I believe in lots of silly things. Oh. That doesn't mean they're not important. Right. I believe you can do whatever you put your mind to. Really? I don't know what I'm saying anymore. She resumed her march towards the sanctuary. There was a man leaving just as they came to the door. He frowned at them. Can I help you? No, Clarabel said cheerily, and breezed by. Scapegrace and Thrasher kept their heads down and shuffled after her. A man and a woman emerged from the doorway, deep in conversation. They seemed to recognise Clarabel, and she asked them for directions, and then they continued on, with Clarabel singing, We're off to see the wizard. She led them through swinging doors into an operating room where a spider-like being was dissecting a corpse. Dr. Nye, Clarabel said. The spider-like being turned to them. Zombies, it said, mildly surprised. And a blue-haired girl. My name is Clarabel. I'm here looking for a job. A job? Yes. I have no medical or scientific training to speak of and no inclination to learn, and I pick things up fairly slowly because of my short attention span. Nye blinked its yellow eyes. That? But what? I'm waiting for you to list your good qualities now. Clarabel blinked back at him. Those were my good qualities. Clarabel, Clarabel, you worked as Ken Speckle Grouse's assistant, did you not? One of them. He fired all the others. But not you. He fired me on the second day, but I kept coming in. I'd nowhere else to go. And then you killed him. Yes. A remnant squirmed inside you, and you killed Ken Speckle Grouse. Yes. Nye grinned. You're hired. But I have to warn you, if you try to kill me, I will dissect you and sing along to your screams. Can I have Monday off? You may. Who are your friends? Scapegrace cleared his throat. My name is Vorian Scapegrace, Doctor. I have sought you out to cure me. To cure you of what? Of this accursed affliction. I cannot cure stupidity. Scapegrace frowned. I meant being a zombie. And why should I do this? Because it's a challenge worthy of your skills. I don't like challenges, Nye said dismissively. Do you have money? I like money. I don't have an awful lot. Do you have any? Scapegrace hesitated. No. Do you have any skills, then? Could you be of use to me? I honestly don't see how. Me neither. It looks like you're destined to remain a zombie until your brain rots in your skull, which, judging by the rate of your decomposition, should be in a year or so. Scapegrace stared. A year? I only have a year left? If you stay out of the sun. But, but that's terrible! Nye shrugged. It's not so bad for me. Scapegrace stumbled out of the sanctuary, aghast, and Thrasher ran out after him, an idiot. Clarabel was staying because Clarabel had a job now, and details needed to be ironed out and such like. But Scapegrace had just been handed a death sentence for the already dead. 
he stopped by the water's edge and looked out across the dark lake. What does it all mean? he asked aloud. Thrasher looked up at him and didn't answer. What is a life? Scapegrace continued. Is life merely living? Is it having a heartbeat? Or is life the effect you have on others? Is it the effect you have on the world around you? If so, what have I done with mine? How have I wasted it? Thrasher shook his head sadly. I was never that great a sorcerer. I can admit it now. My magic was never that powerful. But I thought my skills and my talents would make up for it. Even when I realized that I had no skills or talents to speak of, that still didn't stop me. I was the Killer Supreme, and then I became the Zombie King. That, I thought, was a life worth having. Thrasher nodded in agreement. But now? Now look at me. I barely have a face. Bits fall off me all the time. I have to keep them in jars in the ice cream van. Then I'm going to rot away to nothing within a year. You still have me, Thrasher said kindly. Scapegrace shoved him in the lake, then marched back towards the town. Unless I take action, unless I seize the day, Nye won't return me to life until I make it worth his while. Then I will make it worth his while. Thrasher splashed about. Scapegrace avoided the main street, went instead down one of the alleys between buildings until he came to a pub. The doors were chained shut, fastened by a rusted old padlock. He smashed the padlock with a rock and walked in. The place was dark and dusty. Thrasher scurried in wetly behind him. This will be my base of operations, Scapegrace said gravely. From here I will build my power, make my plans and convince Dr. Nye to return me to life. I have a year to do it, and by God, do it I shall. Thrasher applauded. Scapegrace pointed to a bar stool beside him. Sit there and don't annoy me. Thrasher hopped up onto the bar stool. Vorian, said a voice from behind. Scapegrace turned. A man walked in, tall but thick around the middle. His hair was silver, and he had a stern look in his eye. McGill? Scapegrace said. Taciturn McGill walked right up to him. Why are you here? How are you? Scapegrace smiled. How have you been? You're looking well. Better than me, anyway. But that's not hard. I'm a zombie. How are you? Why are you here, Vorian? I am... Um... Can I take it that you won't be staying? This bar is mine, Scapegrace said, losing the smile. McGill shook his head. You lost this establishment to Deadfall ten years ago. That was a gentleman's agreement, that was. I lost that bet and I handed everything over and I left without kicking up a fuss. I recall some crying. My point is, legal ownership never transferred. Technically, this place has always been mine. Now that Deadfall is dead, there's nothing to stop me from picking up where I left off. Actually, McGill said, there's plenty to stop you. We don't want you back, Vorian. Scapegrace blinked. What do you mean? Roarhaven is my home. It was your home. But even back then we didn't want you here. I have close ties to the community. You owe me money. That's one of my ties. It's not a lot of money, though. It certainly isn't enough for me to let you stay while you repay me. I've done great things for this town, Scapegrace protested. I was here when it all started. I brought the torment in. For God's sake, taciturn, please. I've got nowhere else to go. Look at me. I'm a zombie. We don't like zombies here. You don't like anything here. I'm looking for a cure. I think Dr. Nye can cure me. It works in the sanctuary. I know who Dr. Nye is. 
It can help me. Miguel, once I'm human again, I'll leave. I will. You'll never see me again. But for now, let me stay. Let me have my bar back. I won't cause any trouble, I promise. I know that if you say it's okay, then everyone else will say it's okay too. That's not how things work. What are you talking about? Of course it is. Not any more. There are things you don't know about, Vorin. What things? The people of this town will still do what you tell them, right? The torment changed all that. He started talking, himself and his friends. They started telling people about their big ideas. You think it's an accident the sanctuary was relocated here? You think that wasn't part of their plan? Part of whose plan? McGill sighed. Listen, Vorian. I've known you a long time. We're friends. We're not friends. But I've still known you a long time. If you stay here for a few weeks, I don't think anyone will object too loudly. Thank you, Taciturn. And I swear we'll only be here for a few months. A year, tops. Weeks, Vorian. Right. Yes. Try not to annoy anyone. And try to, you know, stay away from people. Nobody likes zombies. Scapegrace chuckled. <laughs> I know the feeling. You are a zombie. Yes, but I was talking about Thrasher. Who's Thrasher? Thrasher sat forward. Hello! McGill jerked away. Ah! How'd he do that? I didn't even see him there. I see some kind of ninja. No, Scapegrace said sadly. He just fades into the background really well. You have my word, McGill. We will not get into trouble. Thank you. Yeah, McGill said and stood up. Don't make me regret this. Of course I won't, Scapegrace said, crossing his fingers behind his back. He must have crossed them too hard, though, because one of them came loose and fell to the floor. He waited until McGill had walked out before picking it up, then trudged away to find some ice. Chapter 24 The Temple Siege At a little past noon, the first truck pulled up to the gates of the cemetery. The rear doors opened, and cleavers slipped out quietly. They moved in easy formation through the rows of graves to the crypt that acted as the entrance to the necromancer temple. One of them twisted the hemispheres of a cloaking sphere, and a bubble of energy rippled outwards. Once the bubble had expanded to the outskirts of the graveyard, the second truck arrived. More cleavers disembarked and took up positions around the perimeter. Wreath and Tenebrae watched the cleavers, viewing it all on a large screen broken into squares. Each of these squares was a different camera angle. The cameras wouldn't last long. But at least they gave an indication of what the necromancers were up against. From what Wreath could see, they were up against a lot. Men and women joined the cleavers, sorcerers of both elemental and adept magic, sanctuary agents, operatives, and detectives. These people didn't wear uniforms and didn't carry badges. Some of them were armed, some of them weren't. All had power coursing through their veins. Seven minutes after the first cleaver had stepped off the first truck, Wreath watched Valkyrie Kane follow Skullduggery Pleasant up the cracked path to the crypt. They stopped under a camera, looked right up into it. My name is Skullduggery Pleasant, the skeleton said, his voice coming loud and clear through the speakers. I have with me a warrant for the arrest of Melancholia Sinclair, to be charged with the assault of a sanctuary operative and detained by us until trial. If this door is not opened immediately, we will be forced to break it down. Pleasant waited a full five seconds, then nodded. Wreath's gaze flickered to another feed, as a battering ram was brought up, held by two cleavers, who swung it into the crypt door in a heavy rhythm. The screens went blank. So much for technology. The doors won't hold forever, Wreath said, as Quiver and Craven came in behind them. 
What about their teleporter? Tenebrae asked. Wreath shook his head. Fletcher Ran can only teleport to places he's been nor can see. He's never even seen inside the temple. Tenebrae sat back in his chair. Reinforcements? A dozen of our brothers and sisters are on their way from London, Wreath said. But whether they'll make it in time, I don't know. Tenebrae looked at Quiver. Our escape routes? Available, Quiver said in a steady, measured tone. For the moment, sanctuary operatives are covering over half of them, more than we thought they knew about. But there are still plenty we could use to evacuate key personnel. Speaking of key personnel, Tenebrae said, turning to Craven, how is she? Is she well enough to be moved? Craven took a deep breath, and for a long moment he didn't speak. Just before Tenebrae opened his mouth to demand a response, Craven nodded. She could make it if she had to, but I'd really rather keep her stationary. Her power ebbs and flows. If we can keep them out for five hours, maybe six, she should be back to full strength. Then we won't need to run anywhere. Wreath frowned at him. Six hours. They'd be lucky if they don't burst in here halfway through this conversation. The temple is not a fort. But it is well protected, Craven said, hands clasped and looking off somewhere beyond Wreath's elbow. It was a new habit Craven had picked up and Wreath didn't like it. It made Craven look like a holy man. Once the barricades are in place, we could collapse the tunnels and seal ourselves in. We don't want to seal ourselves in, Tenebrae said gruffly. We want an escape route. I understand, High Priest, but as I have said, once Melancholia regains her strength, we won't need to run. That. Cleric Craven is your opinion. Indeed it is, your eminence. And with all the humility may I remind you that it was I who guided Melancholia to the brink of the passage, without meaning to overstep my bounds one might think I was entitled to a little faith in return. I think, Tenebrae growled, that you have indeed overstepped your bounds. Craven bowed his head. My apologies, High Priest. With Craven's head still bowed, Tenebrae looked at Wreath. If we collapse the tunnels, Wreath said reluctantly, we could hold them off for twelve hours at the most. The barricades would need to be reinforced. We'd need to move people around. But make no mistake, we would be sealing ourselves in. If Melancholia doesn't regain her strength, it could be disastrous. The Deathbringer will be strong when we need her, Craven said solemnly. Tenebrae's jaw clenched. Cleric Wreath, see to it. Of course, your eminence. Wreath left the room, a plan of his own forming. He ignored the barricades for the moment and went deeper into the temple. Despite the alarming turn of events, there was still protocol to be followed, still rules to obey and pay heed to. Wreath, was a senior cleric with the ear of the high priest, but even he had to slow down and wait like everyone else if he wanted to see the director of storage. It was a mundane title that suggested pedantry and a multitude of lists, but the reality was much different. The director of storage was the person who oversaw and controlled equipment and food supplies, and as such he acted within a bubble of his own authority. Wreath was kept waiting almost ten minutes before he was told that the director would see him now. Cleric Bertrand Solus didn't bother to raise his eyes from the papers on his desk as Wreath walked in. He was a busy man. There was only one chair in the office, and Solus was sitting on it. Yes, Solus said, his pen scratching ink onto parchment. Why these people couldn't invest in a computer was beyond Reed's understanding. Sanctuary agents have us surrounded, Reed said. I am aware of the situation. To keep them out until the Deathbringer regains her strength, we need to collapse the auxiliary tunnels and barricade the main door. As I said, I am aware. 
but there is one tunnel that we do not know the location of. Finally, Solus's pen stopped scratching, and he raised his eyes. You have your own tunnel, Wreath continued. You use it to bring in supplies you don't want anyone to know about. I've never had a problem with this. You do your job well, and if sometimes you feel that you are best served by secrecy, who am I to say different? Why are you here? Solus asked. I don't want to collapse your tunnel. I want to use it. If things go bad, I want as many personnel as possible to get to safety. The Sanctuary agents know about some of our tunnels, but not all. I doubt they have any idea about a tunnel so secret that it doesn't even exist in any official capacity. It's not wide, said Solace, and it's long. If the temple is breached, you could use it to evacuate perhaps ten or twelve people at a time. Any more, and it will be discovered. Twelve people at a time, then. Reed said. The first of which shall be the Deathbringer, the White Cleaver, and ten senior clerics. Yourself included, of course. Where is the entrance? Solus regarded him with cautious, wary eyes. The small storage room below us, he said. The tunnel is two miles long. It emerges into a small warehouse the temple owns through three different subsidiaries. There are vehicles in the warehouse enough to take a substantial number to a safe house. Thank you very much for your cooperation, cleric, Reed said. If you'll excuse me, I have much to arrange. Solus waved him away, his pen already scratching as Reed left his office. Chapter 25 The Vivid Dead the world felt different to her now, ever since the surge. It even looked different, paler, more vague, less real. The people looked different, too. She could see, for the first time, how glassy and unfocused their eyes were, how translucent their skin. She thought, if she concentrated hard enough, that she'd be able to see through them to the underneath, to the blood and the veins and the bones. She wondered if that would reassure her that all this was real. She doubted it. The white cleaver was at the door. He stood like a statue, his scythe held in one hand. He was real to her. He was solid. He was as different to a zombie as humans were to apes, but he was still a dead thing, and as such... She didn't even have to look at him to know he was there. She could feel him. She didn't know how. She couldn't explain it. But while everyone else had become vague and distant, he was the one clear thing she could latch on to for comfort. The other man in the room, another guard, was so insubstantial he was almost a ghost. She'd spoken to him a few times, and before the surge he had appeared perfectly normal but she was seeing things differently now. She reached out with her mind, trying to sense him in the same way she sensed the white cleaver. She could feel her awareness expanding around her, moving out in all directions like a bubble. She felt emptiness, and the emptiness made her uneasy, tied a knot in her stomach. But still she expanded her awareness, searching for the man. He made a sound, his body stiffening, and he became real to her so suddenly that she pulled back in shock. The bubble of awareness retracted, and the man toppled. She knew he was dead. She could feel it before he hit the floor, and she pulled his death into her, absorbing it, letting it make her stronger. The white cleaver turned his head slightly to look at the dead necromancer but made no move other than that. Melancholia stared at the dead man, marvelling at how vivid he seemed now that he was dead. She reached out, touched his leg. He was so solid, she almost laughed. She wasn't alone. So long as there were dead people around her, she wasn't going to drown in a sea of uncertainty. Her heart felt lighter than it had all day. 
Chapter 26 Terminal 2 Skullduggery's phone rang, and Valkyrie stepped away while he answered it. Cleavers and sorcerers were gathered in groups around the cemetery. The largest group stationed at the crypt that housed the temple door. She wondered for a moment if Wreath was down there, and felt a stab of guilt that her side was taking action against his side. Then she thought about melancholia, and all feelings of guilt evaporated. Skullduggery put his phone away. A man answering Bison Dragonclaw's description was spotted in Terminal 2 at the airport a few minutes ago. Valkyrie made a face. His first name is Bison? He must be there to meet the reinforcements, Skullduggery continued. It stands to reason that the other necromancer temples around the world would send people over to help the Deathbringer. We'll have to take care of this ourselves. We will? Unless you want to stay here. I feel I have to warn you, though. We're probably not going to find a way past their barricades for another few hours. You're bored, aren't you? I need constant distraction. Shall we go? Uh, aren't you going to delegate responsibility or something? If you're not here, who's in charge? Skullduggery looked around and pointed to a sorcerer at the far side of the cemetery. He is. Who is he? Don't know. He looks like leadership material, though, doesn't he? Does he? He's wearing a hat. And that means he's a leader. Leaders wear hats. It's to keep the rain off while we make important decisions. He'll do fine. Shouldn't you tell him that he's in charge? And spoil the surprise? Skullduggery asked, and started towards the Bentley without waiting for an answer. Valkyrie sighed and followed. They left the Bentley on the second floor of the Terminal 2 car park and walked to the arrivals area. Skullduggery's facade had a small beard. It went well with the face. They caught sight of Dragonclaw almost immediately, dressed in black, thin, bald, with that ridiculously wispy goatee. He had his back to them, waiting with everyone else as passengers poured in. They moved up behind him waited for a big chair to go up somewhere to their left, and moved. Bison, Skullduggery said as he gripped his elbow. What a silly name for a skinny man. Dragonclaw's free hand went to his belt, but Valkyrie grabbed his wrist with both hands and stepped close to him. No public displays of magic, please, she said with a smile. Skullduggery leaned in. If you draw attention to your predicament... It will be most unfortunate. Not for us, but definitely for you. For you there will be a lot of pain involved, and crying, and squawking, and horrible sounds like breaking bones. You're not a fan of pain, are you, Bison? Of course you're not. You're a reasonable fellow, after all. Let's take a little walk, shall we? Away from the nice people? Still gripping each arm, they walked him from the crowd looking like an exceedingly odd family during a really awkward reunion. You'll regret this, Dragonclaw snarled. You'll regret standing against us. I'll make you regret it. You're in a bad mood, Skullduggery said. I understand. I do. You're saying things you don't really mean. It's okay. I'll kill you both. Hurtful things said in the heat of the moment. We're not going to hold it against you, Bison. We're all friends here. Valkyrie nodded. We love you, Bison. We do, Skullduggery agreed. You're our favourite necromancer. You're the cuddly one. Shut up, Dragonclaw said. Both of you just shut up. They paused to allow a large group of large people to pass by, and then, from nowhere, there was a flash of yellow jacket. Excuse me. Dragonclaw said loudly, and the cop stopped and looked at them. Can I help you? he asked. Valkyrie turned Dragonclaw's wrist painfully, and she felt Skullduggery apply pressure on his side. Dragonclaw yelped in pain, and the cop's eyes widened. We're looking for the toilets, Skullduggery said quickly. Our friend here isn't the best at holding it in, and sometimes he needs a little assistance. The cop nodded in understanding. Of course, yes, 
The toilets are right over there. See them? There they are, Valkyrie said brightly. Thank you so much. It would have been a mess. Dragonclaw hissed in pain as they hurried him away. Try anything like that again, Skullduggery told him, and you'll be talking to us with two broken arms. Whimper, if you understand. Dragonclaw whimpered. They got to the toilets. Valkyrie grabbed an out-of-order sign from a nearby cart and propped it up at the entrance. Skullduggery threw Dragonclaw against the wall and searched him while Valkyrie checked that each of the stalls was empty. Skullduggery pulled Dragonclaw's knife from his belt, then took a scrap of paper from Dragonclaw's pocket and passed it to Valkyrie. On it was a time and a number. The flight he's waiting on has already landed, he said. They both looked at Dragonclaw. How many coming? Dragonclaw rubbed his arm and sneered. I don't know what you're talking about. Skullduggery shook his head. I would love to have a battle of wits with you, Bison, but I doubt it would be a fair fight. Shut your face! Exactly my point. So, if you think we're going to trade banter or get into wordplay or anything like that, I'm afraid I have to disappoint you. Instead, we're going to be very simple and very direct, because we obviously don't have a lot of time. How many are coming? And before you try another sneer, please understand that I will inflict pain if you fail to answer. Save yourself the bother, Valkyrie said. You're going to tell us anyway, and you know you are, so why get hurt? Why not skip it to the end? Dragonclaw looked at them for a long time before shaking his head. No, I'm not a traitor. Yes, you are, Valkyrie said. You just don't know it yet. Dragonclaw stood up straight, chin stuck out defiantly towards Skullduggery. If you're going to hit me, hit me. I haven't got all... Valkyrie wrapped her knuckles right on his chin. Dragonclaw's eyes bulged and his knees quivered. Then he fell backwards to the wall and slid down to the floor. Skullduggery looked at her and she shrugged. You'd have knocked his teeth out or something, she said. All I did was give him a little brain shake. She looked down. Bison... Bison, can you hear me? How many are coming? I'll never tell. The plane landed ten minutes ago, Skullduggery said to her. If we're lucky, they're only just starting to disembark. You need to get to them before they clear customs. Valkyrie's eyebrows shot up. What? Me? Alone? I need to ask Bison some questions about getting into the temple. He'll be fine. How am I supposed to get by the security section? I don't have a ticket. Skullduggery cocked his head. Valkyrie, you've got magical powers. If you can't get through airport security, then I have failed in whatever capacity I have as a mentor. She glowered. Fine. What do I do when I find them? You need to delay them for a few hours at least. And how do I do that? They'll be very serious people wearing black. It won't take much for the police to stop them for a chat. Go on now. Still glowering, Valkyrie left the toilets and walked to the departure gates. The queue wasn't very long. She followed an old couple and a businessman through the cordoned off section. The businessman was obviously in a hurry, and the old couple weren't moving fast enough for his taste. He muttered and sighed and cursed under his breath, loud enough for them to hear. Valkyrie didn't like him. His passport and ticket were in his jacket pocket. She gripped the air and pulled it back the ticket slipping into her hand. The old couple showed their tickets to the woman at the desk and passed through. Valkyrie took the opportunity to wave the businessman's ticket to the woman while the businessman cursed loudly as he searched his pockets. The woman nodded to her and Valkyrie smiled, left the ill-tempered man to his bluster and frustration and approached the metal detectors. Even if she'd been hiding a dozen guns on her, the clothes would have shielded them all. She walked through and strode on. She passed through the duty-free shops, resisting the sudden urge to check out the sunglasses on offer. On the other side of the glass wall, travellers walked in the opposite direction, having just arrived. That's where Valkyrie needed to be. There were a few staff-only doors she could have tried to sneak through, but she didn't know where they led, and she didn't have the luxury of trial and error. 
The only way she was guaranteed to get where she needed to be was to get out onto the tarmac and then come back in through an arrivals door. She reached the departure gates. Three flights were boarding. She went to the huge windows that looked out onto the tarmac. Only one of those flights didn't have a walkway that connected to the door of the aircraft. She joined that crowd as they showed their passports and filtered through. She smiled at a man and he let her in front of him. Then she waved her hand slightly and all the papers on the flight attendant's desk fluttered into the air. The attendant grabbed at them as Valkyrie slipped by unnoticed. She took the steps down, following the passengers out of the building. Another attendant directed them to the pedestrian pathway that led to the plane. She was wearing a nice hat. Valkyrie waved her hand, less gently this time, and the hat flew off the attendant's head. Valkyrie turned sharply, heading for the door further on. A man in uniform frowned at her. Are you supposed to be here? Yes, she smiled. I got delayed. She went to walk by him, but he stepped in her path. Are you sure? What flight did you come in on? Heathrow, she said. I don't know the number of the plane, sorry. It was a big one, though. The plane, not the number. Though the number was pretty big, too. He held up a hand. Could you hold on a minute? I'm going to have to call someone. Sure. She beamed a smile at him as he took his radio from his belt. I bet your job's fun. Pardon me? Being around airplanes and everything, meeting exotic people, having a radio and a holster. I bet it's really fun. Did you have to do any special training for it? Uh, yes. Excuse me, I have to call this in. Sure. My name's Valerie, by the way. I'm going to call my boss, all right? Why? Did you do something wrong? What? No, it's not for me, it's for you. Valkyrie's face fell. What did I do? You shouldn't be here. But the plane landed here. I mean, you shouldn't be here, you shouldn't be standing here, you should be further on. Oh, she said and laughed. Sorry. God, I'm so dumb. We'll get it sorted out, don't worry. His radio clicked and he spoke into it. Anthony, it's Sean. I'm down here with... Hey! Valkyrie walked by him, and he caught up with her. Where are you going? She blinked at him. You said I shouldn't be here. Yeah, but I'm just going to where I should be. Just hold on a second. Am I in trouble? No, you're not, but... Are you going to arrest me? Arrest you? No. I just got lost. I got off the plane, and there were so many people. Please don't arrest me. Listen to me. I'm not going to arrest you, okay? I'm not a cop. Are you sure? Am I sure I'm not a cop? Yes, I'm sure. You might be undercover. I still think I'd know if I were a cop, though. I work for the airline. I'm not a guard. I just work here. Okay, she said, and breathed out. Sorry. I panic sometimes. It's fine. Were you travelling alone? No, there were other people on the plane. I mean, are you travelling with someone, a friend or a family member? Oh, no just me. Where do I collect my bag? At the luggage section. Do you know where that is? Is it up those stairs? It is. First you come to passport control, then you pick up your luggage, and then you exit customs. Valkyrie smiled. Thank you. You've been really helpful. He nodded. Sure. Just try not to get delayed again, okay? I'll do my best, she laughed, and skipped up the stairs. She moved on without encountering anybody else. Passport control was quiet. Directly opposite her, across the open floor, was a glass wall, and beyond that she could see a crowd of people who had just passed through. Among the bright shirts and colourful dresses and blue jeans, there were people in black, some in jackets, some in coats, some carrying bags and some not, walking apart so as not to attract attention. Necromancers. She peered around the door to her right, where two cops were sitting in booths, chatting across to each other as they waited for the next influx of travellers. Valkyrie darted to the empty booth closest to her, using the air to rise over the barricade. She dropped gently to the other side and ran, crouched over. She sneaked behind the booths where the cops were sitting, and out into the corridor. Now she sprinted after the crowd of passengers. She caught up with the ones lagging behind, the ones for whom this long walk was just proving too much. They puffed and wheezed with red faces, fat droplets of sweat running down their cheeks, 
travel cases trundling along behind like sulky children. She ran under the sign that pointed to the luggage retrieval area. She doubted the necromancers would have any bags to collect. They weren't here for a holiday, after all. She barged through a small group of people, got to the top of the stairs, and leaped. People around her cried out in alarm, but she didn't have time to waste. She waited until the last moment to cushion her landing, hit the ground, and rolled. She ignored the disapproving headshakes, immediately catching sight of the necromancers on the far side of the baggage belts. She took off, using the air to nudge people from her path. She jumped onto a conveyor belt that wasn't moving, slid across the highest point, and jumped down the other side. An airport official stepped into her path, and she jammed her hand against his chest. His cheeks bulged, and he stumbled back as she vaulted onto the next conveyor belt. This one was moving, full of luggage. She almost tripped, but made it to the centre and scrambled over to the other side, leaped off and into a crowd of startled civilians. The necromancers hadn't noticed the commotion. She ran to intercept them as they headed for the exit, coming to a sharp halt in front of the necromancer leading the march. The necromancers stopped, each one of them suspicious. Valkyrie held up a hand while she doubled over. Sorry, she gasped. Let me get my breath back. She didn't try to move around her. Their eyes were on the ring on her finger. You have instructions? the lead necromancer asked. She breathed deeply in through the nose, out through the mouth, and straightened. Yes, she said. You're not needed. You're to go home. High priest Tenebrae sent a student to tell us this. She nodded and shrugged. What happened? Is the Deathbringer okay? False alarm, she said. Wasn't the Deathbringer... Just a girl, looking for attention. You're to go home at once, and sorry for the inconvenience. Naturally, we refund your airfare. A female necromancer frowned at her. Who instructs you in the temple? I'm not really in the temple that much, Valkyrie said, her breathing under control now. Solomon Reith is my mentor. Oh, the woman said. Well, that would explain the lack of formality. Even so, said the lead necromancer, Cleric Ree thought to know better than to send a student with information like this. If the high priest wishes us to return to London, he can send someone of higher rank to tell us. They went to walk by her, but Valkyrie jumped in front of them again. Actually, no, she said. He was quite insistent. Everyone's busy. Sanctuary agents are everywhere and they're putting pressure on and all the clerics have their hands full and... The lead necromancer glared at her. Step aside, girl. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw the airport official she had shoved. He was jogging over, flanked by two cops. Fine, she said to the lead necromancer. I'm not a necromancer. My name's Valkyrie Kane. I work with Skullduggery Pleasant, and I'm here to tell you that we're about to drag the Deathbringer into custody, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. The necromancers stared, and almost as one, they reached for her, anger flashing across their faces. Then the cops were there, standing between them. That's her, the official said. That's the girl who hit me. I'm sorry, Valkyrie said to the cops looking as frightened as she could. I lagged behind. They don't like it when I lag behind. The cops frowned at her, then turned to the necromancers. Is she with you? The first cop asked. The lead necromancer scowled. No, I've never seen her before. You can keep her. He went to walk on, but the cops blocked his way. Just hold on a minute there, until we get this sorted out. She's dressed the same as you. So? It's a little odd, isn't it? Not for us. It's like a uniform, Valkyrie said, making her voice shake. They make us wear black. It's for the church. The second cop looked back at her. Everyone here is part of a church? She nodded. We call it a church, yes. Other people call it a cult. I shouldn't be talking to you. They don't like it when I talk to outsiders. They're afraid I'll tell people about their plans. 
The cops turned to the necromancers, and the airport official backed away. Well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to come with us, the first cop said, just to answer a few questions. That won't be possible, the lead necromancer said. We have somewhere to be. I'm afraid I have to insist. The lead necromancer ignored him, turning his eyes to Valkyrie. Are you sure you want to do this? In front of all these people? In front of security cameras? Because we'll do it. The world is about to change. We could start that change right here and now. That sounded like a threat, the second cop said. I wasn't talking to you. Yeah, the cop said. But I was talking to you. Valkyrie hadn't even noticed the movement in the crowds of people. But suddenly there were four more cops surrounding the necromancers, done up in tactical gear and carrying automatic weapons. The necromancers stiffened. Unlike elementals and other adepts, the necromancers kept most of their magic in objects. But right now, their weapons were in their bags and pockets, and any move to get them would result in extreme violence. Valkyrie backed away as the cops issued orders. The necromancers glared at her, and she smiled back, slipping away through the crowd that had formed around them. She hurried to the doors, emerging into the arrivals area as more cops ran through to help their comrades. She rejoined Skullduggery and a handcuffed dragon claw, and they walked quickly for the exit. You handled it? Skullduggery asked. I did. I could have used your help. Nonsense. You're more than capable of doing these things yourself. Were there many necromancers? Twelve or so. If they're not escorted directly onto a flight home, I'd say, at the very least, they're not going to be let near their weapons for another few hours. By which point we should have broken into the temple. Well done, Valkyrie. You are good. Yes, I am. What about Bison here? Did he have anything interesting to say? Indeed he did, Skullduggery said, his false mouth smiling. He knows of a top-secret supply tunnel that leads right into the depths of the temple, and he's going to take us there. Aren't you, Bison? Dragonclaw sagged. How sweet, Valkyrie said. You've made a friend. Chapter 27 Into the Temple the warehouse was dark. Three jeeps and two trucks were parked under a thick layer of dust. Dragonclaw led them to the centre of the floor and stopped. You'd better not be lying to us, Skullduggery said, his gun out. I swear, Dragonclaw responded. Director Solus used to have me guarded when supplies were brought in through here. Only a few people know about it. He stepped on a pebble, put all his weight on it, and the floor beside him opened up, revealing steps leading down. Skullduggery motioned for him to go first, and they followed him into a long stone corridor lit by bare bulbs. This leads directly to the temple? Skullduggery asked. Dragonclaw nodded. There's a door with a lever at the other end. It opens up into a room nobody ever uses. It's how Solus transports all his best stuff. No passwords needed? Nothing like that? No. You just pull the lever. Good to know, Skullduggery said, then smacked him with the gun. Dragonclaw spun and fell to the ground unconscious. Valkyrie glared. You could have warned me. Of what? Skullduggery asked, his arm encircling her waist. They lifted off the ground, started moving down the corridor. That you were going to hit him. It'd be nice to be told these things. Did it give you a fright? They were picking up speed now, and Valkyrie's hair was being blown off her face. A little one, yeah, she said. You were standing there all normal, and then you hit him. I jumped. I do apologize. Just a little warning, that's all I ask. In my defense, if I had told you that I intended to hit him, he probably would have overheard the conversation. Then we should come up with a code or something. The bulbs were blurring into one long stream of light above them. We already have a code, Skullduggery said. It's be brave. Valkyrie scowled at him. 
Be brave is nothing. Be brave is you telling me to trust you. You have a plan when we're surrounded by enemies. Be brave tells me nothing other than you're about to do something stupid. We should have another code for when you're about to hit someone. Very well. How about the sparrow flies south for winter? Seriously. What's wrong with it? It's a classic. And how would you work that into the conversation? With my usual aplomb. So, if that had been our code, and Dragonclaw had just told you that all we have to do is pull the lever, how would you have worked the sparrow flies south for winter into the conversation? I would have said, OK, Bison, so you're sure we only need to pull a lever? And he would have said yes, and I'd have said, excellent, thank you. Did you know, by the way, that the sparrow flies south for winter? And then I'd have punched him. I'm going to do my best to ignore the ridiculous things you say from now on, Valkyrie decided. What are we going to do when we get into the temple, anyway? Are we going to fight our way through the necromancers on our own? No. We're going to find a way to let our friends in, and we let them fight while we stand by and look smug. I like that plan. It has its moments. They slowed as they neared the end of the corridor, touched down onto solid ground, and Valkyrie reluctantly stepped away. She loved the sensation of flying, but it did make walking seem absurdly clumsy. Skullduggery pulled the small iron lever set into the wall, and the bulbs went out as the door swung open. They crept out into darkness. It was colder here. It was always cold in the temple. We should be on the main level, Skullduggery whispered but I'd say we're half a kilometre from the antechamber. Valkyrie's eyes were adjusting to the gloom as Skullduggery searched through stacks of boxes and supplies. He made an amused sound and threw something to her. We're going to need to fit in. It was a robe. She put it on. The sleeves were gigantic and swallowed her arms. She pushed them back to her elbows and then pulled up the hood. It wasn't as easy as it looked, getting the hood to sit just right. It kept falling down over her face. Finally, she got it to where it would stay up and turn to Skullduggery. He stood there, the black robe flowing around him, his skull barely visible beneath the hood. Good God, she breathed. You look like the Grim Reaper. I'll take that as a compliment. It wasn't meant as one. I'm taking it anyway. You're a regular visitor here. Any advice on how we should proceed? She shrugged. If anyone stops us, as long as we mumble something pretentious about the glory of death, we should be fine. Excellent. They left the storage room, moving quickly but quietly. Valkyrie's heart sped up when two necromancers hurried by, but they were too busy panicking about the sanctuary forces outside to notice them. Occasionally she would recognise something and nudge Skullduggery to alter their course, but for the most part she hadn't a clue where they were. On all of her trips through the temple, she hadn't really been paying attention. Wreath had been the one to lead the way, and she'd been happy enough to follow along, continuing whatever conversation they were having without bothering to acquaint herself with her surroundings. She was regretting that now. Hey! said a voice behind them. You! They stopped. Valkyrie glanced at Skullduggery, and they turned. A necromancer stalked over to them, his hood down off his head. It was that man, oblivious or something, the one who hadn't wanted to let them in a few days ago. Where do you think you're going? He ranted. We have our orders. You think they don't apply to you? You think just because our enemies are massing at the gates we should abandon our posts? Is that what you think? Uh, Skullduggery said. The stream of death carries us where it may. That may be true, Oblivious said curtly. But we are still bound by the oaths we swore. Or have you forgotten them? Skullduggery shook his head beneath his hood. My duty is to death, but death's duty is to itself. As of life, as of death, as of the stream between. Oblivious frowned. What? In the stream of life. We are but paddlers. 
I'm not sure I... Who are you? Let me see your face. Skullduggery looked around, made sure no one else was coming. The sparrow flies south for winter, he said, and punched Oblivious right on the chin. He looked up at Valkyrie as he dragged the unconscious necromancer into the nearest room. See? It's a perfect code. We're paddling in the stream of life? Skullduggery came back out, shutting the door behind him. I'm not very good at being pretentious. It's one of my few flaws. But there's no denying that code worked. And you slipped it into the conversation seamlessly. They carried on, managing to avoid the panicking necromancers. Finally, Skullduggery took Valkyrie's arm, pulled her into a dark corner, and nodded ahead. If I'm right, he said, the door mechanism is in there. If the door isn't unlocked in the correct way, an alarm will sound. The door won't open, and everyone will come running. So you're going to have to stay here. If I were you, I'd find somewhere to hide. This may take a while. She raised an eyebrow at him. You realize, he said, that you're wearing a hood and I can't see your face, so if you're glaring at me, or scowling, or raising an eyebrow, I have no way of knowing. You realize that, right? Why, said Valkyrie, do I have to stay here? Because what I'm going to do is extremely dangerous. So is everything you drag me into. Your point being... What is up with everyone? Fletcher wants to protect me, Kaelin wants to protect me, now you. For God's sake, I can handle what's thrown at me, all right? I don't need to be kept safe all the bloody time. I see, Skullduggery said. Well, you make a very good point, and I can't argue with your logic. Except I'm not trying to protect you. If I try to open the door and fail... Then I'm going to need someone else to do it once they've killed me. You see? Oh, said Valkyrie. Oh, right. Now, if I fail, the odds are that you'll fail too. And if they can kill me, they can most certainly kill you, in an undoubtedly horrible manner. But by then I'll be past caring. So you really aren't trying to protect me? Skullduggery placed a hand on her shoulder. Not even remotely, he said warmly. He moved off. Valkyrie waited a moment, then backed away, turned, and hurried in the opposite direction. She rounded a corner and immediately stepped back. Solomon Wreath passed without looking at her. She chewed her lip and followed. She kept her head down as they walked the corridors. He disappeared through a door, and she quickened her pace, following him in. A hand grabbed her, tore the hood from her head, and shoved her further into the room. She hit the wall and spun, Wreath's cane stopping right before it met her face. His eyes widened. Valkyrie, he said surprised. Hi, Solomon, she responded. You said if I ever needed to chat. He lowered the cane and stepped back. Closed the door before anyone saw. How did you get in? Dragon claw, she said. Wreath sighed. Oh, um, I assume Skullduggery is with you. He's around here somewhere. Then things are probably going to get very loud very soon. More than likely. In that case, Wreath said, now that we have a minute... I'd just like to say that I'm sorry for what happened. If I'd known, if I'd even suspected that melancholia might go after you, I would have... You would have what? Valkyrie asked. Grounded her? What could you have done? Everyone's saying she's more powerful than anyone alive today. If she wants to slice me half to death, she's going to slice me half to death, and there's nothing anyone can do about it. Wreath shook his head. This isn't how it should be. You're right. She should be on a leash. No, I mean she shouldn't have this power. It should have been you. At least it would have come naturally to you. What do you mean? Wreath rubbed his face. He suddenly looked very tired. Craven did something to her. 
He's been studying the languages of magic for years. He can't be as expert in the art as China Sorrows, but he'll be good nonetheless. You've seen the scars on her face, right? They're all over her body. He says they're to protect her, but I think he carved those symbols into her skin to heighten her power during the surge. Is that possible? In theory. Of course, it's highly dangerous and extraordinarily unstable. If that is indeed what he did, he stood a higher chance of killing her than succeeding. But you think he did succeed? Yes, I do. It doesn't matter, of course. All the Deathbringer is, all it ever has been, is a necromancer with a certain degree of power. No matter how she got there, Melancholia does seem to have reached that level. She said something while she was kicking my ass. She said, If you're not on my list, you don't get saved. I doubt she was making any sense at all. With that much power reverberating inside her head, I think we can expect her to babble every now and then. What is the passage? I'm sorry, Valkyrie. There are things we don't share with... Solomon, for God's sake, you never give a straight answer to that. Yet it's supposed to be a wonderful thing where the world is saved and made a better place. Why do you need to keep any of that a secret? Because some people aren't going to understand. What people? People who like being miserable? I'm sure they'll get over it. What's she going to do? What happens in the passage? The walls are broken down. Between life and death, yes, I know, that much you've told me. The energy of the dead will live alongside us, and we will evolve to meet it. That's what you said. I haven't a clue what that means, but that's what you said. We're going to evolve, are we? In a manner of speaking. Solomon, you have the Deathbringer. Whatever is going to happen is going to happen, so why not just tell me? Should I be worried? How much will the world change? Will everyone know about it? Will my family suddenly know that magic exists? Will people still have jobs? Will we still live in houses? Will people still be people? It will be better. That's all you need to know. No, Solomon, it isn't. The fact is, it's a pretty scary prospect. It's made even scarier by the fact that not even your average necromancer knows what's going to happen. Only you guys. Only the high priests and the high clerics. Only the people who run the temples. Why don't you tell the others? What is so awful that you have to hide it from your own people? Wreath looked at her. How much is a better world worth to you? What do you mean? I mean, what would you sacrifice? Look at this world. Look at it. From the moment mankind took its first awkward step, it's been a long road to disaster. We hate each other. We fear each other. We're going to kill each other. One of these days, someone's going to go too far, and every single one of us will die. What do you care? You're a necromancer. Life flows into death and flows back into life, right? That's what you believe. That's what we believe, yes. But it's not what we want. Valkyrie frowned. What? Our souls, our life force, flow through that never-ending stream. But not our minds, not our memories. When I die, my essence will move on. But this man you see before you, this mind, this personality, this being, will be gone. I'll become something else, someone else. But it won't be me. You're... you're scared of death. We all are. But you're necromancers. You embrace death. We study necromancy because we're trying to defeat death. That's what this is all about, Valkyrie. This is all it's ever been about. So what does this mean? You want Melancholia to break down the walls between life and death so that you'll never have to die? What was all that about evolution? We will evolve to meet the dead, or whatever it was. Society will evolve. It'll have to. Evolve or perish. We figure it's worth the risk. Solomon, what the hell is going on? What does the passage mean? The energy stream that flows through this world, 
this reality. It links up with the next reality, and the next, and it loops around again. It's a natural force and a natural system. Okay, so? So we want to stop it. We want those alive today to remain alive forever. So no one dies? What about new life? What about babies being born? No life leaves, no life enters. Valkyrie stared at him, and immediately thought of Alice. You can't do that. Are you insane? You can't do that. Society will adapt to the new way of living. No more babies. Solomon, come on, that's nuts. It's a biological need. Having children is a biological need only because we are mortal. Even sorcerers. We die, and we know we're going to die, and so we have children. To continue our bloodline, to continue our legacy, to try to ensure our own immortality. But when we are immortal, we won't have that need to procreate. That's... My God, Solomon, please tell me that you know this isn't right. He sighed. This is the kind of reaction we feared. People aren't going to accept this. The whole world will be after you. No, not the whole world. Half the world. What? In order to stop death, we have to block the flow. We have to damn the energy stream. And how are you going to do that? We need a massive influx of souls. You mean you're going to need a lot of people to suddenly die? Yes. Their life forces will block the stream. Overloaded. Cutting it off. Forever. How many? How many people? Wreath shook his head. I wish you hadn't asked me these things. How many people, Solomon? It would have been so much better if you hadn't asked me. She's going to kill them? That's what the Deathbringer does? Valkyrie pushed Wreath, her palm against his chest. She kills all these people? That's the passage? She pushed him again. How many people? How many? For God's sake, just tell me how many people she's going to have to kill. She pushed him again, but this time he caught her wrist and raised his eyes to look at her. Three billion ought to do it. Valkyrie broke free, spun, sprinted for the door. A wave of shadows crashed into her and sent her to the wall. The shock rattled her body, but when she fell, she managed to keep her feet under her. She pushed at the air and Wreath snapped his cane, deflecting her aim. A tendril of shadow came from nowhere, wrapped around her throat, yanked her back. She staggered, used her ring to cut the tendril, and then the cane came for her face and met her jaw. She was on the ground then, trying to focus, trying to look up as Reet's boot came swinging in, and she went spinning into darkness. Chapter 28 A Vile History Valkyrie woke in a large room with no furniture to find Skullduggery crouching down and peering at her. She groaned. Her face hurt. Her head pounded. Her hands were shackled behind her. Wreath, she croaked. I know, said Skullduggery. What did I tell you about wandering off? Why don't you ever do anything I say? If I didn't know any better... I would swear that you feel a compulsion to disobey authority figures. That can't be what it is, she said. Well, that's what it seems like. But I don't view you as an authority figure. Oh, not this again. Valkyrie sat up, slowly. Are you going to lecture me all day, or are you going to get these shackles off me? I'm inclined to lecture you. She sighed, turned her back to him waited for him to start picking the lock. Ah, uh, he said. Exactly what do you think is going on right now? She frowned over her shoulder at him. What do you mean? Skullduggery, I've got a headache. Wreath kicked me in the face. He kicked me in the face. It hurts. So get these shackles off me and we'll go find him and I'll kick him in the face. 
Then you kick him in the face. Then I'll do it again. We'll take turns. It'll be fun. It would be fun, Skullduggery nodded. I like kicking Wreath in the face. I haven't had a chance to do it nearly as much as I'd like. See? So come on, stop delaying. I wish I could. Valkyrie shook her head and managed to get to her feet. Skullduggery stood beside her. So what are you doing? she asked. Teaching me a lesson? Is that what this is? Indeed it is, he said brightly. Okay, lesson learned. I shouldn't wander off. Got it. Skullduggery's head nodded happily. Excellent. Now get these shackles off me. I can't. Why can't you? Skullduggery turned, showing her the shackles that bound his own wrists. Her eyes widened. You got captured too. It's the only way you learn. You got captured on purpose. Don't be silly. When I triggered the alarm, I did my level best to run away. But I couldn't find you, so... Ah, she said. Sorry. Oh, it's fine, he shrugged. I managed to punch some necromancers, which is always fun. What was less fun was when they started punching me back. And then the White Cleaver arrived and joined in. It was, if I do say so, an epic battle, but I was heavily outnumbered. It's a pity you slept through it. I was unconscious. You were asleep. Don't annoy me, okay? I have a headache. How are we going to get out of here? Oh, escape is easy once you have the right plan. Do we have the right plan? Not yet. Do we have any plan? Not yet. Typical. Still, silver lining. Wreath told me what the passage is. Oh? They're going to kill three billion people to stop the other three billion from ever dying. Skullduggery hesitated. That, I'll be honest, doesn't sound too great for the first three billion. Can they do it? Is it possible? Theoretically, yes, Skullduggery said. I doubt they have much in the way of hard facts to support this theory, but who needs facts when you have faith? So they could be killing three billion people, and it'd have no effect whatsoever on the lifespan of the others? Very possibly. Of course, I think we can both agree that killing three billion people anyway, no matter what the supposed benefits might actually be, would still be a bad thing to do. Oh, Valkyrie said with a nod, we are very much agreed on that one. But you're right. Silver lining. At least we know what their ultimate goal is. Now we can work to foil it. The door opened behind them, and High Priest Tenebre stepped in. They stopped talking, and observed him as he smiled. Ah, he said, the awkward silence. He closed the door behind him. How are you, Valkyrie? Things have changed greatly since the last time we spoke, have they not? It's all very unfortunate. I don't know how you could have thought that I would ever have been the Deathbringer, she said. Did you honestly believe I'd be willing to kill billions of people for a theory? The passage isn't a theory, dear girl. It's an inevitability. We know it's a lot to accept. We know you don't understand. That's why we sent Dragonclaw to keep it a secret for as long as possible. But now that it's out in the open, now that we can have a conversation about it, yes, actually, we did think you would have been willing to kill billions of people, given enough time, of course. If you had chosen necromancy over elemental magic, which was a distinct possibility, this would have been the first schism to form between yourself and your skeletal mentor here. And once we had our hooks in you, really got them in there, you would have been ours, and you would have understood. We would have slowly opened your eyes to the truth and the glory of the passage. I still wouldn't have killed those people. Well, that's rather a moot point at this stage, isn't it? Because now we have Melancholia. She wouldn't have been my first choice, I admit, but she is dedicated and she is passionate. These qualities count for something. 
She's unstable, Skullduggery said. You can't even keep her under control, for God's sake. She's young, Tenebrae shrugged. Impetuous. Yes, she went after Valkyrie the first chance she got, but that was nothing more than childish spite. Nothing to worry about, really. We're all young once, aren't we, Skullduggery? Remember the adventures we got into when we were young men? Valkyrie frowned. You knew each other. He didn't tell you. We used to be friends. Friends is such a strong and misleading word, Skullduggery said. Tenebrae smiled. Acquaintances, then. In the early days of the war, before the Necromancer Order withdrew from the conflict, we fought side by side, didn't we, Skullduggery? If by side by side you mean I was always in front, then yes, Sauron, we did. Not that it has any bearing on what is going on today. Really? I would have thought that you of all people would know the effect the past has on the present. But then you've lied to yourself about so many things. Why should this be any different? Now this, Skullduggery said, should be interesting. Tenebrae looked at Valkyrie. He's quite an angry man, isn't he? It's why his enemies are so scared of him, I suppose. I would even venture so far as to say it's why you're still alive. Don't misunderstand me, Valkyrie. You are becoming a capable sorcerer and a formidable opponent in your own right. But there are plenty of people out there who would love to kill you and could do so relatively easily. The idea, however, that to kill you would incur the wrath of the skeleton detective is, in my opinion, the only reason you still draw breath. I hope you're not offended. Valkyrie looked back at him and didn't say anything. But there is a common misconception that must be addressed here and now, Tenebrae continued. The legend of Skullduggery Pleasant is that his wife and child were murdered and he returned, fueled by rage and a need for vengeance. A nice legend. Romantic. Intimidating. Ticks all the boxes that a legend should tick. Naturally, the only ingredient missing is the truth. Please, Skullduggery said. Enlighten us. You were always an angry man, Tenebrae said. When you were alive, you just hid it better. Hid it from your loving wife and your loving child. But I saw it on the battlefield. That's when you allowed it to surface. That's when you allowed the real you to appear. I must tell you, Aaron, that amateur psychoanalysts do not impress me. I wouldn't expect them to, but I have proof. I had a theory and I tested it, and my suspicions were confirmed. Valkyrie, Solomon Wreath told me that when you were fighting the Faceless Ones, you used his cane. Is that correct? Yes, Valkyrie said. He told me to. Of course he did. If he hadn't given you permission, the moment you tried to use it, the power inside would have killed you. You took that cane and you used that necromancer power instinctively and without training, and he saw in you a great potential, the same potential I saw in Skullduggery all those years ago. Skullduggery tilted his head. What are you talking about? Remember Prasha? This was a few months after you were married. Mevelin's people had raided the necromancer temple where I was studying. I was one of the only survivors, and we linked up with you and your team and tracked the raiding party across the mountains. I remember, Skullduggery said. It took us three weeks to catch up with them. Morwina Crow was with us. That's right. My dear Morwina, the only necromancer to serve on the Council of Elders. Yes, she was a fellow survivor. I spent most of the time talking to her. I don't think you and I exchanged more than five words. Tenebrae nodded. One of the closest friendships I've ever had. You're a sad little man. Tenebrae laughed. Regardless, we tracked the raiding party and we caught up with them. We waited and we attacked. In the battle, I was injured. You were injured. All of us were injured, but we kept fighting. I had dropped the dagger that housed my power. 
I was bleeding, tired, the dagger was just out of reach, and there, lumbering towards me, was the biggest ogre I'd ever seen. Twelve foot tall, green skin, dressed in stitched leathers with tusks as big as my arm. He was half that size, Skullduggery said, and he didn't have tusks, he just had really bad teeth. Also, he wasn't an ogre. His name was Jeremy. You really know how to spoil a good story, Tenebre said. I was on my back, looking up, so he appeared to be a twelve-foot-tall ogre. One thing you cannot argue with is the size of the axe he was swinging. It was a big axe, Skullduggery conceded. Bigger than any I had ever seen. Oh, for God's sake. And just before that axe split my skull and found my brains, Valkyrie, Skullduggery staggered into view. He fell, reached out, grabbed my dagger, and sent fifty spears of darkness into the ogre's chest. Skullduggery said nothing. I hadn't given him permission, Tenebrae said. That power should have torn him apart. But he controlled those shadows, instinctively and without training, and when Jeremy the ogre was dead, Skullduggery dropped the dagger and went looking for the next enemy to kill. Tenebrae looked at Skullduggery. From that moment, I knew you were special. I knew I would need to keep an eye on you. A few years later, we necromancers retreated to our temples and fortified our positions. We decided to let the rest of the world fight amongst themselves. But not everyone respected our neutrality. Nefarian Serpine, in particular, seemed disinclined to leave us alone. He surrounded the temple I was in, threatened us with utter destruction unless we shared some of our secrets. The high priest chose me to be the one to venture out and teach Serpine what he wanted to know. The red right hand, Valkyrie said. Tenebrae gave the slightest of nods. Agonizing death inflicted by merely pointing at your victim, providing he was within range. Serpine had heard about it, and he wanted it. I taught him. During our lessons we talked. He made clear his hatred of you, Skullduggery. He said you were the reason he was doing this. To be frank, I couldn't allow that. You had such potential. I couldn't allow this religious fanatic to kill you, so I altered what I was teaching. I added a little something. If ever this necromancer power was used against you specifically, it wouldn't be the end. Your soul, your being, would be forever tied to your body. If I had known he was going to burn your corpse and reduce you to a mere skeleton, I probably would have taken that into consideration. Skullduggery's voice was empty. You brought me back. No. I merely allowed for the opportunity. You brought yourself back, Skullduggery. Through sheer force of will, your soul regained its consciousness. From there, your body acted as if it were whole again, allowing you to talk, to move, to feel pain. You... You did this. I'm alive today because of you. Yes. Doesn't that make you smile, knowing you owe me everything? Skullduggery sagged. What's wrong? Tenebrae asked. Were you expecting something more? Did you fool yourself into detecting a divine hand in your resurrection? Did you believe your life to have some special purpose? Sorry to disappoint you, but your life had no special purpose other than the one I planned for you, which, as it turned out, was a waste of everyone's time. I didn't tell anyone, of course. You were my little secret. I continued to keep an eye on you. I watched you fight on, letting your anger consume you. It was a fascinating exercise, knowing there could really be only one outcome. All I had to do was wait. I knew you were coming. Okay, stop, said Valkyrie. What the hell are you talking about? What outcome? What were you waiting for? For the knock on the door, Tenebrae said. Necromancy killed him. Necromancy 
brought him back. His loved ones were dead. His life was war. His life was death. With every year that passed, he was losing more and more of the person he thought he was. With every year, he was becoming somebody else. And then he knocked on the door of a necromancer temple, and I knew he had come home. The warmth drained from Valkyrie's face. No. He abandoned his old life. He wore armor to disguise his old form. He took a new name to kill his old self. No, Valkyrie said. No, don't. Skullduggery Pleasant walked off the battlefield and Lord Vile walked into my temple. Chapter 29 Who Knows What Darkness Valkyrie looked at Skullduggery. He's lying, she said. I know he's lying. Tell me, Skullduggery, tell me he's lying. He can't. Tenebra said. Shut up! Valkyrie screamed. Shut up! Say one more goddamn word and I'll kill you! I swear to Jesus! Skullduggery, look at me! Look at me! Skullduggery raised his head, looked at her with his hollow eye sockets. I'm sorry, he said. Valkyrie found herself walking backwards. What are you talking about? What are you saying? What are you talking about? Skullduggery? He's lying. He's lying. Tell me he's lying, for God's sake. You're not Lord Vile. You fought Lord Vile. The real Lord Vile, Tenebrae said, and I mean the fully powered Lord Vile, would have obliterated him. That thing he fought was mere intention. It was simply the armor. Inside, it was empty. Yeah, Valkyrie snarled. We thought of that. Vile's ghost. That's what it is. Vile's ghost is controlling it. Tenebrae folded his hands in the sleeves of his robe. Vile doesn't have a ghost. He's not dead. Skullduggery is the one controlling it. No, I think you'll find that he isn't. Not consciously, Tenebrae said. Not willingly. But Lord Vile is a part of him, a part of his subconscious. Evidently, that particular part of his subconscious has broken away from the rest. What you're talking about is ridiculous. No, Valkyrie, actually it's not. Our dear friend Skullduggery is, and let's be honest here, a little bit insane. He spent ten months being tortured by the Faceless Ones, didn't he? When you rescued him, was he the same well-adjusted gent you knew and loved? Valkyrie hesitated. He cracked, don't you see? They drove him insane. And while he seems to have recovered for the most part, he's different, isn't he? You rescued him, he came back, and all of a sudden we're all talking about the Deathbringer. This is not good news for our dear friend. After all, we necromancers called him the Deathbringer when he was Lord Vile, didn't we? But he turned his back on all that. And now that he's home and we're saying that you, his precious little Valkyrie, might turn out to be the Deathbringer, well, it's all too much. Events conspire to bring him close to his empty old armor and all that power reawakens. His armor gains sentience, stands up. He has no more control over it than you or I have control over a stray thought. But Lord Vile was... Lord Vile is evil. Tenebrae shrugged. Who knows what darkness lurks in the hearts of men? But he joined Mevolent. That means Skullduggery and Serpine were on the same side. No one was more surprised about that than I, believe me. But the more I thought about it, the more I understood... Don't make the mistake of thinking that Lord Vile is merely Skullduggery with a mask on. They're two different people. Skullduggery's anger and violence had overwhelmed him, and there was nowhere left to turn. So he blinked and was gone. 
and in his place stood Vile. Vile came to us. He absorbed our teachings. His power grew at an exponential rate, and he quickly became our most powerful necromancer. Only he abandoned us. We didn't even get a chance to tell him about the passage. But it didn't matter. He didn't want to save the world. He wanted to destroy it. And the quickest way to get what he wanted was to leave us and join Mevolent. Serpine killed his family. Serpine killed Skullduggery's family. Vile didn't care. To Vile, Serpine was just another instrument to use, like Baron Vengeance or Mevolent himself. Valkyrie knelt by Skullduggery. I know he's lying. He's trying to trick me. I know you're not Lord Vile. Lord Vile is a mass murderer. Explain this to me. Skullduggery, please, just explain it. Make it make sense. He looked at her. She could see through his eye sockets to the flickering shadows that played on the inside of his skull. He turned his head. The shadows moved, and he looked at Tenebrae. You've brought me back, he said. That's it. That's all there is to it. The great mystery I've never been able to solve. The great question. And you, you are the answer. You sound disappointed. I thought there would be more to it. Instead, I'm... I'm the result of a necromancer trick. If it makes you feel any better, it wasn't easy to trick Nefarian Serpine. I wasn't even sure it would work. Something like that had never been tried before. Skullduggery walked towards Tenebrae. You didn't tell anyone. All these years, you didn't tell anyone. Why would I? What would it achieve? If your friends knew your secret, they'd have found a way to kill you long ago. And then my wonderful work would have been undone. I liked the fact you were walking around, saving the world in your own little way. It must be like what a proud parent feels. How do I stop it? Stop what? Vile? I'm afraid I don't know. These developments are quite unexpected. Your subconscious is your own. Maybe if you wish really, really hard. Valkyrie looked at Skullduggery. It's true? she asked, her voice hollow. Skullduggery turned. Yes. I told you it was Vile's ghost that was giving the armor purpose. In a way, that's true. Once you accept that Vile's ghost is my subconscious. The armor is imitating me. Or it's imitating how I used to be, at any rate. You're Lord Vile. Yes. Sorry. I should have told you. You killed Ghastly's mother. Among others, yes. He doesn't know, obviously. Stop talking like that, she roared. Stop talking so normal. What would you prefer, sobbing? Wailing? Maybe some more silence? Regret never won a war, Valkyrie. And sorry isn't a big enough word for what I'm feeling. I've spent my life since then trying to make up for it. But I'll never make up for it. The things I did were unspeakably evil. But for those few years, I didn't care. You... you told me you did terrible things. I did. I didn't think they'd be so... I know. We can talk about this later. He turned back to Tenebrae. If my subconscious is controlling the armor and the armor wants to kill your Deathbringer, then why haven't you killed me? Well, Tenebrae said, let's face it, I might be wrong. The armor might be operating completely independently of you. It might have gained a higher degree of sentience. In that case, killing you would deprive me of a valuable asset in taking it down. The second reason, and quite honestly the most pertinent, is that I don't know how to kill you. If I try, a bungled attempt on your life might redirect the armor against me. And I have no intention of dying before the passage is brought about. Not when I'm so close. 
So you've been hoping that melancholia brings about the passage before Vile gets to her. That's your whole strategy? You've been hoping? The centuries have changed all of us, Skullduggery. As cleric wreath delights in pointing out, we necromancers are used to sitting back and not actually doing anything. We're a lazy lot, now that I think about it. No, Skullduggery said. You've waited too long for this lunatic scheme of yours to come true. You wouldn't leave anything to chance. Oh, don't worry, I'm not, Tenebrae said. Melancholia is the Deathbringer. She is the only necromancer to ever reach that level of power. You left before you reached it, and the Lord Vile that's walking around right now isn't even you. It's an echo of you, not fully charged. If you were in the armor, yes, I'd be worried. But you're not. So, if Vile attacks Melancholia, she will destroy it, or him. What are we calling Vile? An it or a him? Ah, uh, suppose it doesn't matter. The important thing is that you two stay locked up here until all this is over. I hope I've given you enough to talk about. I do hate those awkward silences. Tenebrae turned, and the door closed as he walked away. Skullduggery looked at Valkyrie. You have a right to be upset, he said. Oh, do I? I should have told you. I know you understand why I didn't, but I should have. You let me go through this darkest thing, with all the guilt and the fear and knowing the things that I'm going to do, and you didn't say anything? What did you want me to say? Look at me, I was Lord Vile, but now I'm okay? That would have made things worse. You would have looked at the things I did in that armor, and you'd have assumed that in order to pass through and emerge on the other side, you'd have to do the same. But you don't. That's the thing. Violence and hatred and bloodshed became my reasons for existing. I stopped caring about anything else. I didn't care who my enemy was, as long as I had an enemy. I was falling, and I didn't know how to stop. Valkyrie put her back to the wall, slid down to a sitting position. Her legs wouldn't take her weight. You murdered all those people. How many? Do you even know? I don't. I lost count. Everyone lost count. I was like you. Necromancy came far too easily to me. You're one of those sorcerers you told me about. The elementals who can switch to being an adept? It's rare, but it's possible. But, Skullduggery, you're the good guy. I'm sorry I didn't tell you. I'm sorry you found out this way. What do we do now? Well, we escape. I'm not sure how yet, but... No, said Valkyrie. What do we do now? We're partners. You're my best friend. I love you. You were my... I looked up to you. What am I supposed to do now? He turned away. You need to find yourself a new hero. Chapter 30 Tenebrae He had to admit, that had been fun. Tenebrae wasn't a sadistic man, but the look on Valkyrie Kane's face and the pain in Skullduggery Pleasant's voice were just delicious. He had been carrying that secret around him for centuries, had come close to spelling it a few times before this, but he was glad he hadn't. It was like an itch that you put off scratching. When you eventually did scratch, it was so much more satisfying. His mood didn't last, however. When he got to his office, Vandermeer Craven wasn't waiting for him as he had instructed. Enough was enough. Tenebrae was sick of Craven and the ridiculous serenity that seemed to have washed over him overnight. He was sick of everyone treating the spineless worm like he was some kind of holy man with the ear of the Messiah. Craven was still a cleric, and Tenebrae was still the high priest, and the natural order of things would be restored. So Tenebrae sat behind his desk, his temper boiling the longer he was made to wait. 
When his door finally opened, he had to force himself not to jump up and throttle the man. Cleric Craven, he said, so good of you to grace me with your presence. My apologies, Craven said, bowing. Our younger necromancers are understandably nervous. They needed someone to reassure them that it was all going to be okay. Tenebrae frowned. And that someone was you, I take it. Craven smiled. I go where I am needed. Take me to her, Tenebrae said, standing up. Craven raised an eyebrow. Your eminence? Take me to the Deathbringer, cleric. It's time I spoke with her. Ah, uh, unfortunately, I cannot. She is to remain undisturbed. I am the high priest, cleric Craven. You do not say no to me. Something flickered in the cleric's eyes, something Tenebrae had never seen in those eyes before, and then it was gone. Of course. Once again, my deepest apologies. I will take you to her at once. Tenebrae stalked out of the room. Craven followed him through the corridor, struggling to match Tenebrae's long strides. The satisfaction Tenebrae derived from robbing Craven of his newly acquired dignity was a petty kind of satisfaction, but it was satisfaction nonetheless, and it made the corners of his mouth want to lift in a smile. Things got even better when they reached the bowels of the temple. Tenebrae gestured to Craven to lead the way to whichever chamber held melancholia. But if the cleric thought this would mean that he could dictate the walking pace, he was sadly mistaken. Tenebrae walked so quickly that Craven had to virtually scamper ahead of him lest Tenebrae tread on the hem of his robe. More than once, Tenebrae managed to stand on the trailing material, and Craven's head would jerk back with a strangled gag. Finally, they came to a door and the childish fun and games were over. Craven opened the door wide, and Tenebrae swept by him. Melancholia Sinclair lay in a hole in the ground, filled to the brim with mud. Her robes lay beside her. Her eyes opened to watch the two men enter. If she was surprised, it didn't register on her face. She remained where she was. Melancholia! Cleric Craven admonished. The high priest has entered the room! I can see that, Melancholia said. Surely you don't expect me to stand? That will not be necessary, Tenebrae said. Valkyrie Kane is here, isn't she? Melancholia asked. And Skaldagory Pleasant? Yes, Tenebrae said. How did you know? I can feel them, she said. I can feel their energy. They are not happy, are they? She is angry and scared and hurt. I would say that she is, yes. Melancholia smiled. Glorious. How are you feeling, my child? She looked at him. I'm tired. Are you hurt? This is a healing mud you are in, is it not? It's regenerative, Craven said quickly. It fills her with energy, and I know what regenerative means, Tenebrae interrupted. And I was asking the girl. Melancholia closed her eyes and let her head loll back gently. The girl has a name. Tenebrae paused. What was that? Her eyes were still closed. I said, the girl has a name, Melancholia, Deathbringer. You can use either one, but you can't call me the girl. I am the high priest of this temple, young lady. I will call you whatever I choose. One eye opened, and she squinted up at him. I asked if you were hurt, Tenebrae continued. I expect an answer. The girl sighed. Sometimes I burn. It's not nice. It hurts. The mud makes it feel better. Burn? Why do you burn? Because of my scars. 
Ah, yes, the scars. I have been meaning to ask about those. Craven stepped forward. I can explain to you. I want her to do it. Melancholia? He carved symbols onto me, Melancholia said. It took months. It was painful. But it needed to be done. I was the Deathbringer, and I needed my power. It's all worth it now. Every moment I spent screaming, it's worth it. Then it's true, Tenebrae said, turning to Craven. You carved her up to loop the surge, didn't you? That's why she needs to recharge constantly. I did what had to be done, Craven said primly. Tenebrae grabbed him, shoved him back against the wall. You arrogant fool! That level of power isn't natural for her. There's no telling what will happen. A fit of anger overcame the cleric, and he struggled to break Tenebrae's grasp. Were he so inclined, Tenebrae would have found such a display of impotent fury fascinating. As it was, all he felt was disgust. He released his hold, wiping his hands on his robe as Craven stumbled away from him. I did what had to be done, Craven shouted. I did what you didn't have the imagination to do. She can't be relied upon, Tenebris said. There's no telling when she'll be back to full strength. There's no telling if she ever will. She is not the Deathbringer. Something came at him, something dark and terrible, and it hit him and Tenebris spun head over heels through the air. He crunched into the wall and dropped to the stone floor. Agony raced from his shoulder across his chest. A collarbone was broken, maybe a rib. Hissing in pain, he looked over at Melancholia, standing there, the mud dripping off her. I am the Deathbringer, she said calmly. I'm the one you've all been waiting for. His vision dimmed suddenly. No, he whispered. And then his life was dragged from his body. Chapter 31 Fuel Bison Dragonclaw laid out his torture instruments on the table. Knives, saws, pliers, hammers, neatly arranged one by one. Valkyrie watched him. When he was done, he hauled Skullduggery to his feet and shoved him against the wall then went over to Valkyrie, did the same to her. You're not so tough now, are you? he asked, his smile revealing small teeth behind that wispy goatee. I bet you're really regretting the way you treated me. Now it's my turn. Now I get to inflict some pain. She didn't answer him. She barely heard him. We've not finished treating you badly, Skullduggery said. The moment we escape from these shackles, we're going to do it all over again. Even if escape were possible, Dragonclaw replied, you'd be too late. The Deathbringer is about to change the world. You hope? It's a scientific inevitability. There's no such thing. Dragonclaw stopped what he was doing and looked around. There is no such thing as a scientific inevitability? Nope. And what about, for instance, gravity? If I drop an apple, it will not fall? Not necessarily. You are ridiculous. Just because an apple falls one hundred times out of one hundred does not mean it will fall on the one hundred and first. I thought you were supposed to be a rational man. I am a rational man. But haven't you heard? I'm also insane. It gives me a unique perspective on things. Here is what I am going to do, Dragonclaw said. I am going to pull you apart. Your high priest doesn't want me harmed. He doesn't want you dead. He was quite agreeable to my harming you. If you separate my bones from each other, my consciousness could dissipate. Don't worry. I'll leave most of you intact. The torso and the head, probably. Maybe I'll remove the jawbone. It might stop you talking. I wouldn't like to bet on it. 
Once you are incapacitated, I will then take apart your young apprentice. I'm not his apprentice, Valkyrie muttered. She's my combat accessory, Skullduggery nodded. But you won't get a chance to do any of that, I'm afraid. We're going to get free in the next few minutes, and then you're really going to wish you had a few guards here for protection. I see, Dragonclaw said. And do you mind telling me how you plan to get free? I'm picking the lock on these shackles as we speak. Those locks can't be picked. So says the prevailing wisdom. And you know better, I suppose. That is the usual state of things. And what are you picking the lock with, may I ask? A toothpick? A hairpin? The top of your pen, actually. Dragonclaw laughed. I don't have a pen! Not any more, that's true. But you had one in the pocket of your robes, don't you remember? Dragonclaw's laugh faded. He searched his robes. You're lying. I didn't have a pen. The metal clip on the lid is the perfect size, Skullduggery continued, clearly enjoying the look on Dragonclaw's face. Behind his back, his arms were moving ever so slightly. I should be out of these in forty seconds or so, and then I'm going to hurt you. You're lying, Dragonclaw said. Even if I did have a pen in my pocket, you couldn't have taken it from me. But that's not strictly true, is it? When you pushed me against this wall, you got a little too close. You couldn't have taken it. There was no way. Could you stop talking for a moment? This is a tricky bit. Skullduggery's head tilted. Valkyrie heard a faint tapping of metal against metal. Dragonclaw grabbed a knife and strode over to Valkyrie. Stop that, he ordered. Stop it right now or she dies. You're not going to kill her, Skullduggery said. If you kill her in thirty seconds, I will kill you. You don't want to die. Not when you're this close to the passage. Dragonclaw pressed the blade to Valkyrie's throat. It was cold against her skin. Stop! Stop it! Twenty seconds, Dragonclaw. And what a ridiculous name that is. Almost as ridiculous as your beard. The blade bit deeper, and then stopped. And all at once, Dragonclaw was pushing her aside and storming towards Skullduggery. Valkyrie stepped behind him and kicked low, sweeping his feet at the ankles. Dragonclaw yelped, and Skullduggery moved, smacking his knee into the necromancer's face as he fell. Dragonclaw bounced off Skullduggery's knee and crumpled to the ground. Skullduggery squatted beside him, managing to get his hands into the folds of the robe. You don't have his pen, Valkyrie said. No, Skullduggery admitted. He never had one. Well done, by the way. She nodded. Didn't answer. He found the keys, and by the time he stood up, the shackles were already off. He uncuffed her, and she felt magic flood her body. It was a nice feeling. He opened the door, looked out, then gestured to her to stay put before going on ahead. She looked at him, her friend, as he sneaked to the corner, and she tried equating that with all the horror stories she'd heard about Vile. He'd saved her life, and she'd saved his, and she had felt closer to him than she had to anyone else. If there was one person who would understand her, she had known it would always be him. But now... Two necromancers came round the corner, and Skullduggery took them out. It was vicious, and it was ugly, and neither necromancer had time to even cry out. Valkyrie joined him, stepping over their unconscious bodies, and they moved on. He was in a bad mood. She knew the feeling. The doors opened ahead of them before they could react, and six necromancers came striding through. They didn't seem particularly surprised to see a teenage girl and a skeleton walking around unsupervised. They stood in a straight line, side by side, the blackness of their robes flowing together so that they looked like a single creature with six heads. You think we were going to let you walk out of here? one of them asked. Valkyrie and Skullduggery stayed where they were, waiting for them to make a move. The ring on her hand was ready to throw up a wall of shadows to block the strikes she knew were coming. And then the necromancers reached into their robes and pulled out submachine guns. Hell, 
was all Skullduggery had time to say before they opened fire. Valkyrie crossed her arms over her head as bullets slammed into her. She staggered back, winded, her clothes dissipating the impacts. More bullets hit her arms, but she kept them where they were, kept them tight together, not letting any through. Skullduggery was saying something, but she couldn't hear him over the gunfire, and then she felt him grab her from behind and pull her back round the corner. Out of the firing line, he pushed her against the wall. Are you okay? He asked quickly, his hands checking her for bullet hits. Are you hurt? Valkyrie shook her head, unable to speak until there was breath in her lungs again. Something flew round the corner, bouncing on the floor beside them. She hadn't even registered what it was before Skullduggery reached out his hand. The grenade went off, but Skullduggery kept the explosion contained in a tight bubble of air. He released his grip, and the smoke curled through the corridor. They ran back the way they had come. Dragonclaw was in the corridor, using the wall to support himself. He saw them coming, and his eyes managed to widen. He dug a hand into his robes. Valkyrie sprinted for him. Two necromancers emerged from an adjoining corridor just as she passed. They raised their weapons, but she left them to Skullduggery. She heard their grunts and cries of pain and kept going towards Dragonclaw. He pulled a gun from his robe, Skullduggery's gun, raised it with a trembling hand, and fired. The bullet missed Valkyrie completely, and she swiped at the air, yanking the weapon away from him. The gun fell, and she collided with him, her elbow crunching into his face. He reeled back, squawking, but she was latched on to him now, and she didn't stop hitting until he was on the floor, his arms flopping uselessly at his sides. Skullduggery hauled her up with one hand, his gun flying into the other, and he kept her moving as he fired behind him. Submachine guns peppered the corridor with bullets, the walls spitting chunks of plaster and plumes of dust. They got behind the next corner and ran on, straight into a dead end. They turned, but it was too late. The necromancers were already there, and then the necromancer furthest away stiffened, his gun falling. Valkyrie frowned as the next one did the same, and the next one, and finally the necromancer closest to them exhaled and his face went blank. All six of them stood there, suddenly very pale, then they fell, one at a time, the closest necromancer first, the effect rippling backwards. Skullduggery walked forward warily and checked for a pulse. He's dead, he said a hint of surprise in his voice. He picked up a submachine gun, stepped over the dead necromancer, and continued on, back the way they had come. Valkyrie's ring was like ice. The temple was quiet. Every corner they turned revealed more dead people in black robes. Bison Dragonclaw lay sprawled across the floor, eyes open, seeing nothing. Doors opened ahead of them, and Melancholia stepped through. She was smiling. Wasn't that fun? Skullduggery raised the submachine gun to his shoulder, finger hovering over the trigger. You did this? I needed a boost, Melancholia said with a shrug. A little pick-me-up. Valkyrie knows what I'm talking about, don't you, Valkyrie? That little ring is burning so cold now, isn't it? My whole body is burning like that. It's intoxicating. But don't worry, I didn't kill all of them. There are still plenty left to fawn over me. You're under arrest, Skullduggery said. Don't be stupid. I'm going to kill you, and then I'm going to save the world. By killing half of it? Omelets and eggs, Skeleton. Give up. This will be your only warning. Melancholia laughed, shook her head, and as she opened her mouth to speak, Skullduggery pulled the trigger. Melancholia jerked back into a sudden cloud of darkness as gunfire filled the air and bullet casings rattled onto the floor. When the gun was empty, he dropped it and clicked his fingers, summoning flames into his hands. Valkyrie readied shadows of her own. The cloud faded. Melancholia was still standing. You're sneaky, she said. I like you. 
Skullduggery threw a fireball, but Melancholia sent the darkness to extinguish it. He pushed at the air, and she staggered, sent a spear of shadows his way in return. He twisted, the spear missing him by inches. Valkyrie whipped the darkness at her, but Melancholia rose onto a wave of pitch black. Columns of dark shot out, too fast to dodge. One column struck Valkyrie, taking her off her feet. Skullduggery was hit square in the chest, and twice more as he tried to recover. The wave lowered Melancholia to the ground, and at a gesture, it turned towards Skullduggery. It crashed down on top of him, dispersing into tendrils that threw him down the corridor. Valkyrie swept the air in around her and hurtled towards Melancholia. She almost reached her, too, but a wall of darkness appeared between them. Valkyrie hit the wall, and it drank her in. She struggled, tried to pull away, but it was like quicksand. Her arms and legs were already in, and she turned her head away, arching her spine. The corridor lit up with flame, and suddenly she was free. She dropped to the ground, while Melancholia dodged another of Skullduggery's attacks. He had run in close, trying to get his hands in her. Melancholia kept throwing shadows between them, but the shadows were flimsy. She was panicking, trying to give herself some room to maneuver. Given the space, she could send out an attack that was impossible to defend against. Skullduggery was making sure that didn't happen, and he was using skill, determination, and luck to do it. But while his skill wasn't going to fade, and his determination wasn't going to falter, his luck was an element he had no control over. Another panicked move by Melancholia sent a tentacle of shadow whipping for him. He saw it coming and ducked, weaving under it. But the tentacle flexed at the last moment before it dissipated, and it caught him in the side of the head. He stumbled, and Melancholia struck, sending him spinning backwards. Something heavy landed on Valkyrie's back as she tried to get up. A mass of shadows, keeping her pinned to the floor. She cursed and strained, but couldn't move. Skullduggery groaned. Melancholy was doing something to him. Shadows curled out from the cuffs of his jacket, out around his collar, through the buttons on his shirt. But then Valkyrie saw the expression on Melancholy's face. She was frowning, not with intent, but with curiosity. Whatever was going on with Skullduggery, Melancholia wasn't the one doing it. Skullduggery arched his back, and darkness burst from his chest in a steady stream, writhing and twisting in the air, collecting on the far side of the room. A shape formed. The stream broke from Skullduggery, and the shape became solid. A tall man, encased head to foot, in black armor that shifted and moved on his body. Valkyrie stared. Lord Vile hadn't been hiding in a cave or an old basement somewhere. He'd been hiding within Skullduggery himself. Melancholia stepped back, her eyes wide with fear. Lord Vile held out his arm, and his hand lengthened to a sharp point that flew at her. She cried out barely managing to deflect the strike. He went at her again, and again, and she stumbled from each attack, her hair in her eyes. The darkness that had been holding Valkyrie down was gone, and she got up, watching Melancholia being stalked like a deer. Help me, Melancholia cried. You can't let him kill me, please. The Deathbringer begging for help. The only person who had the power and the intention to kill three billion people begging for someone to step in and save her. Valkyrie wasn't going to do it. She couldn't do it. She had to let Vile kill her. It was the only way to save all those lives. Valkyrie! Melancholia called. Please, help me! And suddenly Valkyrie was running. And she was running straight at Lord Vile while every part of her mind screamed at her to stop. But her body kept going. It wouldn't listen, and Vile waved his hand, and she went flying back through the air. As she spun, she saw shadows grow from beneath Melancholia's robes, and then she felt the air shift around her. Her trajectory changed, and she fell against Skullduggery, who staggered slightly as he caught her. 
Melancholia's shadows sprang at Lord Vile, whose armor grew tendrils that intercepted each one of them. Melancholia was rising to her feet now, standing just beyond arm's reach of Vile. Their shadows, sharp and jagged, pressed and darted and defended. More grew, and still more, pushing out of their arms and legs and torsos. They started to resemble a pair of weird insects, or crabs maybe, snapping at each other with an ever-increasing array of weapons. Melancholy was smiling. Her blonde hair was obscuring most of her face, but she was definitely smiling, and now Valkyrie could see why. Her shadows were thickening, getting bigger, and Vile was being pushed back. He wasn't whole, after all. He was merely the armor of Lord Vile, Skullduggery's old necromancer power given sentience. If Skullduggery had been in that armor, the Deathbringer would have met her match. But the armor was empty, and the Deathbringer was realizing just how powerful she really was. The shadows behind Melancholia swooped in through her body and erupted from her chest, slamming into Vile and taking him to the far end of the room. He was thrown with such force he hit the double doors and burst through them, splintering the wood and ripping them from their hinges. The shadows retracted, back inside Melancholia, and she turned to Valkyrie and Skullduggery and smiled. You saved my life, she said laughing. The darkness moved in around her, and she disappeared just as Vile lunged at her from the shadows. He grabbed nothing but air. Skullduggery stepped in front of Valkyrie. Stop right there, he said. Lord Vile, the armor, turned towards him. I want you gone, Skullduggery said. You're a part of me, and I want you gone. I left you behind a long time ago, and I have no intention of letting this continue. Your time is up. Vile sent a shadow crashing into him. Hey! Valkyrie shouted. Hey, what the hell are you doing? Four spears of shadow rose up over Vile's head, and Valkyrie turned and ran. They shot towards her as she jumped sideways. All but one of the spears missed her. The last one glanced off the back of her jacket and spun her round as she fell. There were shouts. The barricades had been breached. Sanctuary operatives were storming the temple. Vile tilted his head the same way Skullduggery did. Then the shadows swirled and he was gone. Chapter 32 A Bad Night in Haggard Valkyrie sat hunched over on a fallen headstone, her hands in her pockets and her eyes on the ground. Around her, cleavers and sorcerers filed in and out of the temple. They hadn't started bringing the bodies out yet. She didn't want to be here when they did. She watched Skullduggery talk to them, nodding and pointing, issuing commands. She didn't even understand how any of this was possible. She wanted to travel back in time, back to before she knew the truth. If only she hadn't followed Wreath, left herself open to attack, then Tenebrae would never have had the chance to spoil everything. Skullduggery turned, walked over, and Valkyrie suddenly felt sick, like her insides were rotting away. Are you okay? he asked her. She nodded. Wreath and Craven are unaccounted for. We don't know how many others. We have teams out searching, but I don't like our chances. We'll head back to the sanctuary, brief the council. Not me, Valkyrie said. What? Not me, all right. I'm tired, and I'm bruised, and I just want to go home. I don't care about any of this anymore. I'm going to let other people save the world this time. Listen, I know you've been through a lot, but... Enough, she corrected standing up. I've been through enough. In the last few days, I was slashed half to death. I was healed by a monster who once dissected me. I was betrayed and attacked by Solomon Wreath, who I thought was my friend. And then you, Valkyrie, there is absolutely nothing you can say to make this better. So don't even try. You've got to understand. I don't want to talk to you. 
she said, and walked away. She could have called Fletcher, but she really didn't want to come up with a lie to tell him that would explain her mood. She got a lift into the centre of town from one of the sorcerers she knew, and hopped on a bus. She sat with arms folded, leaning her head against the cool window. The bus would go over a bump, and she'd rock slightly. She didn't think of anything. She just looked at the seat in front and let the bus take her to Haggard. She got off and cut through the small park, walked through darkness instead of the brightly lit main street. She didn't want to talk to anyone. All she wanted to do was pick up her baby sister and hug her. The lights were off in her house, and there were no cars in the driveway, so Valkyrie let herself in the front door. Her family wasn't in. She went up to her room, but her reflection wasn't there. Frowning, she took out her phone, dialed a number, and waited. The call was answered, and she heard her own voice say, Hello? It's me, Valkyrie said. Where are you? Where is everyone? We're at the hospital, the reflection said. Alarm pulsed through Valkyrie like electricity, and she gripped the phone tighter. What? What happened? Is it Alice? Is something wrong? It's not Alice, the reflection said calmly. It's your mother. She was mugged this afternoon. Valkyrie went cold. Mugged? By who? By a mortal? Yes. It happened on Main Street. Everyone's saying it was a stupid place to mug someone. No one ever gets mugged in Haggard. It's too small. He hit her. She's fine, but she was brought to hospital to make sure. So we're all here. Is she hurt? She has a bruise on her cheek. Valkyrie stood in the middle of her room, trying to make sense of this. Who did it? she asked. She was surprised at how soft her voice sounded. I only heard his last name. Moore. He's not from Haggard. His car broke down, the guard said. Dad was in the pharmacy paying, and Mum was standing outside with Alice in the pram, and Moore ran up, grabbed her handbag. She pulled it back. He hit her in the face, took the bag, and ran right into Dad. Dad threw him through the pharmacy window. The ambulance people put on a few bandages and handed him over to the guards. He's still here, then. In Haggard? As far as I know. They rang Dad. Stop calling him that. Sorry. They rang your father and told him they were charging more with assault and battery. They still have him in the police station. Valkyrie stood very still, the phone to her ear. Her body was numb. Are you still there? The reflection asked. I have to go. Your father's waiting. You should have called me. They tell you to turn your phone off when you're in the hospital building. The moment you heard about it, you should have called me. I was never given those instructions. You should have assumed. It's not for me to assume anything, as you keep reminding me I'm not real. I have no thoughts of my own. I only do what I'm told. Then do what you're told. From this moment on, tell me immediately if anything bad ever happens to my family. Very well. What are you going to do? What do you mean? Now. What are you going to do now? What do you think I'm going to do? I think you're very, very angry. I think you're going to break into the police station and hurt the man who hurt your mother. Valkyrie didn't say anything. She hung up the phone and left the house. Running was an odd sensation. It was like hovering above, watching her body move of its own accord. She watched herself run through the narrow lanes of Haggard, keeping away from the bigger streets and roads, keeping away from people. She passed in and out of shadows, in and out of sight, a wraith in black with murder in mind. The police station was well lit. Valkyrie approached it from the side, dropping from the high wall into the car park. No one around. Not many cars. She avoided the security camera and ran to the nearest window. Suddenly she was no longer floating above. She was sucked back into her own head, and she felt how cold she was, how the rage burned like ice in her belly. Tendrils of darkness slithered between the window and its frame, and she twisted her hand, and the tendrils snapped the lock, and the window popped open. 
She used the air to boost herself up, then climbed into a bright bathroom that smelled of disinfectant. She went to the door, listened for a moment. Somewhere phones rang. Somewhere people talked. She stepped into the corridor. It wasn't a big building, and Valkyrie figured the cells would be as far away from the main entrance as possible. So she turned right. She rounded the corner and ducked into a room, an interview room by the look of it, to avoid a passing cop. She waited until his footsteps receded before she emerged and continued on. She came to three cream-coloured steel doors with glass partitions. The first two cells were empty. There was a man lying on a bed in the third. Shadows crept into the lock and smashed it from within, and Valkyrie was walking into the cell before Moore had even lifted his head from the thin pillow. The door closed behind her. He looked at her. He was in his early twenties, skinny, with a bad haircut and a cleft in his chin. A plaster covered a thin cut along his cheek. His left forearm was bandaged. He stood up, still looking at her, frowning now. She reached a hand towards the camera, a pie in the corner of the cell, and sent a dart of shadow into the lens. Moore stepped back. What was that? What the hell was that? Who are you? She stepped closer, hands by her sides, shoulders relaxed. Inside she was cold. There was a block of ice inside her. The voice spoke to her. Kill him. When she was close enough, she swung her right hand up, fingers splayed and palm open, twisting into the strike. She caught him on the hinge of the jaw, and he crashed back against the wall. A power slap, Skullduggery called it, as powerful as a punch, without the risk of broken knuckles. One of the new weapons in her arsenal ever since Tanith went bad. Valkyrie watched Moore try to stand up straight. His legs gave out and he fell back. His mouth was hanging open and his eyes were clouded. She waited while he shook his head and his eyes refocused. He looked at her and she watched his anger build. Moore sprang from the wall. She let him grab her, let him pull her in, and she fired an elbow into his face two, three times. He let go, but she didn't. She latched on, kept firing those elbows driving him back, never letting go of him. He tried to shout, but she hit him in the neck and he gagged. She didn't give him a chance to throw a punch of his own, didn't give him a chance to push her away. She was all over him, elbows and headbutts. In between his sudden yelps of pain, she heard someone snarling, realized it was coming from her. She didn't stop. She had blood on her face, and it wasn't her blood and she didn't stop. This man had attacked her mother. This man had attacked her mother. Kill him. He was on the floor now, and she was on top of him, her hands tightening around his throat. His strength was gone. His efforts to dislodge her, to break the stranglehold, were useless. He was weak, and she was strong. The coldness inside her was burning. She was talking to him, her words scraping through gritted teeth. But she couldn't hear what she was saying. His hands fluttered uselessly around her arms. His eyes were rolling back. Blood and spittle flew from his mouth. He was turning purple. Kill him, the voice in her head whispered. She dug her fingertips in even tighter. This must have been how Melancholia felt when she held Valkyrie's life in her hands. It was power. Pure power, pure and beautiful. It filled her, energized her mixed with her rage and made her smile, just like Melancholia had smiled. Valkyrie frowned, saw her hands around his throat, saw Moore's life about to leave him. Her hands sprang open, and she staggered to her feet. He turned onto his side, coughing and sucking in great gasps of air. The voice was gone now, banished from her mind. She suddenly felt queasy, like she was going to vomit. Moore dragged himself away from her, towards the far wall. Valkyrie's hands were shaking. Her legs were trembling. Her head pounded. 
If I ever see you in this town again, she said to him, I'll come back for you, and I won't stop. Stay away from this town. Stay away from my mother, or I swear to God, I will kill you. He curled up, and she left the cell. She retraced her steps, squirmed out through the window, barely getting outside before she threw up. Her legs were liquid, wouldn't support her weight. The cops were going to find her out here. She realized she was crying. A shadow fell over her, blocking the moonlight. Kalin reached down, took her into his arms like she weighed nothing, and carried her into the darkness. In her back garden, she watched him, and he watched her. The night was warm. The sounds of the waves drifted over the wall. You've been following me, she said. The shadows draped themselves over his sharp features. He didn't say anything, didn't deny it. You've been doing that a lot, haven't you? Following me, watching me. Looking out for you he said, but only at night, only when you're vulnerable. Valkyrie shook her head. That isn't right, she said. You shouldn't do that to people. You shouldn't watch them. I don't want you to do it any more. I need to make sure you're safe. I don't need your protection. He didn't respond to that. Instead, he asked, Did you kill him? She hesitated. No. Did you want to? Yes. You sound ashamed. You shouldn't be. You have darkness in your heart, as do I. That's not true. Of course it is. It's a part of who you are. You can't fight it. She heard a car. They're back, she said. You have to go. I'm not leaving you. I don't want you watching me or my family. You better hurry. They're almost in the house. She gave him one last look, then hurried through the back door and ran up the stairs, and she heard the front door open and her mother's voice. She went to the window, looked out. She couldn't see Kaelin out there, but Valkyrie knew that he was. Chapter 33 Willow Hill when Willow Hill Retirement Home had closed down twenty years earlier, nobody had wept. It had been a cold place, of long halls and strong smells, that seemed to infect its staff and its citizens with a dangerous level of indifference. Bodies, once young and strong, wasted away with barely a whisper of protest, following dutifully after minds that were in no condition to lead them. People gave up in Willow Hill. In Willow Hill, nobody seemed to bother. The Necromancer Order had purchased the home ten years previously, and had done nothing to prevent the slow decay that seeped through the walls. They let it crumble. They let the local kids throw rocks through the windows and spray-paint the outside. The only thing they didn't allow was anyone to break in, to spend the night. There was no telling when the Order might be in need of refuge, and they didn't want to deal with an infestation of mortals when this need arose. Craven, in particular, liked retirement homes. He liked the peace and the quiet, the still quality of stale air. Most of all, he liked the death that lingered like a faint memory. His fellow necromancers, thirty-four in all, were gathered in what had once been the dining hall. Craven waited at the door, judging the pitch of a dozen conversations, and then he walked slowly into the room and waited for everyone else to stop talking. When there was silence, he cleared his throat, closed his eyes, and shook his head sadly. It is with deepest sorrow, he said, that I tell you today that High Priest Auron Tenebri has rejoined the Stream of Life. Shocked mutterings reverberated through the assembled necromancers, and Craven continued. Lord Vile, K 
killed him before turning his sights on our Savior, the Deathbringer. She was strong enough to survive. The High Priest, unfortunately, was not. Where's the body? Craven frowned, seeking the one who had interrupted his solemnity. It was Wreath. Of course it was Wreath. We were unable to retrieve it, Cleric Wreath, Craven said. But I saw it happen myself. High Priest Tenebri is no more. This is a day of great sadness. It is indeed, Wreath said. Because we didn't just lose Tenebri, did we? We lost over three dozen others. A terrible tragedy. Tragedy, you call it. Melancholia killed them. I call it murder. Craven looked shocked and glanced back at Melancholia. She was sitting with her head down and her hood up. For a moment there seemed to be a slight smile on her face. Craven turned back to the crowd. Murder? How can it be murder? This is the Deathbringer. She released our fellow necromancers to the great stream because she needed their strength and their courage to defeat Lord Vile and those sanctuary dogs. I assure you, every single one of them was prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice, and I'm sure they did so gladly. She didn't exactly give them a choice, Reed said. I didn't have time. All eyes turned to Melancholia, who kept her head down. I'm sorry I killed those people. I knew all of them. I'll miss them. But I know I'll see them soon, just as I know I'll see the high priest again. I have a... a responsibility, Cleric Wreath, to bring about the passage. The only thing that means anything anymore. Surely you of all people know that we must do whatever we can to ensure that the world is saved. And you think you're really the one to do that? I don't know. In all honesty, I don't know. I have doubts. Beneath this power, I am still me. I am still Melancholia St. Clair. I have my fears, Cleric. I'm afraid I'm not going to be strong enough or brave enough. And I'm afraid I'm going to falter just when you need me the most. I don't want to let you down, Cleric. Craven didn't smile, even though his lips wanted to. He watched Wreath glower, while all around him the necromancers were looking at Melancholia with a new level of understanding. It was a masterful speech. The sanctuary will be getting desperate, he said, drawing their attention back to him. As long as we remain here, we should be safe. Another four days... That's all we need. If the sanctuary agents tire themselves out searching for us, they won't find us. They won't find anyone who knows where we are. As long as we remain here, as long as we remain together, they will not defeat us, and we will save the world. He clasped his hands and closed his eyes, and they began applauding. They were applauding. He turned, left the room. The white cleaver trailed after him as per his new assignment, personal bodyguard to Vandermeer Craven. Craven was sure that the cleaver was deeply honoured by such a position, even if he didn't show it. Shadows collected ahead, and when they dissipated, Solomon Reith was standing there with his arms folded. You saw it, did you? Craven slowed as he neared. I'm sorry? Tenebrae, you saw Vile kill him? Yes. Yes, I did. It was quick, though, and from that we must take comfort. Craven turned to one of the grimy windows that lined the corridor. It's all changed, isn't it? There's no going back. Not now. I... I need someone I can trust by my side, Solomon. Are you that man? Wreath grunted. I wouldn't have thought so. Craven turned, smiled. Nor would I, my friend. Between us, 
there has been nothing but animosity and distrust. Years foolishly wasted on childish games. For what purpose? Pride? Vanity? I know not. But we are here, now, thrown together. You, the last cleric of our temple, and me, suddenly looked upon as prophet, as leader, as high priest. Wreath unfolded his arms. I'm sorry. What? Exactly who is looking at you that way? Why, they are. Our fellow necromancers. They look to me for answers I cannot give. Because you're not the high priest. But if I am not, Craven said, as gently as he could, then who is? Wreath frowned. Craven, you're a cleric. We lost a high priest. Another will be assigned. It's how these things work. Would you wait for someone new to come in and take over? If we stand united, we need no one else. If we stand united under you, you mean? Then I won't be the high priest, Craven said impatiently. It's just a title, after all. A name. It's all meaningless. The petty rivalries, the power plays. Oh, how I lost myself to it, back when my eyes were shut and my mind was closed. But now I see. The way is clear. The Deathbringer will unite us, my friend. If you cannot believe in me, at least believe in her. She killed thirty-eight of us. For which she has just apologized. She is unstable. She's adjusting. She's a mental case. And what about her power? One moment she can barely lift her head, the next she's flinging people around like their leaves in the wind. How can she be expected to usher in the passage if you can't control how long she'll be able to stand upright? I have faith. I don't. That is troubling. No, it's reasonable. Melancholia is the Deathbringer. Yes, it's not like we thought it would be. It's not as clean, but it's real and it's happening. She has the power to do this. She had better. If she doesn't, if she fails, we'll never get another chance. They know what we want now. They know what we're after. If we continue with this, and she fails, we'll be hunted down across the world. They'll destroy our temples, our teachings, everything. She'd better be the one, Craven. She is. Because if she isn't, we should kill her now and see what we can salvage. Craven's eyes widened. What? If we stop now, immediately, we can take care of this. We can take the blame, me, you, Melancholia, the others. We can take the punishment. But our brothers and sisters around the world will be left alone, left to find the one true Deathbringer. Melancholia is the one true Deathbringer. No, she's the one you made. Craven fell silent. This is our last chance. If there is any doubt about her, we should sacrifice ourselves for the greater good. There is no doubt in my mind that she can do it. Well, there's plenty of doubt in mine. Our enemies are closing in, Craven said angrily. We need to stop them. We need to strike back. Instead, we are at each other's throats once again when we can least afford it. He sighed and turned to the window. Leave me now. I am tired. Wreath didn't speak for a moment. Craven, I'm going to be very nice to you and not break your jaw for what you just said to me. I'm just going to forget you ever said it and backtrack a little. You think we should strike at our enemies, do you? With what, exactly? We have just over thirty necromancers, and practically none of them have combat experience. And even if they did, who should we strike against, do you think? The Sanctuary? Its agents? Pleasant and Cain, maybe? And how about Lord Vile? Should we strike against him? Craven turned. You mock me, Cleric Wreath. Oh, I do, Cleric Craven. For you are easily mocked. You have no idea what it is you're saying at any given moment, do you? 
you think just as long as you're issuing orders you're a leader? Well, here's a news flash for you, sunshine. That's not how it works. You are most insolent. You're not the high priest, Vandermeer. If our enemies are closing in, then this would appear to be the perfect time for Melancholia to initiate the passage. If she proves unable to carry out her duties, she must be put down. Those are dangerous words you speak. Well then, Reed said, it is a good thing you're not in charge, or I'd really be in trouble, wouldn't I? He walked away, robbing Craven of the chance to do that himself. Craven stayed where he was, at a dirty window he could barely see out of, and seethed with anger. Chapter 34 Valkyrie and Fletcher Morning came, and Valkyrie woke. She pulled on a dressing gown and went downstairs. She left her phone by the bed. She didn't want anyone calling her. Her mum was eating breakfast. Alice lay in her basket on the table. How are you feeling? Valkyrie asked. Her mum smiled. I'm fine. You can all stop worrying about me. I had to literally push your father at the door a few minutes ago. He can be really sweet when he wants to be. The smile faded. What happened to you? Valkyrie blinked at her. Sorry? Is that a bruise? Valkyrie ducked back into the hall and checked herself in the mirror. A nice, round bruise had appeared where her forehead had met Moore's face. She glared at herself, then returned to the kitchen. I banged my head last night, she said. How? Valkyrie shrugged. Just one of those things. Woke up suddenly, turned the wrong way, banged my head on the wall. Nightmare? Can't remember. How did you sleep? Not the best, her mother admitted. But I'm used to only getting a few hours sleep with the little miss here. She put down her toast and picked up Alice. You were great yesterday, she said. Des was just talking about us. You were so calm and collected, and the way you took care of Alice while we were running around like headless chickens. Thank you, sweetheart. Valkyrie's smile was brittle. It had been the reflection who had been there to help. Valkyrie had been too busy with her other life, where her best friend used to be a mass murderer. She went upstairs, selected a small healing rock from the collection Ken Speckle had once given her, stripped off and took a shower. She soaked a sponge around the porous rock and gently dabbed the sponge against her forehead. The bruise would disappear soon enough, just like almost every other injury she'd ever suffered. She looked at the palm of her right hand, where Billy Ray Sanguine had cut her with his straight razor. She still had the scar. It would never go away. She thought about Tanith and wondered how she was. She missed her. She missed having someone to talk to. The water was hot and felt good. Valkyrie held her face against the spray, eyes closed, standing there for the longest time. When she was done, she stepped out, grabbed a towel, walked barefoot across the landing. She dried off in her room, pulled on a pair of loose jeans and a T-shirt. Her phone rang. It was Fletcher. Again. She ignored it. He appeared in front of her. Valkyrie jumped, then lunged past him, shutting her door. What the hell are you doing? She whispered. Anyone could have been in here. You haven't been answering my calls, Fletcher said. I was in the shower. I've been calling for days. Val, the last time I saw you, you were in the sanctuary covered in blood. I've been worried sick. You knew I was okay, she shot back. Don't I deserve a little more than that? Don't I deserve to see you? Fletcher, seriously, this is not a good time, all right? Ghostly told me Melancholia got away. They'll get her. You know they will. They have every sorcerer out there right now, hunting them down. This isn't about that. Then what's wrong? Valkyrie laughed. Everything's wrong. Nothing's wrong. I, I just want to be left alone. He looked at her, then turned to her desk, started playing music. He turned up the volume. Now we can talk, he said. Turn that down, she snapped. 
Mum's been through enough without you giving her a bloody headache. What do you mean? She was mugged yesterday. She's fine. She's fine. Everyone's fine. She was mugged and the guards grabbed him, a guy called Moore. I paid him a visit in his cell last night. Fletcher stared at her. You what? He attacked my mother. What was I supposed to do? Let him get away with it? He didn't get away with it, Valkyrie. He got caught. He was arrested. He was in a cell. What did you do? She met his eyes and didn't answer. What did you do? He asked again, stepping forward. I hurt him, she said. I could have killed him too. He's lucky I didn't. Fletcher shook his head. You don't mean that. Again, I'll say it because you may have missed it the first time. He attacked my mother. You nearly killed him? He deserved it. What? What did you say? He deserved it. Are you serious? You went in there with your magic and your training. You almost killed him and you were okay with that. You do it again? Nobody hurts my family. You're spending way too much time with Skullduggery. I'd expect this from him, wading in, leaving a trail of bodies behind. But you, this isn't you. This isn't who you are. You don't know me well enough to say that. No, obviously I don't. The Valkyrie I thought I knew would argue with me every time I even implied that she was violent. She certainly wouldn't do what you did. If you're going to give me another lecture, save your breath. Oh, I wouldn't dream of it. I wouldn't dream of telling you what to do. You know it all, don't you? You know exactly what you're doing, and everyone around you is so very happy to let it continue. What do you want about now? Did Skullduggery scold you for breaking into that police station? Did he caution you against beating up a prisoner? No, I'm not surprised. That's exactly the kind of thing he'd do. Oh, I see, said Valkyrie. Now that Ken Speckle's gone, you've taken it upon yourself to tell everyone when they've crossed a line, have you? Someone has to. It's not going to be skullduggery. Ghastly's too busy. I was relying on Tanith, but I can't do that anymore. You need someone to rein you in. And that's you, she laughed. You are my moral compass. My God, things are worse than I thought. And I haven't told Skullduggery yet. I don't want to talk to him. I don't want to talk to anyone. Well, I'm not going to just stand around while you go down a path you're going to regret. Do yourself a favour, OK? Stay out of it. You think we're in this together? We're not. I'm in this. That's all. I'm your boyfriend, Valkyrie. It's not as simple as that. Well, we can make it that simple. He looked at her. You want to break up? I don't know, she said, defiance rising in her voice. If you don't stop complaining all the damn time, maybe I do. Be careful. Of what? Of hurting your feelings. Because you're so delicate. Be careful of saying something you won't be able to take back. You're angry. You're not thinking right. I'm thinking fine, Fletcher. Maybe we should break up. Maybe we need a change. We've been together for too long as it is. We should have broken up ages ago. He shook his head. You're angry. You don't mean it. Yes, I do. No, you don't. Stop being so bloody silly. Silly, she snapped. Silly! You don't say that to me. You don't get to say that to me. We're breaking up, Fletcher. We're through. Wait a second, OK? Calm down. Think about it. This is heat of the moment stuff. You don't mean any of it. Heat of the moment? This isn't heat of the moment. This has been building for a while. I've wanted to break up with you for a long time. I just didn't realise it. You think we're good together, do you? You think we're a happy little boyfriend and a good little girlfriend? Well, I'm not a good little girlfriend. Val, just take a breath. Count to ten. I've been seeing Kaelin behind your back. Fletcher froze. And Valkyrie instantly regretted it. More than regretted it. She hated it. She hated the words she just said. She hated the look on Fletcher's face. She hated herself. She wanted to claw it all back, to scrub it all away. But it was out. It was in the open. And she was talking again, saying something. She didn't know what, but she shut up when he looked at her. He said, 
What? In a dull, dull voice. There was something in her chest that stopped her from speaking. She had tears in her eyes. She was crying. When was the last time she cried? He looked at her and all his questions were answered. His face changed. I thought you loved me, he said. Fletcher, I'm sorry. Why? I don't know. I'm not sure. You must know. You must. You always know what you're doing. You always know why you do things. It's how you're able to be right all the time. It's where you get all this confidence from. The fact that you were the one who was always right. So why did you do it? I don't know. You're lying. You know exactly why you did it. Fletcher, it's not important. He laughed horribly. Not important to you, Val. But it's plenty important to me. Do you even care? I mean, I know you're crying. I can see the tears. But they're not tears for me. You're crying because you feel bad. Those tears are about you. Because everything is about you. It always is, isn't it? The world revolves around you. Because you're just that selfish. I didn't want to hurt you. I don't think it even occurred to you that I would be hurt. It never even entered your head. You're obsessed with yourself, you know that? You always have been. But I've been okay with it because I was obsessed with you too. How stupid am I, huh? Boom. Just like that. I'm cut off and now I can see the whole thing. You've never done anything for anyone else. You've never inconvenienced yourself purely for someone else's benefit. The rest of us have. It's what makes us good people. You? You've saved the world, but you're not a good person. I don't know what you are. Fletch, please. Please what? Please stop making me feel bad. Oh, wow, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I didn't realise I was ruining your day. Maybe you should just run back to Kalen. Maybe he can comfort you. Valkyrie shook her head. It's not like that. Oh, so you're not dumping me for him. I'm not dumping you for anyone. Does he know this? I couldn't care less what he knows. That doesn't surprise me. Listen, you can stand there and insult me all you want. But the fact is, this has been coming for a while. And yet it's the first I've heard about it. Of course it is, because you haven't wanted to hear about it. Oh, right. OK. I get it now. Basically, I should have seen this coming, yeah? I should have seen the signs and realised what was about to happen. Yes, she said. So in a way, when you think about it, all this is my fault. Valkyrie looked away and sighed. Which makes perfect sense, he continued, because you can do nothing wrong, because you can never be selfish or self-centred, because the fault always has to lie with someone else. <laughs> I am really stupid, Valkyrie, and I apologise. Don't be like this. Don't be like what? Don't be so bloody childish. Don't sulk. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Your girlfriend broke up with you. Fine, it happens all the time. Grow up and move on. Like you, you mean. Because you're so mature. Taking everything in your stride. Accepting any and all responsibility that comes your way. That's you, isn't it? Little Miss Perfect. I never said I was perfect. But my God, do you think it? Don't be ridiculous. But why wouldn't you think you're perfect? Haven't I spent the last two years telling you how beautiful you are? How smart? How exceptional. Hasn't Skullduggery been telling you how great you are and powerful and amazing? Everyone you meet is instantly impressed by you because you're so confident and capable. You can do anything you put your mind to. You go from schoolgirl to sorcerer overnight. You're descended from the last of the ancients. The necromancers meet you and you're immediately one of the nominees to be their impossibly powerful saviour. With all these people going crazy over you, Val, I'm actually surprised you stuck with a nobody like me for so long. Right now, she said angrily, I'd have to agree with you. There were tears in Fletcher's eyes, but he didn't cry. Well, if you're expecting me to teleport away, you can forget about it. You're the one doing the dumping, so it's up to you to walk out first. So go on, Val. Walk. There was a silence, and in that silence 
she thought of all the other things she wanted to say. Instead, she nodded, turned, placed one foot in front of the other, and all too soon she was at the door. But she had to say something. She couldn't let it end like this. In anger, with his eyes drilling holes in her back, she turned again. I still care for you, she said. Wouldn't worry about it, he replied, back to acting cool. It won't last long. You look at Skullduggery and that's who you model yourself on. He's brave. You're brave. He's cold. You're cold. He's ruthless. You're ruthless. Well done, Belle. You share the emotional range of a dead man. He folded his arms and did that cocky smirk of his, only now it looked mean, and Valkyrie left her bedroom. When she looked back in, he was gone.